<clears throat> Live stream is up, Sergeant. Please start your recordings. Recording to PC in progress. According to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Okay, Sergeant Jones, you may begin with your opening statement. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the committees on finance, jointly with environmental protections, hospitals, higher education, and governmental operations. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos? And to minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you for your cooperation. And Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you very much, Sergeant Jones. Thank you to the Director of Security, Carl Dalva, and to all of the sergeants for the work that you do to make these hearings possible. I'm most grateful to all of you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the City Council's eighth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 22. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Environmental Protection, chaired by the, my colleague, the famous Council Member Jim Gennaro. And I have to say, it's a great pleasure to be able to uh, work with you, uh, Council Member and Chair Jim Gennaro. The first time we've had a hearing together uh, uh, after knowing each other for many, many years. Thank you. We are joined, yeah, thank you. We are joined also by a number of my colleagues and I will get those momentarily uh, to announce who's here. Uh, but let me say DEP's fiscal 22 budget is uh, $1.5 billion, an $81.2 million increase when compared to the fiscal 21 adopted budget with a large portion of its funding coming from city funds. And in comparison to prior years, the executive budget added more funding to several key programs and initiatives. As the agency responsible for managing the city's water supply, air quality, and hazardous materials pollution, DEP has one of the largest capital construction programs. And despite the tumultuous year we had in 2020, this year's proposed executive capital budget is no exception with $13.7 billion in proposed capital commitments between fiscal 21 and 2025 with $2.3 billion in fiscal 2021 alone. Notably, across DEP's capital portfolio, of the $1.04 billion being added, $687.9 million was added for water pollution control, $237.8 million for water mains, $117.2 million for sewers, and 5.3 million for water supply. At today's hearing, I look forward to learning more about DEP's proposed executive budget and how it plans to implement some of the new, uh, of its new and existing programs and capital projects. Thank you to John Seltzer and to Curly and Francisco from the Finance Division for the preparations for today's hearings. And I also wanna thank Stephanie Ruiz, a committee counsel for all the work that she does to make these hearings possible and for always being on top of everything for me. I'm most grateful to you. Thank you, um, Stephanie Ruiz. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Chair Gennaro for his opening statement. Chair Gennaro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a real joy to be here with you. As, as you said, we've known each other a long time. We've never had the opportunity to uh, uh, chair a hearing together. And it's really great to be with you as always. Thank you for your uh, friendship and brotherhood. I really appreciate that. And um, uh, um, good morning, everyone. I'm Jim Gennaro, Chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection. Today we'll be hearing from DEP on their fiscal 2022 uh, budget. Uh, DEP's proposed expense budget totals $1.52 billion over the proposed uh, and proposed capital commitment plan totals $13.7 billion over five years. I look forward to hearing more about the agency's strategy to fill vacant positions, which are agency wide making sure the city is prepared for the roundout West Branch bypass tunnel shutdown, which is on the horizon, and uh, DEP's capital strategy uh, and timeline to build out sewer infrastructure in Southeast Queens to ease persistent flooding in my home borough of Queens. 
I'd also like to make a special note to thank the mayor um, and his administration for not reinstating the rental payment. That was a big crusade of mine back when I was on the council and uh, you know chair of this committee. Uh, and it's a very, very regressive uh, tax on ratepayers. Uh, and I uh, thank the mayor for you know rolling back on the rental payment, which many people have forgotten about, but I have not forgotten about it. And but for the elimination of the uh, you know rental payment, we would not be looking at a two point something percent water increase. Uh, we would be you know twenty something percent. And so uh, I have to give credit where credit is due. Um, I uh, like to thank uh, DP. Uh, DP Commissioner Sapienza and all the good people from DEP uh, who will be testifying here today. I look forward to hearing from you, Commissioner, and your good team. Um, I'd like to thank I'd like to thank Tamara Swanson uh, of the uh, um, DEP staff. Uh, my own uh, uh, my 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 own um, legislative director uh, Navi Kaur, and I'm just making reference to my phone here. Everyone will. Everyone will give me a chance here because I'm the new guy, you know, just getting settled back in again. Um, oh, they they gave me first names. Isn't that great? OK, so I already thank Tamara. I'm thanking uh, Ricky and Nadia and John for all their good work in getting us to this good uh, point uh, to have this hearing. And my statement says that I'm turning it back to the committee council. How'd I do, Danny? OK, is that OK? You did great, uh, Chair Gennaro, as always. <laughs> Thank <laughs> it's great you. to have you back in the council, too. You're a strong advocate for the environment, and uh, we really benefit, New York City benefits from your presence here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny. Yep. I also want to thank uh, Robin Forst, uh, without whom I'd also be lost, because uh, she takes care of all the things that uh, I can't get to, and she's uh, been joining us on these hearings um, ever since they started. So thank you, Robin, as well, for all your work. Oh, uh, and I should... And I should probably try to, let's see, uh, let me go to, I'm just messing with everybody today. Let me go to gallery view and see what members of my committee are here as well. I should give them a shout out. I should, look. Uh, okay. Um, I see council member uh, Dharma Diaz is here <clears throat> and I'm looking for others in the uh, EP fold. Um, I would uh, ask Nabby to text me the names of people that I may not be able to see here on the screen. Um, and I'll give a shout out to my good friend, Barry Gredentic, just because I like him, I'm the chair, I can do whatever I want. And so uh, <laughs> there you have it. And so with that said, we're turning it over to the committee council, right, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, chairs. My name is Stephanie Louise and I am counsel to New York City's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. You will be called on to speak. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will now administer the affirmation to the administration witnesses. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Commissioner Sapienza. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Michael Deloach. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Angela Licata. I do. Thank you. And Chief Financial Officer Joseph Murray. I do. Thank you. Commissioner, you may begin when ready. Just before Commissioner starts, uh, Council, uh, I don't have the text chain for this uh, hearing. Can you uh, make sure that I get that? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Commissioner, why don't you start now? Thank you, and good, good morning, uh, Chair Drum, Chair Gennaro, members of the committees on environmental protection and finance, and Chair Gennaro, congratulations uh, again on your, your election and appointment to the committee, and we look forward to working with you as well. I am Vincent Sapienza. I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Jim. 
Uh, I'm Vincent Sapienza, the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, or DEP, and I'm here to speak about DEP's executive budget for FY22. I have some brief testimony. Uh, DEP's mission is to enrich the environment and protect public health for all New Yorkers by providing high-quality drinking water, managing wastewater and stormwater, and reducing air noise and hazardous materials pollution. We provide about a billion gallons a day of high-quality drinking water. Uh, it's delivered through reservoirs on our watershed through 7,000 miles of tunnels, aqueducts, and water mains. Another 7,500 miles of sewer lines convey the wastewater and stormwater, and we operate 14 wastewater resource recovery facilities around the five boroughs. Um, now in our operations during COVID. As I mentioned when I testified in March, I'm very proud of the work that DEP staff has done in the past year. We've maintained all core services throughout the pandemic without interruption or impact to water quality. Our workforce, workforce smoothly adapted uh, to the needs during the pandemic. Most of our staff continually reported to their job sites in the field, uh, though we implemented social distancing, required temperature checks, and provided them with extra personal protective equipment. Office staff worked from home if it was possible to do so, supported by our Bureau of Information Technology. Uh, on May 3rd, office staff began returning uh, following CDC and DCAS guidelines to keep everyone safe and healthy. Our staff has also stepped up to support the city's overall effort to fight COVID. Uh, starting last spring, DEP and DOHMH worked together along with outside experts to establish a coronavirus wastewater testing program. The program provided DOHMH with additional pieces of data to alert them to potential outbreaks around the city. Our lab staff also produced more than 17,000 gallons of hand sanitizer for other agencies, for the visiting nurse service, and to distribute to the public and city parks. DEP staff volunteered at the command center to make calls to identify PPE needs and to work in the vaccine hubs. We also made changes to some publicly facing procedures to ensure that we're providing the best customer assistance possible. We implemented a digital permitting system so that business and property owners could apply for necessary permits remotely. We implemented paperless solutions for vendor invoicing and payments. And for construction contracts, sealed bid envelopes are now publicly opened using Microsoft Teams for transparency. Uh, regarding fiscal impacts from COVID, like the rest of the city, DEP has felt Financial impacts, uh, our operating revenues are about $175 million lower than they were this time last year for two main reasons. First, water consumption is down about 4.7% as offices and businesses were closed or less active. Uh, the second reason is delays in water bill payments. Uh, significantly overdue payments have increased by 26% year over year with more than 40% belonging to non-residential customers. We know that many residents and business owners have been financially affected, and so our billing assistance teams have been actively working with customers on extended payment plans. And to the council members, if you hear from constituents who are having trouble paying a water bill, uh, please ask them to reach out to us at 718-595-7000, and we'll gladly work with them. Simply ignoring utility bills can unnecessarily blemish credit and cause avoidable late charges. Because we do not want to know when water consumption and bill payments will return to previous normal levels, we must take a conservative approach to our spending. We continue to speak with our regulators about relief on certain unfunded mandates, but we do not know what the outcomes of those discussions will be. DEP's proposed FY22 to 31 capital plan is $22.7 billion, of which 26% is for federal and state mandates. We are prioritizing projects to ensure that our funds are allocated where they best serve the public, such as improvements to our wastewater resource recovery facilities, for sewer replacements and extensions, and for water quality preservation initiatives. Uh, a little bit about the water rate now. Uh, the water and sewer rate had no increase in three of the past five years, including this current year, fiscal 21. Uh, for fiscal 22, the Water Board is considering an increase of 2.76% to cover projected needs. For an average single family, this amounts to a monthly increase of $2.22. As a point of comparison, the average single family in New York City spends 20% less on water and sewer charges than similar residents in other cities across the U.S. The proposed 2.76% rate increase in FY22 enables a 50% expansion of our customer affordability programs from $20 million pre to $30 million, uh, providing credits for an additional 53,000 billed customers who are in need. The proposed budget has no rental payment to the water system um, from the water system to the city's general fund for FY22. 
So looking forward, COVID has not stopped DEP from uh, moving on with critical work. Capital construction and repairs have continued, including the major Southeast Queens sewer build out, city water tunnel number three, and the repair of the Delaware Aqueduct. In 2020, we built more than 3,000 new green infrastructure assets in Queens. It's a record number of installations for a calendar year. On Earth Day last month, we launched the Harbor Protector Volunteer Program, which combines our rain garden stewardship program with catch basin cleanup, catch basin stenciling, and shoreline cleanup. The program launched with a kickoff event in Coney Island with staff, volunteers, and children from local schools working together to clean up litter and stencil catch basins. We look forward to continuing our innovative programs and progressing other critical work in partnership with the council. And my team and I are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, it's good to see you again too. And uh, this is uh, my final uh, budget hearings uh, for my tenure in the city council. And I've enjoyed working with you and particularly with Michael Deloach, who's so responsive to uh, any issues that I've had uh, in the past. So thank you and welcome again. Um, in the executive plan, DEP only received a small portion of federal funding. Can you please break down the sources of this federal funding? Was it stimulus funding or something else? And if it was stimulus funding, how would these funds be used? So, Mr. Chair, uh, we, we do get small amounts of federal funding, but none was from the, the stimulus program uh, at this point. Uh, you know, we, we continue to uh, look at all sources of funding that may be available, uh, you know, particularly looking at some of the infrastructure um, funding that's being discussed now. And we think that that may be helpful for the water program. Uh, that's where we are at this point. So you are having some discussions with OMB about um, capital projects? Uh, as, as far as the current uh, stimulus funding that has been provided to the city, uh, we know that the, those are being looked at for other uh, uses than, than the water system um, at this point. But, it, but again, we continue to work with OMB and uh, with our federal and state partners to find money for the water system. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> In your testimony, you mentioned uh, the, um, the water rate. The department's home water assistance program will be expanded by $8 million for a total of $14 million in fiscal 22. The multifamily water assistance program will also be expanded by up to $2 million for a total of $12 million um, uh, in fiscal 22. How many households do you anticipate receiving a bill credit in fiscal 22 for these programs? So, Mr. Chair, we, you know, we felt it was very important um, with, with many um, you know, residents still struggling uh, to pay their bills to expand our, our water affordability programs. And so, so we're going to be uh, providing additional bill credits uh, to, to those that are in need. Um, the $145 bill credit that, that goes to recipients will, will add an additional 45,000 uh, households for, for a total of 96,000. Um, and for the affordable apartments under the multifamily water assistance program, um, who will receive a $250 bill credit, we're adding uh, 8,000 uh, affordable uh, units uh, to uh, a total of 48,000. So another, an additional 20%. Okay, thank you. Uh, did you see an increase in the delinquency rate for non-payment of water charges in fiscal 2020 or 21? And can you please tell us the, um, what the delinquency rates were in each of those years and how they compared to prior years? Yeah, I'll, I'll start and then uh, turn it over to Joseph Muren, who's our chief financial officer. But we have seen uh, an increase in delinquencies, uh, particularly among uh, the, the, the non-residential uh, portion uh, of the billing. Uh, obviously, you know, businesses uh, were, were were significantly affected. And so there have been delays in what we consider, uh, you know, significantly delinquent beyond 180 days uh, on the bills. Um, and as I mentioned in my testimony, it's important that those who, who are having trouble paying bills, please contact us because uh, just ignoring the bill, you're accruing uh, late charges and fees, you're blemishing your, your credit to, to credit rating agencies. Um, so it's important that you get in touch with us. And we have a number of payment programs to extend over as much as 10 years uh, what you owe. So that's important. Uh, Joe, do you have the, the numbers? Uh, I have, uh, you know, as you referenced in the testimony, Commissioner, it's up by 26% over the prior year. 
And that breaks down, you know, the bulk of that, or I should say a, a large portion of that is in the commercial and industrial sector. There is still, you know, a large increase as well on the uh, residential, both for the single family and the multifamily home. But um, we, we do have a breakdown, which we could share with the, the chair and the members as well in terms of where that, you know, the, the, those numbers are at. Interesting, because um, DOF is also having a problem with the, um, you know, collection of taxes on uh, commercial properties as well. So that it's maybe connected with the water problem, with the water um, bills as well. You know, they've, I think they suffer a lot. And we've also seen, uh, Mr. Chair, a large decrease in the, the usage in our commercial and industrial and, uh, you know, the intent, uh, you know, the airports, the entertainment sector. So we think, you know, that's, you know, indicative and we've been working closely with OMB using those as indicators, you know, for both, you know, the impact of the pandemic as well as where the recovery might start happening. Um, we believe a lot of those, uh, those customers are having you know, economic impact from significantly reduced uh, business that has, you know, while it's maybe they're not using as much water, they also have accrued, you know, those larger balances on their non-payment of bills. So when you said that you've seen an increase in increase in water usage? Or no, an increase in the, uh, the, the delinquencies. Yes, okay. A very okay. large decrease in water usage. Right, right. Okay, a large decrease, right. Yeah, Mr. Okay. Chair, we've seen about a 4.7% uh, decrease in water usage uh, year over year. And that's you know, likely because a lot of businesses and offices uh, have been uh, shut down or, or, or slowed. Mm -hmm. Would that translate then into an increase in residential usage? Yes. Have, no. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting, Chair John. We, we have seen on the single family homes, uh, one or two family homes, uh, a, a slight increase in water usage as more folks work from home. Uh, we have seen that. But Overall, uh, water consumption citywide is down. Right. And if, Very interesting. You know, if you, I'm uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, but the breakdown was the single family was up about 3%. The multifamilies were down about 1.6%. And the uh, non-residential is down about 18.4%, you know, year over year. Right. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, the executive capital commitment plan includes $946.3 million to build combined sewer overflow tanks at two locations on the Gowanus Canal to reduce sewage outfall in the water body. What is the timeline to fully install these tanks and what level of combined sewer overflow reduction will be achieved with the tank installation? Okay, I'll start and then uh, I'll turn it over to Michael Deloach and Angela Licata. But um, I think the council is aware that EPA uh, designated the Gowanus Canal as a Superfund site and as part of their record of decision several years ago, uh, required the city to reduce combined sewer overflows into the canal uh, with the construction of two tanks, an 8 million gallon tank and a 4 million gallon tank, um, which we're, we're well underway with. Uh, obviously, they're large and um, complicated projects, going to be disrupt disruptive to the neighborhood once we start excavating and, and pouring concrete um, over, over the, the coming years. Uh, but, but properties have been acquired, work is underway, um, and we, we anticipate that uh, the work will probably go on through the end of the decade. We're still negotiating dates with EPA, um, but that's where we are. I don't know if Michael or Angela, you have anything to add? I don't. I think that I think that's a good summary of where we are. Okay, thank you. And um, I was going to say, uh, so what, what type of overflow reduction will be achieved with the tank installation? I don't know if Michael or Angela, you have that. I know it's over 80% uh, on, on both those outfalls. Do you have those numbers? Angela, do you want to go into some detail about the new storm rule and sort of the overall? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, the tanks, the two tanks are expected to exceed the EPA's requirements in their record of decision. Um, that required a range from 59 to 74% reduction in solids coming from combined sewer overflows. And we aim to be in the 80% or so um, target. And we um, also have for addressing growth, 
uh, due to and related to the city's proposed rezoning of the Gowanus area, what is known as a unified stormwater rule. So this would um, address our requirements um, to control stormwater flow and rate and would um, unify that with a new requirement to address water quality issues. So it would target a water quality volume as well. So together, um, those proposals would address um, the additional sanitary flows that are expected in the area and end up with a net neutral result to the sewer system. Okay, thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Um, let me move on to uh, the mayor's cleanup core. Mayor de Blasio recently announced the launch of the city's cleanup core, a program aimed to hire 10,000 New Yorkers to make New York City the cleanest, greenest city. With over 100,000 catch basin, basins citywide, has, DP, has DEP had any discussions with the agencies overseeing this initiative to ensure that catch, that catch basin grates are kept clean and that water during rain events flow easily? Well, thanks for the question, Chair Drummond. Uh, DEP was, was authorized uh, 254 um, headcount allocation from that. Uh, we've already had staff start within the past couple of weeks, um, and we intend to build up over the summer. But it's a great opportunity for, for uh, us to get a lot of work done related to you know, catch basins, hydrants, uh, just making sure that uh, our facilities are, are, are more adequately uh, maintained and, and kept in in a in good state of repair. Uh, it's also a good opportunity for those we hire uh, as, as we have you know, vacancies for positions, full-time positions at DEP. Uh, you know, we think uh, it's a good opportunity for folks to, to you know, move up into, into those positions ultimately. Well, that's fantastic. That's really good news to hear. All right, you know, I was a New York City public school teacher for 25 years before I got elected to the council. So I have to ask an environmental education question. DEP offers an educational programming to all age groups and more to the DOE for K-12 education. Uh, what are some of the educational programs being offered by DEP? And was this programming impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic? So I'll start and then hand it over to Michael. But you, you know, we, we want to make sure that uh, people who pay a water bill uh, and kids as well understand you know, where their water comes from and, and how uh, complicated it is to get water to a tap. And then what happens when you flush the toilet, where that, where that water goes and how it's treated. So uh, we've been doing many programs over the years and, and Michael, you can expand on that. Yeah, I mean, we're incredibly proud of our education team who um, always does good work, but during the pandemic really went above and beyond uh, ensuring that we had virtual learning and that we had digital resources, online tours to walk through people, uh, the process of what DEP does. Um, we also did a new climate change uh, education module, which is in coordination with DOE, which is some really new pertinent information about the risks of climate change. So yeah, we've, we, you know, we think we reached about 40,000 people in a, in, a, in a usual year. And I think with everything we've done to be more nimble and digital, I think we reached more teachers, more students. So we're also looking forward to getting back to, you know, being outside and doing, we have trout in the classroom, we have lots of activities at the visitor center in Newtown Creek. So we're excited to get back to, to more outdoor programming, but we've definitely adjusted in, in ways that are gonna be beneficial moving forward, even regardless of the pandemic to give more educational tools to teachers and to students, so. Yeah, right. thank you. Yeah. I always find it fascinating and I think kids would too, um, to find out how New York City gets its water. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and from all the way upstate and places like that. But anyway, um, I'm going to move on. I'm going to turn it over to Chair Gennaro. Uh, but before I do, let me just check to make sure that everybody has been announced. Um, we have Council Members Adam, Adams, Barron, Lewis, Dharma Diaz, Powers, Grudenchik, Amphrey Samuel, Ulrich, Koslowitz, Minority Leader Matteo, and Council Member Van Bramer. And I hope that I've gotten everyone, but I think that I did. So let's go over to Chair Gennaro. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that, and thank you, uh, uh, you know, thank you, Vinny, for your uh, for your good answers to the chairman's questions and all of your staff. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to see Angela Lacata, uh, with whom I know I've, uh, uh, I've had a um, uh, you know long working relationship. 
uh, when I was at the council and then when I was over at uh, DEC. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, um, this is a question for the commissioner. Um, in review of DEP's fiscal 2022 budget, I noticed that DEP has a number of uh, vacancies agency-wide as it stands now. The current fiscal year, the budget headcount is 6,258 positions, while the actual number of filled positions is 5,679, leaving over 579 vacancies. Um, let me just follow up with that. It appears that with regard to green infrastructure, they seem to be, according to the staff analysis, the most difficult to fill, with only 96 of the 210 positions filled to date and follow up to that it appears that engineering design and construction jobs are uh, also have a lot of vacancies with only 353 of 423 positions fills to date um, and as we move forward to fiscal 2022 what is the strategy to make sure that the budgeted headcount needs are filled in a more timely manner hey, mr chair thanks for the question um, the, the, the hiring slowdown uh, over the, the past year uh, has resulted in uh, you know a larger number of, uh, of vacancies as, as people left city service. Um, we, we've done a number of things um, in, in the past months uh, to work with OMB uh, now that the fiscal situation uh, has stabilized with some of the funding that we've uh, you know gotten citywide. Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll speak first about the green infrastructure program. So many of those, uh, hires there, uh, are to maintain our, uh, rain gardens, bioswales, and those are seasonal hires. So we will ramp those up uh, rather quickly to get, get all those filled. Um, you mentioned engineering design and construction. Uh, it's been, you know, it's typically a challenge to, uh, hire and, and retain, uh, engineering talent, uh, for the city. Um, we've had a number of retirements at the Bureau of Engineering with Design and Construction. Uh, but again, as, as the hiring um, slowdown and freeze opens up, we, we expect to um, you know, call some civil service list and hire there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to uh, uh, go off my question list for a second just to follow up on something you said about uh, you know, DEP is very comprehensive COVID response and all the ways that, uh, you know, DEP stepped up to um, make a positive difference in the COVID crisis. I want to thank you and all, all of your staff for doing that. That's certainly more of a comment than a question. Just want to pay tribute to DEP's good work uh, in that regard. <clears throat> I remember way back when, when I uh, passed the stormwater management plan and that became law. Uh, and and a, a big part of you know, DEP's um, um, uh, stormwater management um, 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 methodology has been to build the uh, rain gardens. I have many of them um, around my district that are either finished or in a you know, state of, uh, of, of being constructed. And um, do we have any um, estimate on the uh, on, on what kind of uh, on what kind of CSO reductions will be realized uh, by virtue of the deployment of all of these rain guards? Because people but, come uh, to me and they say, like, you know, you know, what are these rain guards really going to do? It's just a small area, um, and of course, I tell them that it was my legislation that led to these things built in the first place, which, of course, they're very appreciative of, and I I I, I say that jokingly because you know, not so much. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, I like to be able to give them an yeah, um, informed response on the you know, value added to local water quality from the installation of the rain guards. You're right, Mr. Chair. This goes back uh, you know, to, to your previous tenure. Um, and just as a little bit of a background, you know, in New York City, it's mostly paved. So when it rains, uh, water just runs off, goes into the sewer system, and the sewers can be um, you know, overwhelmed and, and release uh, excess water into local waterways. That's called combined sewer overflows. Uh, there's almost all, so much we can do uh, as far as hard, what we call gray infrastructure. Yeah. Or, uh, those are tanks and bigger sewers. So uh, we started at the time looking at keeping stormwater runoff out, out of the sewer system by 
building rain gardens. And these are these right. herbicide uh, devices that, that store uh, runoff that otherwise would go in a catch basin and into the sewer system. And I think we have about almost 11,000 uh, now either built or, or in construction currently. And uh, Angela, do you have uh, numbers on, on reductions in combined sewer overflow? Yes, Commissioner, um, and absolutely um, wonderful program. Thank you for your leadership and thank you for your, your um, trust in our innovation here. Uh, we aim, expect that these 11,000 assets that are either constructed or in construction will result in over 1,500 gallons of combined sewer overflow reduction. And we have targeted these assets within those priority water bodies where we are struggling um, to meet water quality standards for a variety of reasons. There, there are many impairments in those water bodies and CSOs is one of those impairments. <clears throat> but, but when you speak of reduction of 1500 gallons, I think you said, is, is, is that um, uh, um, 1500 gallons over what period of time or is that per, per, per asset or? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, thank you for correcting me. I'm actually really sorry. Yes, it's about 500 million gallons of reduction and it's about 1500 green acres. Oh, okay, great. Um, catch that. Yes, so a green acre is, um, we measure that with one inch of rainfall over an acre of property. So right. that's how we calculate that based on those 1500 um, greened acres, we will achieve about 507 million gallons of reduction in combined sewer overflow per year. Great, great. Okay, that, 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 that kind of frames it out a little better. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Deputy Commissioner. Feels funny to call you Deputy Commissioner. I always call you Angela. So anyways. Um, I, I, I have a question for the commissioner regarding biosolid treatment and disposal. Um, of course, we're all aware that a core function or agency that he must process, export, and dispose of biosolid material. However, I believe, uh, well, I don't like the wording of this question. Uh, let me reword it. Um, uh, you know, to what extent are we trying to achieve more beneficial reuse of the biosolids rather than disposal. And I say that with uh, a knowledge that um, sometimes the, um, uh, that the biosolid material has been contaminated by heavy metals, which is just, you know, is what it is. And if you have something that is contaminated it is sometimes very hard to beneficially reuse it. Uh, so uh, to what extent, um, uh, are we kind of forced to simply dispose of it rather than beneficially reuse it? And is there some sort of pathway to how we can more beneficially reuse uh, this material or is the cost of doing that uh, prohibitive? It, it's certainly our goal, uh, Mr. Chair, to continue to push the beneficial reuse. The, the, and we generate about 1300 tons per day uh, of this organic material that gets removed from the wastewater treatment plants. Um, going back, I'm gonna to say to 2008 or nine, the, the, the cost of landfilling that material was so much cheaper than beneficially using it because the beneficial use requires another step in the process. And um, just to, to try to keep water rates in check uh, going back right. from 2009, 10 and 11, uh, we essentially did 100% landfilling. Over the last few years though, uh, we, we've tried to make a better effort to beneficially use. And we're actually up to now about 31% of that material being beneficially used, 69% still going to landfill. But the goal over time is to continue to do more and more beneficial use. Uh, but it, it, it would be fair to say that, you know, some, uh, that, that there is some contamination of this material which precludes its beneficial reuse. And when you make reference to an additional step, it's probably a step that would remove some of the harmful contaminants. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and it's mostly uh, what they call pathogen reduction, uh, Mr. Chair. At, at this point, that's what we need to do. So doing things like composting, lime stabilization, um, digesting for, for more time uh, does that. 
Uh, I just, I have the, the cost, by the way, I want to give you that too. For, for landfilling, we're now paying $122 per ton. Beneficial use is $139 per ton. So that, that extra processing uh, is right. about $17 per ton. Okay, well, we, we, will, we will continue to, uh, to uh, track that. And I, pre and I you know, certainly applaud your efforts to uh, you know, maximize beneficial reuse. Uh, you know, within prudent fiscal boundaries. So thank you for that. Uh, another question about the, or, or my next question will be about the Roundout West Branch uh, Tunnel. Roundout West Branch Tunnel conveys Delaware water supply across the Hudson River towards the city as a critical component to the water supply system, delivering more than 50% uh, the drinking of the city's drinking water annually. Uh, this is kind of a history of a problem. The leak was first detected. In 1991, I will remember that. I was on staff at the council at the time uh, and is expected uh, that the leak rate is uh, about uh, 15 to 35 million gallons per day. That's been long known uh, to, uh, uh, so we, we had to build the bypass and okay, let me finally get to the question. Uh, when does DUP anticipate connecting the bypass tunnel? Uh, I know we had a, a previous conversation where we talked about this a little bit and about the preparations for the, for the shutdown, how long that will be, and if you could walk us through how we will operate during that shutdown so that we can uh, make sure that all you know, New Yorkers have uh, an adequate supply of clean water during the bypass period. And how long will the shutdown be in place? You know, you get the general idea. I do, yeah, this, this is the, uh, the largest water supply uh, repair program that New York City has ever undertaken. So the Delaware Aqueduct, which conveys about 50% of the water used by uh, the city of New York, uh, has been leaking for, for quite a while in the section of pipe that's directly under the Hudson River, about 600 feet below the Hudson River. Um, to, to make the repair, we just can't take the, the aqueduct out of service and get in there and, and spend a year repairing it. So the solution was to build a parallel tunnel uh, we've, and which is now built two and a half miles long um, up by Newburgh. And next year in 2022, uh, likely October, uh, we will be connecting that parallel section of new pipe to the existing old pipe that's leaking. Um, and that we expect to take about five months. So during the winter of 2022 into 2023, uh, the Delaware Aqueduct will be offline uh, for that, that uh, repair project. But uh, we do anticipate that we will have sufficient water from our Catskill system and from our Croton system uh, to make up the difference during that period. Uh, great. Uh, and and um, I'll just add to um, anyone listening, there are some people that are that, that you know, may be concerned about the water quality that would come from the uh, now offline Southeast Queens wells and it is DEP's uh, plan, as I understand it, that in order to supplement the city's water supply during the uh, you know during the during that period when the, the when the Croton is off, well, when the uh, when when the Delaware Aqueduct is offline, uh, DEP will not have to rely on any water from the Southeast Queens wells. Is is, is that a fair statement? That, that's a fair statement. So we've looked at uh, the needs of you know, New Yorkers. And we, again, we use about a billion gallons of water a day. Uh, the Catskill system and the Croton system can, can achieve that uh, without us having to activate the Queens wells. We right. had considered it at one point, but uh, it's, it's not needed uh, as far as we know right now. Uh, uh, great, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, next question. Uh, the capital commitment plan includes 610 million to complete the Brooklyn Queens leg of the city water tunnel, water tunnel number three. The two new shafts will be constructed. Equipment in the existing shafts will be rehab. Tunnel, tunnel corrosion will be addressed and the new electrical telecommunications and security systems will be installed. City water number three is important to ensure that we have redundancy on a system uh, and a backup for tunnels number one and number two. Many people know all this. Um, so here comes the question, when can we expect water tunnel number three projects to be fully completed and the system 100% online? It's, it's my, my own recollection that this was a project that was first conceived of in 1954. I'm doing this from memory, 1954. 
and I believe started in 1971. Is that right? Does that sound right? That's right. Okay. Yeah. So this is the 50th anniversary of us putting shovels in the dirt and making this happen. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. but again, to the so so um, here we are, 50 years in. How close are we? When are we gonna um, uh, be be have have uh, have all uh, uh, have the total build out of total number three fully realized? Yeah, Mr. Chair, you're right. It goes back uh, 50 years, and uh, it's been built in in sections. City Water Tunnel Number Three, uh, the Bronx portion went into service in 1998. The Manhattan leg of the tunnel went into service in 2013, and we're now completing the Brooklyn Queens leg of the tunnel. It's a 10 and a half mile section uh, of tunnel that will serve Brooklyn and Queens. Six of the eight shafts that bring water from seven or 800 feet below ground uh, to the surface have been completed. We have two final shafts to go, 17B and 18B. Uh, construction contractor is, is mobilized now. It's the company named Walsh that's gonna be doing uh, this work to, to build the, um, the, the two last shafts. Uh, you, you spoke about redundancy and you're right, you, you know, tunnel one and tw tunnel two are, are decades old and that's why we're building tunnel three. But um, as I mentioned, the, the tunnel itself, that deep tunnel uh, has been in service in the Bronx, in Manhattan, and there's actually fresh water flowing through it in the Brooklyn Queens section that's already uh, constructed. So uh, we feel that we have a good level of redundancy at this point. Um, but as we move forward, constructing those two last shafts, there's other work, as you said, that needs to be done um, and, and tested. We anticipate that sometime around the end of the decade, we will then take tunnel number one out of service uh, right. to do maintenance and repair there and have tunnel three fully in service. Okay, uh, but in terms of when the, 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 the um, when tunnel number three, all remaining shafts are fully built out, we're talking another 10 years or something or how, yeah. how much? Yeah, we, we think less than that. Um, it, it, you know, we, we, we've, spoken to the construction contractor. And as he said, you know, until I start uh, drilling through the bedrock and going down, you know, seven, 800 feet, I'm right. not gonna for sure. But, uh, you know, we have estimates that, that uh, you know, it, it will take less than that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And this is something we, we, we talked about previously. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're doing redundancy with regard to tunnel number three. And of course we need that. There are sections of the city that uh, don't quite yet have a full uh, build out with regard to um, storm sewers. Uh, and I'm talking, uh, uh, of course, about Southeast Queens. Uh, here's the question with a, a narrative and then a question. Flooding in Southeast Queens has been a persistent issue for many years. Um, and, you know, the residents of Southeast Queens um, you know, have to deal with these street flooding issues and home flooding issues. I know that you know, DEP has been working assiduously to try to get plans for the Southeast Queens sewer build out uh, with respect to the executive capital commitment plan, a 10-year capital strategy. What is uh, currently, uh, you know, now let me change this question. Um, you know, when can the people of Southeast Queens reasonably assume uh, that what is on the drawing board now, and from our last conversation, I know uh, that the full plan right out to the last catch basin, uh, you know, already exists, so we're no longer drawing it on paper, uh, but when we expect for uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Southeast Queens sewer build out, uh, that is storm sewer build out to be, uh, to be fully constructed and in place. Yeah, Mr. Chair, as you know, uh, the residents of Southeast Queens have been long suffering uh, since they, the area was developed and uh, streams that natural streams that, that had drained that area were filled sure. in uh, by unscrupulous real estate developers. Um, it, it's been a challenge. Um, and until Mayor de Blasio in, in 2015 announced a $1.5 billion program, a commitment uh, to the residents there to build out the sewer system, uh, that, that was the real first, uh, you know, large amount of, of funding that went towards that. And we've been making inc incremental progress. So we've been working with DDC. We've uh, completed already a number of projects that have uh, helped residents in, in, in some areas. Uh, we will continue on uh, with that funding. We, we, the pot of money, Joe Muir, and I think is now over uh, $1.7 billion, uh, but uh, we will continue that work until it's completed. Uh, 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 thank you, Commissioner. Certainly this, uh... I know that I, 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 I think I speak for uh, 
uh, you know, all of the members uh, from uh, Southeast Queens and also for Chair Drum, also from Queens, uh, uh, Councilmember Adams, I, 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 I uh, saw was uh, uh, is part of this hearing as well. Uh, and so we, we would, uh, you know, urge, uh, you know, DEP with all due dispatch to, um, uh, you know, seek to allocate um, appropriate funding. And of course, building these sewers um uh you know does cause some dislocation um in the community uh but uh this is uh, uh something that uh i see as as you know as i begin my tenure uh, as chair of the committee once again to uh try to work with my colleagues in uh, southeast queens and with your good people to uh move this on also with the next administration uh i'll be pushing for as much funding as we can possibly have to make this uh, work as uh, work as uh, quickly as possible, and with that, that is uh, all of the questions that I had. And um, so now, what am I supposed to do, uh, Mr. Back, Chairman? So we're going to go back to Council, who has a, a list of Council members who want to ask questions. Oh, so so now are any are are you going out of way, um, out of your way to make my job easy today? Uh, uh, if so, I greatly appreciate that. Appreciate. Well, that. I'll tell you, Zoom is Zoom has been great now that we've learned it. <laughs> right. Okay. And you've been doing it for so long, and this is my first thing. People are texting me who's on, who's not, or whatever. And uh, uh, so I, 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 I uh, you know, leave the uh, it in the uh, um, able hands of, um, of the committee council to recognize other members for their good questions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, yes, sir. And thank, thank you, Vinny, and, 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 your, and your great team. I, uh, of course, reserve the right to come back and ask more questions. Of course. But, uh, of course. Okay. You bet. Of course. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. If any council member has questions for DEP, please use the Zoom raise hand function. You'll be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers. Please wait for the sergeant at arms to tell you when your time begins. The sergeant will then let you know when your time is up. We will now hear from Council Member Adams. Time starts now. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much to our to our chairs, Chair Drum, Chair Janelle. It is it is just a delight to hear you um, officiating this this hearing this morning. You have brought a lot of joy to my heart <laughs> today. So I'm so happy to have you as chair on environmental protection. You just don't know. Your expertise is invaluable to the council. So thank you. And thank you also for highlighting um, in your questioning the issues of Southeast Queens. We've been through a lot. Commissioner Sapienza, we've been through so much, haven't we? A lot. Sure. Uh, for sure, we've been through a lot, um, a lot of pain, but uh, you have been there with us from day one. Um, you know, just hanging tough with us through thick and thin, literally. Michael Deloach, can't thank you enough um, for your help as well during the extensive, and it's still going on, the extensive um, issues around the South Ozone Park sewer emergency that happened two years ago. My constituents are still suffering very greatly, greatly. I, I can't believe it, but they're still suffering very, very great, greatly. Um, because of that emergency, that disaster, uh, which it's turned out to be, and I'm in touch with them um, multiple times during the week, actually, um, ongoing. So um, I guess, you know, I don't really have anything prepared, but it's such a sensitive issue for me, um, still literally being in the trenches um, around this issue. Um, I, I guess, Commissioner, you know, I've just, I just hear from my constituents that um, subsequent to the sewer emergency, there have been issues of flooding that haven't existed before. So I don't know, know if you're aware of it. I, I'm going to assume you are. Can you just give me a little bit of insight and explanation as to why that's happening, why my constituents are still suffering with flooding? Uh, even though the construction that's going on, we know in the long run, that's going to be you know the best thing for us. But why are they still suffering with issues of flooding today? Yeah, thanks, Council Member, and thanks for all your amazing work uh, for, for months and months of uh, being out there 
um, and, and supporting us all. Um, it was, you know, terrible situation, obviously, for, for more than a hundred uh, property owners there, the homeowners uh, still suffering, as you said. Um, what we've done is, uh, to date, and, and I'll talk about the flooding in a, in a minute, is replace about a half mile section of sewer that was built uh, by New York State DOT when they did the Nassau Expressway job. And we just determined that that whole section of sewer just wasn't able to be rehabilitated. It was just of such poor quality. So we built a, a new section, a half mile long of new sewer um, to do that. Um, we're, the, the storm sewer program that Chair Gennaro talked about is also proceeding and that will help. Uh, Stormwater flooding is still a challenge for South Ozone Park. I, I won't deny that uh, during heavy rains. Uh, there's plenty of street ponding and flooding, but um, you know, as we move forward in time and get these additional projects done, that will certainly help. I appreciate that. We've got a long way to go. Uh, my constituents are still pumping water, you know, um, and you know, my heart goes out to them. You know, I've been you know, um, in a whole lot of different settings with them in the homes and press conferences and meetings. And like I said, this, this is ongoing. So um, I'm also gonna throw out there before my time is up and I, I don't know if you can respond to this, it may be somewhere else, but we've had numerous complaints about the boiler installations that have gone on and the fact that some of these boilers are faulty. We don't know if they've passed code. We know that there have been noises, there have been fumes. Um, and my constituents, I mean, it's it's just so much that's gone on, you know, as a as a, a you know, as a backlash because of this um, horrible emergency. So now we're looking at equipment that was installed that's possibly faulty, um, that we're not, you know, up to code um, as it should be. So we don't know if it's just, you know, give them the leftovers, whether or not this equipment was used. We don't know where this equipment um, came from, but those are the facts. So uh, among a whole lot of other facts. So uh, I'll just put that there. I don't know if you have anything to say. I'm going to request Chair Gennaro's um, ongoing advocacy with us in Southeast Queens on resolving all of these issues. We've got issues of black mold, uh, which we knew were gonna happen and nobody really wanted to listen to the long-term. It's two years later. And now we have people being sick of the black mold because of that situation as well. It's just, you know, multiple situations going on over there. But can you address the boiler issue at all? Sure, and, and I'll be brief and then turn it over to Michael Deloach who's been uh, really on top of this. So we've gotten uh, complaints from some of the homeowners who received new boilers and, and we provided new boilers and hot water heaters to, to those uh, who had basements flooded. Um, we've, we've gotten complaints about uh, from, from uh, the homeowners and the plumbing community uh, about some issues related to the boilers. And we've been working uh, with the Department of Buildings uh, on that. And Michael, you can, you can take over from here. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, Council Member. I've been working closely with Ms. Cook, who's keeping good track of all the issues that residents are having. I, will, I just want to be clear from the beginning, though, that all of the equipment that was installed was confirmed brand new through DEP, working with the contractor that we had and everything was done to code with all the DOB permitting that we kept track of. So just to make sure that we're clear, it, it is new infrastructure and it was to code. Um, there are some existing issues with things not related to the direct installation of a new uh, boiler or hot water heater that we didn't necessarily do that is having some issues, but we are definitely working through, uh, I know there's a handful that we're, we're talking to Ms. Cook constantly with about to, to help resolve, but I just wanted to make, to make clear because I, I, you know, I was out there firsthand and saw it all happening. It was working all the homeowners. I just want to be clear. It was to code and it was new. That doesn't mean that there aren't some issues that we're still working to resolve, but uh, we're, we're definitely, uh, you know, working as much as we can, appreciating that this has gone on for too long and trying to do what we can to make it right for, for the property owners out there. I appreciate that, Michael. And again, thank you for being on top of this. We know that Ms. Cook is our champion out there. For sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> so uh, we thank her publicly as well for, for all of her hard work. It has not been easy at all for her. So uh, I, I appreciate uh, uh, your partnership ongoing. Um, and Commissioner, of course, your steadfast dedication to, um, to a solution to these problems that are just excruciating for my constituents. And Chair Gennaro, for your ongoing advocacy and partnership in helping us um, to uh, get solutions to these issues in Southeast Queens. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, and and, and uh, 
Uh, I'm going to just jump in here for a, a second, make a make a note to staff, uh, to the council of the committee, Samara Swanson, uh, and to my legislative director, uh, uh, Nabi Kaur, to follow up with council member Adams. You know, she made a, a note about working with us to follow up on the mold issues and some of the other issues that she's addressed. And uh, so I'd ask staff to put that in motion with council member Adams. I want to be part of that. And so, um, uh, so uh, thank you for uh, you know uh, 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 um, asking us to work with you, Councilmember Adams, and uh, we'll 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 get that scheduled and we'll work with you on that. So uh, thank you. Yes, and uh, may I add, you know, those uh, residents are so lucky to have you, Councilmember Adams, out there fighting for them and making sure that their situation, which you know I heard of uh, at a hearing, I believe it was last year which was so terrible. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully, I, I, as I hear you now, that's being corrected. So I can't imagine having a home, paying a mortgage, and yet finding yourself homeless, which was the case for many of those residents. So it's good to hear the DEP is working with you on that. Thank you. Uh, I think that that's it for questions. And we're gonna have uh, Health and Hospitals is here, I believe this. I see uh, Dr. Katz is here. So we're gonna move right into that. Uh, the section, if that's all right with council, I have a statement mm -hmm. to read. Council, we're okay, no other questions? No. Uh, I, 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 I'll just take this opportunity if, uh, if we're finished with DEP to uh, uh, you know, thank the commissioner and his great team and uh, for their uh, testimony today, for all of their work leading up to today and uh, thanking them in advance for their ongoing partnership as we, uh, as we move through the budget and uh, you know, protect the environment and water delivery of New York City. Thank you, Sam here. Thank you, Chair Gennaro. Uh, at this point, this will conclude this portion of today's hearing. Thank you to the Department of uh, Environmental Protection for being here. We will now move on to health and hospitals. I ask my colleagues who will be joining us for this portion of the hearing to remain in this Zoom with your microphone muted until we are ready to begin. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Dr. Katz. Can you we give you an audio check right quick, please? Good morning. Good morning. You're coming in loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Yang. Can we do an audio check, please? Okay, while we wait for Dr. Yang, uh, Chrissy Flannery, can we do audio check, please? Good morning. Good morning. You're coming in loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilmember Rivera, can we do audio check, please? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You're coming in loud and clear. Thank you.
Good morning, John Uberg, Senior Vice President. Can we do audio check, please? Good morning. Good morning. You're coming in loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, good morning, Chair Rivera. Are you ready to start? Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Chair Drum, are we ready to go? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the City Council's eighth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2022. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We just heard from the Department of Environmental Protection and we will now hear from New York City Health and Hospitals. We are joined by the Committee on Hospitals, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Carlina Rivera, and we are also joined by the following Council Members. Adams, Amphrey Samuel, Barron, Brooke Powers, Dharma Diaz, Rodenchik, Kostelowitz, Levin, Lewis, Mizell, and Moya. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement but I'd like to turn it over to Chair Rivera for her statement. Thank you so much. It's my favorite time of year. I get to preside with the inimitable Danny Drum. Thank you, Chair Drum, for everything. I'm Councilwoman Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals at the New York City Council. During today's hearing, we will review the New York City Health and Hospitals $980 million fiscal 2022 executive budget operating subsidy, of which $619 million is city funding. This week marks the beginning of the easing of social distancing restrictions for COVID-19, and we are beginning to see a resemblance of normality return. We are on the precipice of tremendous change. And as we look back on the devastation of the past 15 months, we can clearly see the important role public health and our public hospital system played. The next steps we take will be key to New York City's future. Gone are the days where we can cut funding to health. Instead, we must arm ourselves for the future and the next health crises and systemic inequities already present in our system. Thankfully, the federal government has invested billions of dollars to combat the pandemic, including many dollars that have made their way to H&H. &H. However, New York State's fiscal 2022 enacted budget includes close to $90 million in budget cuts to H&H. &H. The state must reverse these troubling cuts in next year's legislative session, and our city needs to commit to putting more funding in H&H &H for the future, particularly to ensure that any new or old initiatives funded through one-time federal investments are not suddenly eliminated. We cannot be caught unguarded ever again, and funding needs to be available every year in preparation for any health care risk. And though New York City is in a much better place, having reached the lowest rate of positivity in the last six months, there are still New Yorkers getting sick from COVID-19 every day. The number of people vaccinated must increase significantly. H&H &H must continue to reach people where they are with mobile vaccination sites and door-to-door -door vaccination efforts. The distribution of vaccines is still not equitable. And while I appreciate the city's commitment of $9 million to community-based organizations to do further vaccine outreach, it's troubling that it took so long to get this money out the door. 
and that it's coming from DOHMH, not T2, which has led COVID outreach efforts since the beginning of the pandemic. Outreach has never been more important and it must be improved, particularly in all languages and media types. And for those who still get infected, H&H will continue to provide support in helping them stay isolated and find the health supports they need. I look forward to seeing how the COVID centers of excellence support long haulers. We also need to make an investment into the future of primary care. It has never been clearer how necessary it is to reduce the rates of chronic illnesses, such as asthma and diabetes that disproportionately affect people of color in our city. We've known for a long time how these greater, how these diseases can impact the daily lives of people, but the pandemic emphasized how much of a greater risk people with chronic illnesses face. And as we move forward, H and H is going to play a vital role in ensuring New Yorkers receive primary care and, on, and are able to prevent or halt the development of chronic illnesses before they become high risk. It has never been more important for New York to commit financially to the well-being of New Yorkers. And finally, COVID-19 has made us critically examine the role our public hospital system plays in the overall framework of public health initiatives. In just the last few years, we've seen new programs from H&H &H, like the T2 initiative, which continues to draw both, both praise and debate from advocates, New York City Care, which has helped countless New Yorkers gain health insurance, and other fantastic initiatives like investments in cure violence programs and EMS responses to New Yorkers struggling with mental health crises. It's clear that H&H &H is at a crossroads when we think about where their services end and begin. Is it at the door of a hospital or the door of someone struggling in our community? I look forward to discussing that future today. And finally, I would like to thank the administration for providing the backup documents for H&H's budget to council in a timely manner. This has been an issue we've discussed throughout my term, and I do want to acknowledge your efforts to assist us in providing the public with the level of transparency our citizens deserve. I'd also like to thank all representatives from Health and Hospital for their consistent hard work and dedication. I look forward to our discussion today about Health and Hospital's budget and the role in the recovery and future of health in New York. Thank you, and I will now turn it back over to the chair. Was I muted? Thank you, Chair Rivera. Thank you for your kind words. And I do also love working with you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, well, next here from H&H, uh, &H, we are joined by Dr. Mitchell Katz, President and Chief Executive Officer of New York City Health and Hospitals, who is joined by several colleagues. Before H&H &H begins the testimony, I'm going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items and to swear in the witnesses. Uh, council. Yes, Chair. My name is Stephanie Ruiz and I am counsel to New York City's Council's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you'll need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that it could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you'll be called on to speak. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will now mention the affirmation to witnesses. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Uh, Dr. Katz? I do. Thank you. Mr. Altberg? I do. Thank you. Dr. McDonald. Just give us a moment to unmute. Dr. McDonald? Yes, I do. And I'd also like to note that Dr. Yang is, is present as well, Dr. Patsy Yang. So I do as well. Thank you, Dr. Yang. And Ms. Flattery? I do. Thank you. Dr. Katz, you may begin when ready. And just right. before you begin, Dr. Katz, I just want to say thank you very, very much to you 
and to everyone at H and H for the tremendous work that you have done over the last year. I don't know how you were able to keep up with it and accomplish everything that you did. Uh, you know, I spoke highly of you uh, at the beginning of the week at Elmhurst Hospital, uh, and I am particularly grateful for your personal touch, for your outreach, for the phone conferences that you gave us, uh, for the placement of folks in, 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 in hotels so they could convalesce. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, say thank you to you, to all of the doctors, all of the administrative staff, the nurses, um, everybody at h, h for the job that you've done over the last year. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Katz. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum, and thank you, Chair Rivera, and to all the members of the Committee on Finance and Hospitals. It, it's truly an honor uh, to work for all of you. It's truly an honor to lead the amazing women and men of health and hospitals, who I do think, as you've said, Chair, have done such an amazing job uh, through this incredible year, both in healing people and holding people's hands as they sadly passed away, of bolstering their colleagues when people felt low. People came in, uh, even though they were fearful of taking home the virus to their families, getting sick themselves. Many people got sick themselves. Um, and, uh, but everybody stood up. Um, that's what I really noticed that people, people came, they did their job. Uh, you know, when there was uh, a shortage of oxygen in places in India, I, I was remembering how uh, my amazing facilities person who's on this call, Christine Flaherty had figured out at a moment when we too looked like we were not gonna have enough oxygen in one of our hospitals, she figured out how as an engineer to cool the oxygen tanks so that the oxygen would keep flowing. And that was the kind of thing, you know, everybody came in at 11 o'clock on Saturday night or 2 a.m. on Sunday and did whatever uh, needed to be done. So thank you for the privilege of, of being here. Uh, this is a, a, a finance report, so I'm gonna mostly talk about finance and, and I'll know that you'll um, raise program issues uh, as, as you wanna talk about them. Uh, bottom line is we're gonna close fiscal 21 year with $734 million, um, which is a very healthy balance for us to close the year. Uh, we've achieved 1% above budget variance uh, by $65 million. Uh, we've brought in uh, insurance revenue, $331 million higher uh, in quarter three, fiscal year 20, which matches uh, the health insurance revenue that we brought in $500 million above in the prior year. And I just want to take a minute and say, I know uh, three and a half years ago, uh, when uh, this Brooklyn boy who had mistakenly been in California for 25 years returned home and said, gee, I think there's a huge revenue opportunity here. People thought I was crazy, that I wasn't prepared necessarily to make the hard decisions, that I, I didn't understand, you know, the constraints. Um, but we've proven, no, we can, we're not interested in billing patients. We're interested in billing insurance when people have insurance. We're interested in doing all of the parts, the coding, making sure that our diagnostic codes match billing codes, uh, making sure that our contracts pay us fair rates uh, from insurers so that we're not giving them a free ride because we don't know how to do our business. And it's proven that yes, in fact, we can make a huge uh, difference. Uh, and so I, I, I know you'll want to talk more with my uh, terrific CFO, John Olberg, who's on the call um, about what we've done. Uh, but I, I think it, it has been financially uh, a very great success story. Um, Chair Rivera was kind to mention um, our efforts around vaccines. Uh, we're very proud of the role we've played of vaccinating people in all the hospitals um, and uh, all of our clinics. Uh, we're proud of the T2. I, I know it was a bumpy start, um, but it became the, we believe, the most successful and largest uh, test and trace efforts anywhere in the US and had better metrics. And we were one of the few places to show metrics and we did it with our sister uh, agency, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, 
with whom we enjoy working with and we will continue, I think in the coming years to deepen uh, that connection. Uh, we've had a recent success um, with our show vans, which uh, we're very proud of. We have vans that are now going out uh, and vaccinating homeless individuals, uh, also providing them uh, dressing changes and other medical care. And it's been exceedingly successful and uh, it fits a really nice niche. And I, again, I, I go to Chair Rivera's narrative about where health and hospitals begins and ends. Uh, we know that there are people who need us who don't come to the hospital. Um, but of course, I can tell you as a practicing physician, it is challenging to take care of people in a train station or on a sidewalk because you have no privacy. So how can you, how can you begin to either ask people or undress their wounds? And we think that these vans are a really good compromise because we can go, we can park the van where there are a place uh, with a lot of people who are homeless or poorly housed, and then we can bring them into the van. Um, we offer snacks and water, um, and then we have a private place. Um, and we found it very successful for vaccination, very successful for giving people Narcan kits in case of overdose. Um, and we think that we can keep to grow this initiative and that it has a really nice niche uh, for our city. Uh, so we're, we're very proud of that. Uh, I have to mention there, you know, there are always financial risks going forward. Uh, probably the largest is there is a complicated pra uh, practice for getting reimbursed by FEMA. Um, and we have spent uh, out of pocket $1.7 billion on the COVID response that we believe is all reimbursable um, under FEMA. And you know, our, our President Biden had made the reimbursement 100%. Uh, however, the process of getting those bills paid is not simple and it is not quick. Um, we, we were the first out in terms of putting in our receipts to um, the federal government, uh, but payments has been uh, very slow. Um, so we, we continue to have uh, watch the cash flow very carefully. We believe we will get the dollars, but I think of all of our financial risks going forward, uh, that's the best. So in closing, uh, to, to you, Chair Drum, to you, Chair Rivera, to all your great council members, I just want to say thank you for maintaining a public system long before I got here, when a lot of cities did not. Um, and I, I hope very much that the, the horrible experience of COVID at least showed people how valuable your decision was in maintaining a public hospital system when other cities did not. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Katz. I really appreciate your testimony. I want to start off by um, asking you some questions about my favorite H&H &H hospital, which is Elmhurst. Obviously, I represent them, so uh, let's start with the one right there in my district. According to the CDC's website, the first and second round of payments of the Provider Relief Fund COVID-19 High Impact Grant have been issued, but Elmhurst Hospital did not receive a second round of payments. Given the role Elmhurst played in responding to the pandemic, why didn't the hospital receive a second round of payments and was H&H &H able to secure funding to make up for the lack of the funds? I'm, I'm gonna to turn to uh, John Olberg to give a more detailed answer than I can do on the dollars. John? Yes, uh, uh, good afternoon, good morning. Um, yeah, let me just explain a little bit, um, you know, leaving where, where Dr. Katz uh, kind of just explained our overall financial situation as it relates to the COVID response. You know, as he had mentioned, uh, we spent about $1.7 billion. That's our estimate, right? We'll spend $1.7 you know, billion. It could reach as high as $2 billion. And the relief that we've gotten thus far is $1.2 billion from uh, PRF, uh, Provider Relief Fund, and we're grateful for that. And we've only been able to secure uh, roughly 200, 260 million dollars from FEMA. That leaves a gap, right? And, and this gap is really what has us most concerned. We, we need to get the difference between the 1.7 you know, billion and 
uh, the roughly 1.4 billion that we have uh, received thus far. Um, the way that we treat the PRF dollars is that we aggregate that within the system and then we spend those dollars based on where we, we see the need. Um, I'll also say is that there's, there's a small amount left. I mean, small, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 billion out of the uh, total amount allocated uh, by Congress, uh, you know, to, to the provider relief fund. And we're advocating for, you know, some of those dollars to come to uh, ourselves as a safety net and other safety nets, you know, across the country. So I hope that explains, explains uh, you know, your, uh, your question. We will keep Elmer's uh, fully funded, I think, is, uh, is the punchline here, as all our hospitals. But it is true, Elmhurst was the, the center of the center of the center of the pandemic. And I will still, for the rest of my life, remember when uh, Israel Roca, the then CEO, called me up. It was about 11 o'clock at night and said, in the last two hours, we've intubated 16 people. This has never happened before. This is like something we have never seen. Um, so we, we recognize their courageousness and we will make sure they are fully funded. Thank you, Dr. Katz. You know, was, um, I was not inside the hospital, but I was outside the hospital, as I mentioned to you the other day. Um, and just to see those lines and lines of people outside Elmhurst Hospital, I mean, every single one of them did get care, thank goodness. But uh, we really were the epicenter of the epicenter there. And I see that uh, Council Member Moy is on uh, the Zoom call here as well. And, you know, our community has suffered from health disparities for a very long period of time. So I'm glad to hear that you're making that commitment to fully fund Elmhurst Hospital. Uh, and let me just ask about, should another pandemic or should something happen in the future? Are we prepared for that, especially at a place like Elmhurst? We've learned, Chair, so much about preparation um, on, a, on a level um, that you know never happened. I, you know, when COVID first started, as having been an AIDS doctor, one of my first thoughts was, "Oh, I've already lived through my first pandemic," um, and yet this was like ten times faster, harsher in terms of the number of deaths over a short time. And so, you know, sadly, it has brought us much more prepared um, now for every single hospital. We know exactly how we would expand services. We have six month caches of service of supplies. Uh, Christine has fixed it so that air handling is better in all our facilities and we can see into rooms. And we've done a, a lot of renovation and improvements. So, but, but boy, let's try to live the rest of our life chairs without seeing another pandemic. I think, I think we've done our share. Yes, uh, I lived through the AIDS one as well, and uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, just in terms of Elmhurst, again, there uh, was supposed to be an emergency room expansion, which I don't believe has started yet, and also the psychiatric unit uh, renovation, the psychiatric unit on the first floor, not on the, on the upper floor, um, with the emergency psychiatric unit. Do you know uh, where that stands in the timeline for those, um, those projects are? I'm going to ask Christine so she can give a much more detailed explanation than I could. Hi, can you hear me? Good, yes. good morning, still morning. Um, so the Elmhurst uh, ED edition, as can be expected, was absolutely impacted by the COVID pandemic. Um, and so we currently, the CONs had gone to the state prior to COVID, actually, I know uh, Chair Drum and, and many others from Queens came to that on the rooftop uh, event, and I was actually present for that, and that was a big celebratory moment. Unfortunately, we still are in the uh, back and forth from a regulatory perspective on getting the final designs fully approved before we could take that project out to bid, and that does impact the, um, the other area on the first floor as well. Uh, we also are working with our new CEO, and we will be issuing shortly a RFP for master planning for Elmhurst Hospital. This is a campus that uh, is very landlocked, and we want to ensure that uh, any additional necessary uh, modernizations that happen here, we're really thinking thoughtfully across the entire campus and making sure we know our full needs there. Critical care is a major area of expansion, our ORs. Uh, there's a lot of needs and additional love 
at all of our healthcare facilities and Elmhurst is one of them. And so, uh, so that I might've expanded my answer a bit, but um, healthcare infrastructure funding is really important for our system. Thank you. And, and, and with the ambulatory care center also? Yes, the ambulatory care center um, is in the design phase. We have a large quantity of projects in the design phase, but uh, we are working to get that into uh, the next step of procurement and construction. Do you have an idea of when the timeline is for the start of the actual putting of the shovel in the ground for the emergency room expansion? I would like to say next fiscal year, um, but I do want to caution just the back and forth of regulatory with the relocation of CPEP. We have regulatory sign-offs both from OMH as well as DOH state. So, um, you know, and we also are looking and making sure that we're uh, taking COVID into account in the design and uh, ensuring that if there's additional lessons learned from that, we're integrating that into the design. So we, we just wanna make sure that design captures the, the needs appropriately. And I just wanna say thank you. You know, I do recognize the challenge there between balancing, providing the health service at the same time, reconstructing the emergency room. But I think it was at the, um, the opening that we had or the announcement of the extra funding from Borough President Richards uh, at the beginning of the week where it was mentioned by Dr. Kessler, the, uh, the, yes. the head of the emergency department, that they had 121 stretchers, I think, in the emergency room at one time during the COVID crisis. So it really is important that we get that accomplished. I just want to stress that. I know that you probably agree with me on that. But again, Absolutely. I just wanted to bring it up for your attention. Of course, it's, a, it's in my top 10 list because of the size and importance. And I think figuring out our services as we do that project is gonna be very complex. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, let me move on to telehealth equity. How is h, &H directly working to eliminate telehealth inequity? How many languages is telehealth offering? And uh, how does h, h support people living without technology or access to internet? And what more can be done to ensure uh, the most valuable, uh, the most vulnerable are reached with telehealth. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, the best part is that we found that we can now use our system on people's smartphones. Um, so uh, the digital divide is much smaller around smartphones than it is around, you know, people having laptops and and home, you know, cable. I mean, that that we find very few of our patients have that. But smartphones, we find that almost all of them have. Um, and so we've been, we've been using that heavily. And we have a full translation service, no, no limitations. People call and it, it is all of, I think it's 140 languages um, as needed. Uh, and uh, so when someone, if, if even their smartphone does not work or they cannot handle the technology, then we do it as a regular phone call. And either way, we, we have full translation through our translation service. And can you do ALS, American Sign Language, uh, or ASL, I mean, uh, yes. uh, 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 with that as well? Because I do know uh, some deaf people actually who do avail themselves of service. And sometimes it's a little hard to schedule uh, the uh, sign language interpreters. Yeah, I, we actually find that the, I mean, obviously that requires the video. So if they do need to have a smartphone, but it, if they do, it works quite well. It appears as a box at the, uh, on the screen simultaneously. So uh, we have been able to make that technology work. Okay, thank you. Um, again, back to the, uh, the issue of psychiatrists. I understand that there is a psychiatrist shortage um, uh, has H and H included funding in the fiscal twenty two executive budget to address this psychiatrist shortage? Uh, Chair, uh, the the because there is a national uh, shortage of psychiatrists, uh, it isn't. This is not a case where our problem is necessarily that we're paying less than the competition. There just simply are not enough psychiatrists. So most of our work today is trying to figure out alternative models. Uh, we're hiring more psychiatric nurse practitioners who can prescribe. We're hiring more uh, psychologists. They cannot prescribe, but they are equally capable of diagnosing serious mental illness. We're trying to move all of 
therapy to uh, licensed social workers, psychologists, so that the psychiatrists uh, can function as needed to do our prescribing. Uh, we're working with the state to try to decrease the sheer bureaucracy of a inpatient admission and discharge, which uh, makes a lot of people not want, psychiatrists not want to do the work. So I think the major, the major changes have to be workforce related. And I do, you know, Bellevue is the center of, you know, public psychiatry in the world. And I feel like we should be the ones who are saying, look, uh, yes, ideally we would have a lot more psychiatrists, but that's not going to happen. They're, they're, not, they're not being produced. They're not going uh, into public work. Uh, many of them choose now to do therapy through telehealth um, themselves. So then we need a different model uh, because the patients still need care. Are there any incentive programs to get people to go more in that direction? To, to choose psychiatry. Yeah. Uh, we, don't, we don't have now, it, again, part of the problem is that if you think, Chair, sort of what the process is, that decision of going into psychiatry determine often at the medical school level, someone makes a decision, I'm gonna be a neurologist, I'm gonna be an ophthalmologist, I'm gonna be a psychiatrist. We, we do want to uh, and have uh, incentive programs to increase the number of unrepresented minorities among our physicians, which would include uh, psychiatrists. But I'll go back and also look and see whether people have other ideas on uh, how we might either get more people to join and decide to be psychiatrists or more people interested in public sector psychiatry. Okay, thank you, doctor. I'm gonna, I have some more questions, but I'm gonna turn it over to my co-chair, Kara Rivera, to ask questions and then I'll follow up if, uh, if when she's done or if there are other council members who have questions after they're done. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Chair Drum. And again, thank you. Good to see you, Dr. Katz. Looking forward to seeing you and a lot of your team, you know, as soon as possible in person. Um, so just get right into some questions about some federally funded new programs. You touched on this a little bit. I realize there are a lot of things that play here with the FEMA reimbursements and the money that came from the federal government. So I'm gonna ask about federally funded new programs. And I'm really excited about uh, two major new programs that, be, uh, that are being introduced at h, h the Mental Health EMS and the Public Health Corps. So with $41 million and $50 million allocated in fiscal year 2022 with mostly one-time federal funding, I wanna make sure that the programs are fully supported by h, h with responsible spending for a successful and sustainable program, of course. So the $50 million uh, Public Health Corps, that's an extension of the Test and Trace program, right, T2. Initially went, T2 initially went through h, h instead of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for the ease of contracting. However, now that this program is being extended, we would want to move away from contracted services and into directly hiring city employees. Is there any benefit to having this program housed in h, &H over DOH-MH at this point? Well, the, the T2 uh, did involve hiring a thousand people. So I, I think part of the decision uh, to go with health and hospitals was also our hiring is faster. Um, and uh, to me, of course, it's always about mission. I, I am happy to hire people and have them work under other people's supervision. I, to me, it's all about how do you get the work done, right? I have no, it doesn't matter to me. I can hire them and they can work in whatever uh, formation people think would achieve the best goal. I think the idea, and you did relate to this, uh, Chair, in your comments, um, many people need care, but for whatever complicated set of social economic reasons have challenges making it to the doctor's office, making it to the hospital office. And so then I think the question for the core, if the goal of the public health core is to reach people where they want, where they are, and bring them into care, 
do you want to connect them to the agency that provides the care, just to us, or do you want to create a what would have to be a warm handoff? And there might be reasons in both directions, but I think the idea of continuing the employed people, especially in health and hospitals, was that we would then be able to say, we want you to see your col our colleague at Sinaham. We want you to see our colleague at Harlem. We want you to see our colleague at Gouverneur and actually bring the person as an H&H &H, uh, outreach worker to the site of care. So I think that's the model we're currently working under. If I'm always open, I love working with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So I, I'm happy to, to switch the model if that's what people think, feel is best. Okay, well, and, and I appreciate that, but who's gonna be hired for the public health corps? Like what are gonna be the requirements and training and is there a path toward a professional certification or licensure to be a healthcare provider? Right, so the goal would be to first focus on those people who are currently employed by us. Um, so they're already our employees at health and hospitals. Um, and to, we would do trainings. It's a good question. I haven't thought about whether we would try to do a specific certification, um, but, but I would certainly be open to that. Um, we want people who represent the, the hardest hit communities and our hiring was focused on those communities to hit the highest percentage. We are very focused on language and cultural competency. Um, so those have been the major drivers of who, who's in the program and we would try to keep it that way. And how does this integrate with the services already provided by NYC Care? Well, so NYC Care, um, which we're very proud of, uh, it was based on the idea of coming, you know, a promise of a doctor's appointment or a nurse practitioner's appointment in two weeks for your own provider and then whatever else you need. I think what we've learned through, you know, the COVID is that there is a large group of people who for whatever reasons don't make it to the front door um, and who need a, you know, more hands-on from the community, uh, let me bring you to the front door. And so um, the idea would be that the core members would help us to increase membership in NYC care keep people coming back, keep people taking their hypertensive medicines, make sure um, they don't run out of medications, which happens all the time, even, even when you solve economic problems, just because people's lives are busy and other things are going on, I find that my own patients you know, run out of medicines. And I say, well, but they are provided free, you know, you just needed the refills are there. Sometimes people need a little bit of extra help they're so busy focused on supporting their families that they forget to, that it's important to take care of themselves. And I, and you know, I understand that. And, and I just want to go back to, right, that's why the, I thought the community based organization, the relationships there were so important. And some of the questions I asked about certification and licensure, because we do want kind of this seamless transition, whatever happens. We want to make sure people in the community are receiving these sorts of messages. The messaging is coming from people they know. And I know H&H &H was working with community-based organizations on outreach for the past year. And I want to ask, why was the vaccine outreach contract for $9 million in vaccine outreach transferred to H&H? &H? And then how is this going to impact the relationship with these community-based organizations and the public health corps? Uh, I just want to make sure we're, we have the same program. So um, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has released the new RFP um, that's via them. Uh, and, 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 uh, and just really quick, Dr. Katz, right, because the community-based organizations will have to reapply for this RFP, even though they were in the, the old program. I know you're going to make a distinction, but I just want to clarify that. Yes, but they don't have to reapply for the old money. So if they were getting money already, and I think it's 35 agencies were getting money, it's our belief, 
uh, we won't be going to our board, but we'll be asking our board to extend those contracts for all agencies that have um, satisfactory performance, which is overwhelmingly um, the agencies. Separately, those same agencies or agencies that are not part of that pot can apply for the additional $7 million being released through the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Does that make sense? So if you're, if you're, if you're receiving the amount of money that if you're already doing what you want to be doing, then assuming my board approves the continuation, they will not have to reapply. But to get additional dollars, or if they're not in that group, they will have to apply under the DOHMH RFP. I know, and I guess the, and I appreciate what you're saying. I guess the, what I'm looking for is the acknowledgement of like, is DOH the better agency for this kind of work? or is it just that DOH was the only agency eligible for this funding? And I'll ask you a question about vaccines as well, because this ties to the community-based organizations. But considering all of this planning and the public health core and the work, the incredible work that h, &H has done and DOH's role, there is only funding for fiscal year 2022. And so what is h, &H s plan for future years? And considering that the federal funding is one time, does it not make more sense to spread the funding over multiple years? I, uh, well, just on the, the last part, just if we spread over multiple years, it would have to be smaller. And so my hope is that there will be other sources of reimbursement for these kinds of services, but the world has learned, as you said in your opening comments, how important primary care is to preventing disease. Um, but I, I don't yet have a I don't yet have a source to tell you it is going in the future. But I, I do, and I think you would agree with me. The need is now, so I do want to I do want to address the need, um, and then try to work creatively uh, to you know continue. I, as as I said before, to me, you know whether something comes out of DOHMH or something comes out of us. It should be come out of wherever it can be done more expeditiously. Um, I, it, I don't have any you know, ownership or need for ownership. Uh, I just want to see the services delivered rapidly in a culturally competent way. Um, we love working with the community-based organizations. I think that that particular RFP, uh, many of those relationships are longstanding with DOHMH. And so it was felt that was the best place to do that RFP. Uh, again, uh, you know, I think whatever the tensions that existed before, at least at the department level, do not exist currently. Um, uh, Dave Chotsky and I talk almost every day. Um, we figure out with each issue how to get it best done. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't believe there is tension any longer. No, and, then, and that's great. And I want, of course, I want us all to be working together. And, and the, why I, I think I've been ringing the bell for probably a year at this point about the community-based organizations is because of people's hesitancy even today. You know, pre-pandemic, it was, it was primary care and getting people to have primary care physicians. But now there's a little bit of vaccine hesitancy. And there are many, many reasons. And so I just did a, a pop-up vaccine in the Murray Hill neighborhood. And, and granted, we have a wonderful hospital row, but I think sometimes going into a hospital can be a little bit overwhelming. And so having you know pop-up sites that people can go to, I think have been incredibly helpful and, and a little bit more welcoming than kind of that, that standard entrance into a hospital. So, so I wanna ask about vaccine incentives because I was expecting more people to get vaccinations at this site. And though there are many, many reasons, I do know that some of the issues, you know, I don't know if it's, maybe it's vaccine incentives and the state just announced this scratch off incentive at state sites and city sites do have various incentives. We all saw the, you know, the burger and fries press conference. That was, that was cute. But uh, has there been any discussion at all around providing money to people who get vaccinated, who do not have paid time off. I do feel that there are many people who hesitate because they worry about taking off work. 
I think uh, the incentive is probably a no-brainer at this point. It aligns with T2 supporting people who need to isolate because of COVID, who don't have paid time off. And I know there's been um, a suggestion that offering about $200 to people who are low-wage workers and who worry about taking time off, it would allow them to get the vaccine. And why I bring up money is because we do have incentives at some places, yet none kind of directly address the inequities that cause barriers to getting people vaccinated and someone who doesn't have paid time off likely will not benefit from what's a low chance of maybe winning like Knicks playoff tickets. Right. So, you know, I, I was wondering um, if you could just address kind of what's the next step in reaching our next milestone for vaccinations. Well, well, thank you, Darren. I think you, you hit a lot of the high points. Um, I just want to say, because I, I sit in an exam room at Gouvenier, that there are people who continue to fear the vaccine, um, who even coming, even they're my patients, I say to them, I really want you to get vaccine. And they say, not now, not ready, not, not trusting. Um, those people, they have a, we need to keep working on them from an emotional, psychological, cultural point of view. But then I agree with you and I like your solution. Uh, you know, there's been some concern about financial incentives only on the side that no one wanted to be seen as uh, putting undue influence on someone to get something that they didn't want. But I love your idea. I don't see uh, providing essentially a sick day, which is city employees we get uh, paid time off. I don't see that anybody would consider that a undue incentive to get vaccinated. They're just getting the same thing that you or I are entitled to get. Um, so I would 100% uh, support that and I will, I will bring that back to the group. Uh, I think I'll, everybody with the lotteries is trying to figure out, you know, what does move people? And it's not going to be one thing. It's going to depend upon, you know, which is the reason that they are, you know, not wanting to be vaccinated at that moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I know we're getting near kind of the time. So just two more quick questions. I wanted to follow up on Chair Drum's comment about psychiatrists. Um, I know uh, we all know there's a psychiatrist shortage and we're hearing that Gotham clinics aren't really being able, aren't really being provided funding to address mental health worker attrition. And can you just confirm that Gotham clinics will be providing funding to address these attrition issues if they have identified potential hires? Yes, I, I have no holds on hiring. Um, all, all clinicians, well, I should be. I have no holds on clinician hiring. All clinician positions are open. Doctors, nurses, mental health professionals of every kind, we will hire every, every good uh, mental health clinician we can find. And okay. we are actively recruiting and actively hiring. Okay, and so I just wanna put a, uh, you know, I visited Jacoby Hospital with Councilmember Riley, and they were in desperate need of a child psychiatrist. If not, they said a psychologist. I know I've brought this up because they do have young people, seven and eight years old, suicidal ideation, and they just don't have the resources to address that very serious issue. So if I could just put that plug in for the Bronx. And then just my last question, since we talked a little bit about headcount and hiring, how has the pandemic affected registered nurse retention at H&H? &H. And can a list of staff by title be provided for each facility? So we'd be happy to uh, provide that. And I'll ask our you know, very good uh, uh, chief nursing executive, Natalia Sineas, to, to provide that uh, for each facility. I think so far, we're good. Uh, I think a lot of us have fear that when the pandemic is really over, we will have a lot of retirements. Um, I think there are a lot of people who keep coming to work because they know how important it is um, and that we've needed every, every nurse that we can hire. I do worry that you know, when we enter the next phase, if we're lucky enough to enter the next phase, and, um, we have, you know, very few uh, patients 
um, who have COVID, we've been um, hovering uh, around uh, uh, 40 patients uh, in the ICUs. Um, we actually had our first hospital have no COVID patients in the ICU this week, Metropolitan. Um, we've had about 140 COVID patients still in the hospital. Um, but of course, when, when, given that we once had 3,700, you know, it's, it's, quite, it's quite small, but I do worry, you know, people, the nurses have been amazing heroes and sheroes through this. And I do worry that there will be retirements when, it's, when people feel like, okay, I did my pandemic thing. You know, I, I, I came in, I stood up and now I'm entitled to a rest. And, um, you know, I would say uh, you've had a pretty intense uh, four years yourself. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, and I'm glad to hear you also mentioned the hiring of clinicians. I know at the Roberto Clemente uh, Mental Health Center in my district, I just want to mention that they want to hire social workers to help with some of the mental health services that they're providing but they said they've experienced some challenges in that hiring process. So I'd love it if we could follow okay. up on that to make sure that they have what they need because it's such an important uh, institution. And I um, wanted to thank you, of course, you know, being as we reflect over the past four years for everything you've done and how you've worked to turn around H and H and for all of your staff and every staff at every hospital. I just want to thank you. I'm going to turn it back to the chair to see if there are any questions from my colleagues. And again, Dr. Katz, thank you. And, and everyone that's here from, from your team. Thank just you. Marty, John, everyone, thank you. If any council members have questions for H&H, &H, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you'll be added to the queue. Council members. Please keep your questions for five minutes, including answers. Please wait for the sergeant at arms to tell you when your time begins. The sergeant will then let you know when your time is up. We will now hear from Councilmember Dharma Diaz, followed by Councilmember Books Prowers. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity. It's not a question, it's more a token of gratitude. During my COVID experience, I chose to isolate through the program established by HHC, the customer care, it was, it was amazing. And one of my weakest points to have people from the, entering into the hotel, to the teleconferences, to the follow-ups, I was extremely impressed that you were able to find individuals that showed compassion. And so just thank you. My, it, it allowed for my mental health to remain positive. I'm glad that I had chosen to isolate as if I ever, was um, pre-tested positive, I, I wanted that to be my experience to isolate for fear of exposing my family. So again, just thank you for that opportunity to have been able to isolate and walk away, proud to be a part of New York City and knowing that when many systems don't work, this one did work. Thank you. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that experience. Thank you for protecting our community by isolating yourself and giving me a minute to say we ran five hotels, we walked people's dogs, we picked up people's medications, we ordered uh, all kinds of foods for people, um, we did whatever, we arranged transportation door to door, yes. whatever was necessary. So thank you for highlighting that. You're very welcome. No sweat. We are now here from Councilmember Brooks Powers. I'm Sash now. Um, good afternoon, and thank you so much for taking the time um, to speak today. Um, I would like to first say thank you to your staff who has been very responsive um, since I have assumed um, the city council position for the 31st district representing parts of Southeast Queens and the Rockaways. Um, I do have some areas um, of concern, some of which are already being addressed in terms of the access to vaccinations. Um, coming into the seat, we did not have any permanent sites, which we now have 
three permanent sites in the Rockaway. So I do want to acknowledge and thank you for ensuring that we were able to receive those um, sites. I also urge uh, us moving quickly in terms of the other side of my district in Southeast Queens to establish um, permanent facilities there as well, considering that we still um, fall on the lower end of vaccinated residents. Um, also, I've received questions in the community in terms of um, job opportunities. And I know you spoke about like clinician positions, but even in terms of like the testing sites and, um, and the, the vaccine locations, we have, for example, one of the earlier ones was a testing site in Edgemere, which is now turned over into a vaccine site. And um, the community would love to see locals hired for those positions, um, creating that um, opportunity as well. I did like that. And I'm eager in understanding um, health and hospitals um, plan to be more aggressive uh, in the community's hardest hit in terms of what that access looks like. And then the final um, piece I like to just highlight um, in terms of the pop-up locations, the incentives, um, if we can look and get creative with what incentives can be offered to some of these organizations who are struggling and doing their part to open up their facilities to have these pop-ups, for example, there is no one that will come behind and kind of clean up what is left behind um, or even any type of financial um, incentive for this. And so I'm just sharing some of the concerns that I've heard more locally. Um, I'm not sure if that translates in, to other districts, but I did want to highlight that. But I will also um, close with saying thank you once again to your staff because they have been very responsive and very supportive um, of the needs. So thank you so much for this time. Thank you. And I wrote down all those issues and I will work on them. Socioeconomic status is the best predictor of health. And so hiring locally is a way of providing health. Um, so I'm very focused ourselves on hiring people, getting them good jobs, that will bring greater health. Um, so I thank you for your comments and I, I have notes and we'll work on those issues. We will now hear from Council Member Moya. I'm sorry, no. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Katz. Uh, always good to see you. Um, I just would like to reiterate the points that uh, Council Member Drum made about Elmhurst Hospital. You know how much we care about uh, Elmhurst and we just hope that equity uh, stays the same as we go forward in its funding. Um, my question, Dr. Katz, is, you know, you, you've mentioned more about the, the, the testing vans and the vaccination vans. H&H, uh, &H, when the H&H &H vans go out, it's great service. Uh, no complaints, nothing like that. But it's the contracting that is done with the vendors uh, and I might have mentioned this one of the times that we saw each other, is really the problem. Um, so in communities like Corona, the epicenter of where this pandemic happened, when we wouldn't get an H&H &H van and we'd get the vendor vans to come out, uh, there was no signage. Uh, folks there uh, were not bilingual. Uh, we had to have staff out there talking to folks. The lines were, were really long. How do we go about vetting these vendors and like what is the criteria uh, to select them? So if we're going to have more vans uh, out there, if there is going to be contracting with other vendors that are not H&H &H, uh, vans or H&H &H staff out there themselves, what is the criteria? Who is tracking that? Because uh, it's super important that if we're going to send uh, these vans out into the uh, communities that are most impacted by it, uh, communities of color, uh, immigrant communities, that there's the appropriate staffing and that there is somewhere where we can actually uh, talk to folks uh, if we see problems like this uh, continue to arise uh, when these vans are out in our district. Well, thank you, council member. And again, I wanna thank you and uh, Chair Drum for coming um, this week to celebrate the, the gifts to 
uh, Elmhurst and for being such great uh, supporters of Helen Ortega as the new CEO. She's doing a, a phenomenal job and, and we, we couldn't be happier to have we her. We love Helen. <laughs> yeah, Helen is a very special person. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm a public sector guy, of course. I believe in, you know, well-paid well union jobs for people from the community. And so, you know, I try to do things as much as I can through um, the public sector. Sometimes expansions have to happen rapidly and we, we have to rely on vendors. And uh, certainly that was the case in some of the T2. And unlike uh, long-standing arrangements that we've had with uh, CBOs where we know them very well and we know where they're capable. Uh, I admit it was, you know, hit and miss. Uh, we had some great vendors who, you know, really did well and we had some who did not do so well. And I, you know, feel it's what, what is then our responsibility helped by people like you who give us honest, direct feedback, which I always encourage. I never mind hearing negative things because that's how you fix things. You can't fix things unless you know that there's a problem and can acknowledge it. Um, so we will, uh, I mean, I think we'll have fewer and fewer vendors. And I, I know that Dr. Long talked with the vendors about their uh, language inadequacies. Um, there were some things they, they did not know of at that time and will continue to improve performance. But thank you very much for raising the issue. We will now hear from Councilmember Rosenthal. Thanks, Dr. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And great to see you, Doctor. Um, I heard Councilmember Moya raise this point about contract uh, vendors. And I just want to double down on that. Um, I'm impressed that he even knew that uh, the, the vendor was there at all, that the truck was there. I got no notification. Um, and was walking by and noticed it and talked to the person who was giving out shots. And he said, yeah, he was, <laughs> he actually knew the Upper West Side and he too didn't understand why they located the truck. Um, they shouldn't have put it where they put it. There were um, much- Council member, we cannot hear you. Councilmember Rosenthal, we can't hear you. Councilmember Rosenthal? Councilmember Rosenthal? Did you lose me? I'm sorry. Yes. Can you hear me now? You can hear you now. Apologies. Um, I, I don't know how much you missed, but basically doubling down on what Councilmember Moya said. I was not notified, and the location it went into really just made no sense. Um, there were, you know, if you're going to come to the Upper West Side, which we love, uh, you know, there are places that really need um, vaccines. And I, I think my office could have been helpful in letting somebody know the location. So, uh, got it. I what's the coordination, I guess, or? Yes, we, we will do better, Council Member. Thank you for raising it. I mean, going forward, uh, I mean, the guy said that it was a contract agency working for H&H. &H. Can I expect another van coming out? And do you think it would be possible for them to contact my office? Because I have some ideas where we really do need them. We will do that. We'll contact your office today. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, the uh, reason I bring it up and the reason it's important, and I doubled down on it, to Councilmember Moya's point, we're spending money on these contract vendors. And I don't care if it's reimbursed by FEMA or not, these are limited tax dollars. Agreed. And if each of us, if these two council members have had this experience, how many more? You know, you can't say you have 20 vans out there and be proud of it if 19 of them are in the wrong location and not vaccinating any of them, or even if two of them are in the wrong location and not vaccinating anyone. And this truck was there for two weeks. Um, 
Understood. So I think it's sort of a, a whole cloth review of, I, and I'm sure you have someone dedicated to this. So just sort of asking your team, I, I mean, sure, come back to me and fix it for my district. But I think you, it's a systemic, I would say, and the only reason I spoke again, because council member Moya brought it up, is that if he's seeing it, if I'm seeing it, that counts as systemic. Understood, thank you. Appreciate your time. Okay, I would like to announce that we were joined by uh, several other council members. Hold on a moment. Um, they are or were Council Member Gibson, Ayala, Levine, Reynoso, Rosenthal, Majority Leader Kumbo, Minority Leader Matteo. Uh, okay, and I just want to see if uh, Council Member and Chair Rivera has any additional questions before we close out. No, I just want to say uh, thanks again to everyone. Um, as for the mobile vans, you know, I would love to see a mobile vaccination van on Avenue D in my district, right beside thousands and thousands of NYCHA families. Um, love to work with you on that. Uh, and just to thank you for everything thus far, I'm looking forward to um, a continued partnership. And thank you to Chair Drum for being an incredible leader. <laughs> thank you. You know, I, I, doctor, I forgot, I do have one last question and it's really important to me and I think probably to you as well, which is transgender healthcare trainings and data collection. So can you provide an update on the current funding amount, the number of personnel, uh, the program activities and the program outcomes for the transgender healthcare training that was baselined in 2020 in the executive plan? Uh, let me ask John if he has that number. If not, we will get it, but let me reiterate, I mean, the we see this as a, as a key issue for us. It's part of our affirming uh, all populations. And we want to make sure that our services are culturally appropriate for people who are transitioning. John, can you provide the numbers today or will we get them to the chair? Yeah, we will get them to the chair. I know this is an area that we keep trying to uh, expand with the resources that we have, but we will get you a full accounting of the numbers. Okay, and Dr. Cass, I believe you only have three outreach workers there. I uh, would love to see five because we have five boroughs. And I think that the other three are assigned to a borough each. And as Debbie Rose constantly reminds me, Staten Island is a borough too. Uh, so I uh, would love to see outreach there. Uh, and can you maybe just uh, um, include who those folks are when you get me the information about the, um, about the transgender healthcare program? And finally, let me just bring up this issue to you. Uh, does H and H collect data on sexual orientation and gender identity for each person who interacts with H and H service? Yes, it is. It is part of our uh, epic uh, rollout is that we collect that information. And how is that done? That's done like on um, uh, somebody voluntarily offers that information, or is somebody given a slip? I know that when I went to um, a private hospital. Uh, in Eastern, in Western Nassau, for example, um, uh, they actually handed me a form and you just checked off voluntarily and then they translated or they put it into the computer. How, how is that done at h and It's done in more than one way. If the person registers through my card, which is what we encourage, uh -huh. that they would put it in themselves, which I think is the best system. Um, but if they are coming in person, uh, then they would put it on a piece of paper or tell the person. And of course, we, you know, it is voluntary. We don't make anybody, mm -hmm. but we encourage and, and hopefully create the kind of warm environment that people know we welcome uh, everyone. I just think having that question indicates to LGBTQ people that in fact, you're open to that and that you're, it is a warm and welcoming environment. I do see the posters that you have around the hospitals as well want to encourage that more, you know, that you um, keep them up and that really, when I walk into H&H &H and see that, it makes me very proud to see that, um, you know, H&H um, &H is doing that type of outreach. So I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that you're doing this. It's, it's um, really vitally important. I mean, for me, um, having a doctor know that I'm gay 
is important because I think he can better address my healthcare situation knowing that than if he didn't know that. And, and rather than me having me, the initiative to always continue to come out, if it's right there on the form and the doctor can see it or whatever, um, I think it's much better and much easier. Totally agree. Thank you. And I think Chair Rivera has a, a final wrap up. You can't yes, let you go, Dr. Katz, you see? Well, not yet, sorry. Cause you know, in the beginning of my questions I mentioned these two initiatives and I just wanna ask you about the mental health EMS. So the mental health EMS program, which will employ EMS workers and social workers to, cor to correspond to to co-respond to nonviolent mental health crises through 911 calls is budgeted at $90 million for fiscal year 2022, 41 million of which will be allocated to H and H. And this program too only has one year of funding and requires the hiring of hundreds of new employees within the fiscal year. So why is H and H the best agency to hire these social workers, which we also desperately need? And what funding will be used to sustain these hires over future fiscal years? Well, I'm going to let John do the financial part, uh, but uh, the from programmatic point of view, I thought it did make sense for us to do it because we're running all the psychiatric emergency rooms in the city, um, including there are no private. Uh, psychiatric emergency rooms, they're all public. And so I felt that by us doing it, we stand the best chance of being able to know the patient. So we may know them before we actually meet them uh, through the system because they may have experienced care, which would give us a, a heads up on whether this represents a worsening of their condition or this is a new, a new break for them. Um, and the feeling that, you know, we have most of the active clinicians, both the child and adult. So that, that's why it's here. John, can you, do you have the, the financial information? Yes, I, I think, you know, while we're grateful, right, for, for the funding, right, and it allows us to, you know, experiment with new models of care. I think one of the things that we've learned throughout COVID is, you know, different ways to meet the patient. Um, and we talked a lot about that, you know, during the course of this conversation, including, you know, 65% of our uh, patients are now enrolled in my chart. I, I guess it's a long way of saying that we have to get the dollars to match where we're meeting the patient to provide care. So this will be something that if, you know, successful, right, we will have to find the financing to make it work. And there's, there's ways to do that. There's obviously creative, you know, waivers that we can ask the federal government for. Uh, you know, there's subcapitation payments and working with insurance companies, but that's my job, right? I, I got to find ways to make models of care that work. Uh, I got to find money for them. So we will we will start working on that now. Certainly, hope. Um, I'm not sure if H and H is expecting any more federal funds to come in, but um, I, I appreciate all that you're doing, and I know that you know mental health outreach has, has been so incredibly important, especially the past year and more. Where people haven't had the same access to services and programs. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for uh, indulging me in that last question. And thank you again to H&H &H, uh, for doing the best work that you can given the circumstances. Thank, thank you. you very much. And thank you again, Dr. Katz, and to everyone on the H&H &H team. We really appreciate you coming in. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you again. OK, now this will uh, conclude this portion of today's hearing. Thank you, H&H, &H, for being here. We will now move on to the City University of New York. I ask my colleagues who will be joining us for the CUNY portion of the hearing to remain in this Zoom with the microphone muted, and we'll be ready to start momentarily. Good morning, Chair Barron. Can I get an audio check? Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, actually it's good afternoon, sorry about that. Oh, thank you, I'm glad you got invited to that. Yes, thank you. All right, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. All right, whenever you're ready to go, uh, just let us know. Two minutes, One, 10 seconds. Okay, you got it. Okay, I'm ready. 
Okay, great. Good to see Hi, you. Hi, Danny. Sarah. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Good to You're see you. You're doing a great job. Thank you very much. And so are you. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is our first hearing together, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, didn't we do it last year? I'm not sure. I think we did. <laughs> okay, good. All right, good. Okay. It should have been. All right. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the City Council's eighth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 22. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We previously heard from H&H &H, and now we'll hear from the City University of New York. We are joined by uh, the Committee on Higher Education, chaired by my esteemed colleague, Councilmember Inez Barron. Let me introduce who's here with us today. Uh, we are joined by Councilmember Adams, Amphrey Samuel, Ayala, Brooks Powers, Dharma Diaz, Gibson, uh, Gradenchik, Koslowitz, Lewis, Maisel, Moyer, Rosenthal, and Minority Leader, Matteo. Uh, in the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but I would like to turn it over to Chair Barron for her statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, I'm Inez Barron. I'm the Chair of the Committee on Higher Education. And I would like to welcome you all to our virtual hearing on the fiscal 2022 executive budget, including the fiscal 2021 through 2025 executive capital commitment plan and the 10 year capital strategy for the City University of New York CUNY. We are joined by Felix Matos Rodriguez, CUNY's chancellor, Matthew Sapienza, CUNY's senior vice chancellor and chief financial officer, Hector Batista, Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer, and Jose Luis Cruz, Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost. Thank you for joining us today. I do want to make mention that on this past Wednesday, May the 19th, we celebrated the birthday of El Haj Malik El Shabazz, who was referred to as our Shining Prince. It's been my honor to serve as chair of this committee since fiscal 2015. In those 12 and now 13 separate budget hearings, I have made clear just how important it is for faculty and upper management diversity, tuition costs and those impacts on affordability and accessibility for students and childcare supports and increases in the base aid from the state. Today, as I join you for my final budget hearing as chair of the committee, I'm re-emphasizing my position in all of these areas and more. I just wanna talk briefly about this painful pandemic that has spotlighted and magnified the grave inequities in our communities in social and economic arenas. In black and brown and low income communities, there are pre-existing conditions of being marginalized, being obscured, being patronized, being under-resourced, and being underfunded. These historic systemic practices, in addition to the racially weighted response given by the state and local governments, exacerbated the negative impact and results of this pandemic. We've heard the expression, we're all in this together, which implies some kind of sameness in weathering this storm. But we're in different boats. Some are only in rafts and some only have life preservers. But in this storm, many of those with responsibility and the ability to implement changes and take bold actions to ameliorate these injustices had the opportunity to address the inequity and many of them did so. Unfortunately, the president of Hunter College who has sole authority to determine the admission criteria for Hunter College High School decided to continue the policy that has resulted in only 2% of that student population of black students. Continue that policy, which has limited the number of black students, although we've had years of protests and concern from students and alum that there's a gross inequity. And if we believe that black and brown students are equally qualified academically, we must be using a tool that is limiting and denying them the opportunity to come. We're very upset about that, and we will address that further. 
I also will need additional clarity from CUNY on the accounting of all of the federal stimulus aid it has received and will be receiving to offset revenue losses, cuts from the city and how remaining funds can be used towards investment in student services, especially in the areas of mental health and student advisement supports. I need to know if the Office of Management and Budget is working with CUNY to ensure there is sufficient funding in CUNY's budget to attract, retain, and hire adequate staff and teachers currently. These issues are all very critical to manage right now and we need to ensure taxpayer dollars are being applied efficiently and best determine how and where stimulus aid can and should be applied into the CUNY system. As the city gets ready to open up and CUNY prepares to return to a portion of in-person services this fall, questions arise like, will there be enrollment spikes as students feel safe again and are inspired to re-engage in their educations? Will CUNY raise tuition costs on its students this coming year or next? Will agency partnerships support CUNY as CUNY has historically worked to train and teach so many of our city's employees? And is the city and CUNY taking its rightful position to ease the current economic and social pains for its students? And in preparation for the mayor and OMB thoughtfully considered what is a fully funded CUNY would mean as a booming engine of recovery for so many city residents and students. And lastly, I want to hear from CUNY what its budget requests and priorities are for fiscal 2022. So this afternoon, I will ask CUNY a series of questions to attain greater clarity for this body to perform the task ahead of us as we work towards adopting the fiscal 2022 budget. Everyone knows the task of a, ahead of us, so let's be productive and engaged hearing as we do what's required to support our city's current and future students at CUNY. CUNY's fiscal 2022 executive budget of $1.2 billion adds funding to support new needs and four new initiatives and introduces interest city transfers, typical during the mid-year, with one substantial tuition revenue adjustment in fiscal 2021, primarily due to under-enrollment this past year. I also look forward to learning more about how the university is wrapping up projects this fiscal year and next within CUNY's two, 603.3 million capital commitment plan. Before we begin, I would like to take this moment to thank my staff, particularly William Clay, my chief of staff, M. Indigo Washington, my director of legislation and CUNY liaison, Michelle Peregrine, the finance analyst to the committee, Isha Wright, the unit head, Amy, Br Amy Briggs, counsel to the committee, Chloe Rivera, senior policy analyst to the committee, and Frank Perez, the committee's community engagement liaison. I also want to thank all of my district office staff and all of those who have worked diligently with me preparing my, during my tenure at the council. I want to give special thanks to my fellow members of the BLAC, the members of this committee, our speaker, Corey Johnson for his leadership, and of course, Chair Danny Drum, my esteemed colleague, not just here in government, but from teaching as well, who works tirelessly during all of these executive budget hearings to inform the body as well as to work to pass the budget. And big thank yous to Latanya McKinney, the Director of the Finance Division, Regina Pudreda Ryan, and Nathan Toth, the Division's deputies, and the rest of the Council Finance for all the hard work and dedication to this process. And I also wanna thank those persons behind the scenes for all of the technical assistance that you give. And of course, I wanna thank my family, my husband, Charles Barron, for all of the love and support day in and day out. I have been blessed in so many ways with life's riches, and I'm grateful for this important work that I get to participate in for the good of this dynamic city. Chair Drum, I turn the hearing back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Barron. And I really appreciate your very kind words uh, and your closing there. Um, yes, we are very privileged and we are very lucky in our lives. I feel the same way, very blessed that uh, we've been afforded this opportunity, and especially that I've been afforded the opportunity to work with you over the last eight years in the city council. 
Thank uh, you. I look up to you and admire your enthusiasm and your advocacy very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair Barron. And uh, bienvenido um, to my friend, uh, former Queens president, uh, Queens College president, Felix Matos Rodriguez, now the CUNY Chancellor. Uh, we welcome you and I'm very happy to see you again. Uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing your testimony. I'm going to ask our council to swear you in. And uh, after that, we'll do a testimony and then we have some questions for you. Thank you, Chair. My name is Stephanie Ruiz and I'm Council to New York City's Council's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that it could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. During the hearing, if council members have, would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on to speak. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I'm now minister of the affirmation. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Chancellor Rodriguez? Yes, I do. Thank you. Mr. Jose Luis Cruz? Yes, I do. Thank you. Mr. Hector Patista? Yes, I do. Thank you. And Mr. Matthew Sapienza? I do. Thank you. Chancellor, you may begin when ready. Thank you and, and um, good afternoon and buenas tardes and to chairs uh, uh, Drum and, and Baron and, and uh, teachers Drum and Baron, uh, thank you for your leadership and your support. Uh, and to the members of the New York City Council Committees on Finance and Higher Education, um, many, many friends in those committees and many, many supporters of the City University of New York, uh, to staff and the guests. Uh, I am Felix Matos Rodriguez, a chancellor for the City University of New York. I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by the Executive Vice Chancellor, University Provost of St. Louis Cruz, our Chief Operating Officer, uh, Hector Batista, and our Chief Financial Officer, Matthew Sapienza. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. I am proud to be able to share today how the City University of New York stood strong against a relentless pandemic and outline our priorities, plans, and goals for the coming fiscal year and beyond, and answer any questions that you might have. I am extremely honored and humbled to oversee the premier and largest urban university in the United States, serving half a million students, 9,000 faculty, 21,300 staff at our 11 four-year colleges, seven community colleges, and seven graduate and professional schools. On behalf of the entire CUNY community, I want to thank the New York City Council for your past and sustained support, which has enabled CUNY to deliver strong results for our students and the citizens of New York City. 2020 was a year that both demanded and inspired great fortitude and resourcefulness from our students, faculty, staff, and leaders. The coronavirus forced CUNY to all but shut down its 25 campuses in March of 2020 and quickly pivot to distance education. When classes resume after a week-long week academic recess, 95% of the university's 50,000 course sections had transitioned to online instruction. We quickly realized that thousands of students lacked the tools to participate in distance learning. In response, we purchased 33,000 laptops and tablets and made sure that they were safely distributed to students in need, and later provided 4,000 personal hotspots for those students who require Wi Fi access. It was just one part of our broad efforts during the year to help the students weather the academic, economic, and emotional challenges they faced. Our efforts to support students certainly did not stop there. Early in the COVID-19 crisis, we established the Chancellor's Emergency Relief Fund with $1 million each from the Carol and Milton Petrie Foundation and the James and Judy K. Diamond Foundations. By default, 
support from additional donors grew the fund to more than 10 million and allows to distribute emergency grants to more than 12,000 students. Individual colleges and schools on their own raised more than 8.6 million, enabling them to ensure to help 1,000 students more for a total of nearly 17 million in emergency relief funds uh, in private philanthropy collected across the university. We were also among the first systems in the nation to begin awarding student emergency grants that were funded by the Federal CARES Act. We have now fully disbursed our Federal CARES Act student emergency grant allocation with almost 161,000 students receiving awards averaging $736 per student. Earlier this month, we began distributing the second part of 180 million in federal emergency grants, part of the pandemic relief package, package passed by Congress last December and made available to the nation's educational institutions in the spring. The second round of the federal relief funds called the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act, which we call CRISA for short, provides grants averaging about $750 to help students meet educational and living expenses during the pandemic. More than half of CUNY's 270,000 degree seeking students qualify for the CRISA emergency grants with the average amounts ranging from $600 to $1,100, depending on the student's financial need and factors including full-time or part-time enrollment status and where they support dependent children. I am pleased to report that we have already dispersed almost 114 million of the second federal allocation and over 151,000 CUNY students have received awards in the recent weeks. As part of our CRISA allocation strategy, we require CUNY colleges to reserve 5% of the funds for future discretionary awards to students, including the possibility that the federal government may, may allow them to be dispersed to international students, dreamers, and other undocumented students for the first time, because that did not happen during the CARES Act. We were therefore thrilled with the decision announced last week by the Federal Department of Education to reverse the previous administration's policy of barring undocumented students from receiving federal pandemic relief. This important decision corrects a grave inequity in the distribution of funds that started with the last spring's CARES Act. The new policy would allow colleges and universities to distribute federal pandemic relief to enroll students who need financial help, regardless of their immigration status. We are now working to release these grants to DREAMers and other undocumented and international students. These thousands of students would also be eligible to receive emergency grants from the American Rescue Plan package signed by President Biden last March. We are also working on our campus budget allocations for fiscal year 2022 which will include the institutional funds from CRISA as well as the resources becoming available now from the American Rescue Plan. CUNY joined the city's battle against the coronavirus on many fronts. Campuses used 3D printers to produce PPE equipment. Experts at the School of Public Health and Health Policy produced a weekly tracking survey of New Yorkers' attitudes and behaviors towards the pandemic. CUNY scientists repurposed their work to take on coronavirus-related research. One project that gained national attention devised a process for monitoring the level of coronavirus in the city's wastewater to help identify new outbreaks before testing did and guide health officials' responses. The long-awaited coronavirus vaccine became available for public distribution in December. And we're extremely proud that it was a CUNY nursing alumni, Sandra Lindsay, who was the first person in the US to receive the vaccine. Once vaccines became available, CUNY once again proves 
its importance to the fa fabric of our city as, this, as the university has made five of our campuses available to serve as vaccine centers. About half a million New Yorkers have been vaccinated at either Medgar Evers College, York College, City College, Lehman College, or Queensboro Community College. And more than 2,000 CUNY students were activated to help at vaccine centers across the city as these impressive future leaders rallied to help their fellow New Yorkers even as they face unthinkable pressures and laws. Our amazing students continue to make our university and our city proud. Just last week, we learned that three CUNY Community College students were named as recipients of the highly selective Jan K. Cook Foundation Undergraduate Transfer Scholarship, honoring the nation's top community college students. CUNY Community College students also figure prominently in the Capital Education Foundation's most recent awards. At the same time, we're in the midst of a major transition in leadership that began with my appointment as chancellor two years ago this May. I have continued to assemble a cabinet and college presidents of unprecedented diversity who reflect the city we live in and the students we serve. The Board of Trustees has appointed 10 new presidents during my tenure, including our most recent appointment of Dr. Patricia Ramsey as president of Medgar Evers College, the first woman ever to serve in that role at Medgar. The, the appointments also include the first two Asian Americans ever to serve as CUNY college presidents, four women and four African Americans. Looking ahead to life after COVID, we redouble our efforts to help our students succeed, graduate on time, and find sustainable career path that would also help drive the state and the city's economic recovery. Among the most important developments were a plan to expand mental health services on our campuses and a new partnership, the New York Job CEO Council, which is working with the CEOs from 28 of the largest employers in the New York area to create a pipeline to job opportunities for 25,000 CUNY students. Additionally, CUNY is working with the Department of Youth and Community Development and the Center for Youth Employment to launch the CUNY Recovery Corps, a partnership to offer 5,000 CUNY students from targeted low-income and vulnerable populations the opportunity to participate in the Summer Youth Employment Program. Employment and job sites will be focused on helping with recovery efforts in the education, healthcare, community, nonprofit, and small business areas. CUNY launched its newest set of offerings for the CUNY Upskill Challenge that began one year ago to help students, alumni, and New Yorkers with free opportunities to train in areas that are highly demanded by employers. In addition to over 30 curated offerings, from partners like Microsoft, Google, General Assembly, and Salesforce, we added CUNY courses to the mix through scholarships funded by General's grant, grant by the Bank of New York Mellon Foundation. We are offering over 1,300 scholarships for training at nine colleges, and we'll be introducing 26 more training offerings this summer. We have funding through the U.S. Department of Education and we'll be introducing new courses and programs through the year as the economy picks up and employment prospects improve. Finally, we are, free, we are pleased to offer the Internship to Employment Program this summer in partnership with several small businesses in, in intermediaries through the Brooklyn Navy Yard and the Grand Central Tech to give recent CUNY graduates paid internships with at least half of the positions converting into full-time pay, professional positions in technology, marketing, and engineering roles. This is an important program for small business recovery, and we hope to scale it over the next year. Today, 100 students have taken part of this program. The fall 2021 semester is closely upon us. The well being of every member of the university community continues to govern our decision making in every respect. Rigorous reopening guidelines created by the central office and each CUNY campus last summer are being updated in consultation with university stakeholders, 
faculty, students, unions uh, for the fall of 2021. Earlier this month, Governor Cuomo announced that COVID-19 vaccinations would be required for all students attending in-person classes beginning this fall. With this in mind, I continue to strongly encourage every member of the CUNY family to get vaccinated. My office has made the careful decision to mark the week of August 2nd as the day for staff to return to the workplaces in preparation for a more in-person fall. Faculty will follow in accordance with the academic calendar of their campuses. The return to in-person work will be guided by the university safety first approach which includes a blended scheduling system combining remote and in-person arrangements. Let me turn now to the mayor's executive budget proposal. While we are grateful for the funding of our mandatory cost increases, the budget also includes a 77 million efficiencies target in fiscal year 2022. A component of this efficiencies target included a 10 million reduction to the incredibly successful ASAP program, which has more than double community college graduation rates and is being replicated in several other states. We are pleased that the mayor's office has committed to rescind this cut to ASAP as part of the fiscal 22 adopted budget. With this adjustment, CUNY is left with a 67 million reduction, which is 25, 21 million higher than what the city removed from our current, from the current year budget. If this reduction were enacted, CUNY's community colleges were experienced a 12% cut, a 12% cut in city support since the pandemic began. We also had to absorb a one-time 20 million reduction in the last quarter of fiscal 2020 when the coronavirus first began to negatively impact the city's finances. A reduction of this size will severely limit our community college's ability to provide the core sections and other vital supports that our students rely on in pursuit of their degrees. We also seek the council's help in restoring 1.7 million that was provided for remediation in the current fiscal year, 1 million for the food insecurity initiative, 500,010 uh, for our community college child care centers and 2.3 million for various centers and institutes in the fiscal 22 city budget. We're also requesting uh, 7,500,000 in investment for the Center of Ethnic, Racial and Religious Understanding, CERU, an equity education center that works in both academic and community settings, providing impact-based nonviolent communication tools for individuals and groups and helping them to bridge social differences. In addition to these reductions, the pandemic has caused other unprecedented stress on our finances. Specifically, the community college enrollment has been negatively impacted. In the current academic year, student full-time equivalent enrollment decreased by 14% from pre-COVID levels. This was a trend that was experienced statewide and nationwide at community colleges. As a result, the year-to-year -year tuition revenues lost to the community colleges is 42 million. The university has frozen tuition rates at its, at its community colleges for five consecutive years. Let me repeat that. The university has frozen tuition rates at the community colleges for five consecutive years. We are also proud that two thirds of our full-time undergraduate resident students attend tuition free, thanks to the general's financial support like the TAP program, Excelsior Scholarships and the City Council's Ballon Merit Scholarships. We are grateful to the City Council for continually securing resources for the Ballon Merit Scholarships. We will ask for advocacy again as funding for this critical student support program was not included in the fiscal 22 executive budget. CUNY's budget request for fiscal 2022 takes into account our needs as well as the current fiscal environment. Our focus is on responding to the pandemic and jumpstarting New York's economic resurgence. 
Some of the initiatives for which we're seeking support include prioritizing student mental health, creating a nursing pipeline program, forging connections with private industry partners to create career pathways for students, expanding the successful CUNY course internship program and enhancing diversity within our faculty full-time ranks. We're also seeking crucial capital budget supports to enhance our IT systems, the needs of which have come to the forefront during this pandemic times. Thanks to the continued support of the New York State and city partners, I am extremely optimistic of the future of this great university, despite the challenges we have collectively faced from the coronavirus. Having seen our administration, faculty, students, and staff pull together and lift one another, even as their families and communities were buffeted by profound difficulty and loss, it shows me that CUNY, like New York itself, will always persevere. I had never been prouder to be a member of the CUNY community or more certain of, of the integral role the university plays in the sustenance of New York City than I have ever been. This concludes my testimony, and I will now ask our Chief Financial Officer, Matt Sapienza, to provide more information on CUNY's capital budget. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Strom and Barron, and members of the New York City Council Committees on Finance and Higher Education. I am Matt Sapienza, Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer at the City University of New York. I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify this afternoon about the university's capital budget needs. You heard from our chancellor regarding the challenges brought on by the coronavirus, and that also certainly applied to our capital program. Due to public health and financial constraints, the city stopped all construction early on in the pandemic, with the exception of priority health and safety projects. Over the past year, as more priority health and safety projects came up, we received individual approvals to proceed. We are pleased that the mayor's office has normalized the process and we are proceeding with business as usual, which means projects are restarting and new projects are being initiated once again. Despite the delayed start, the university is on target to complete 13 capital projects in fiscal year 2021 and an additional 23 in the next fiscal year. One of the key projects completed this year is the expansion of the CUNY in the Heights facility with increased operations there due to begin in the fall semester. The capital plan outlined in our fiscal 22 budget request reflects two critical priorities in response to the pandemic. The first is a need for higher air quality standards. And the second is the recognition that we need to accelerate our IT improvement efforts. Designs for capital renewal projects will include new criteria to improve the indoor air quality for our buildings and the latest public health information to ensure the safety of our community. Regarding IT, the required pivot to distance learning has underscored the need for reliable, flexible, and user-friendly technologies. We must continue to improve and modernize our IT operations to be supportive of business needs and evolve our systems to adapt to the changing needs of our students, faculty, and staff. Moving to modern cloud solutions will help us to replace paper and manual business processes with digital workflows and to centralize data that is currently located in systems managed by external providers. The city's executive budget pro proposes 615 million in capital funds for CUNY over the five-year plan through fiscal year 2025, including 5.1 million in capital funding from the borough presidents. We have worked collaboratively with the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget to more accurately realign the five-year plan with expected start and completion dates of capital projects. We are also pleased that the city's plan includes an agreement between CUNY and the School Construction Authority to build a new building on the campus of Medgar Evers College. The project will remove about 19 trailers which have been used as classrooms and replace them with a new building to be shared with the Department of Education. One of the most critical issues affecting CUNY's capital program is the age of its facilities. The university's facilities portfolio consists of 29 million square feet in 300 buildings across our 25 campuses. The average building at CUNY is more than 50 years old. Most are over 30 and some exceed 100. Capital construction, however, is a known strong economic engine to restart economies. CUNY has been a major part of that process for New York City. 
investment in CUNY's capital program will create jobs for the local economy, resulting in, a, resulting in an incredibly strong return on the city's investment. We are very grateful for the City Council's strong advocacy on behalf of CUNY and its students. We are now happy to respond to questions from the finance and higher education committees. Thank you very much. And before we begin with the questioning, let me say that we have been joined by council members Riley and Ulrich. Chancellor, it's always good to see you. I'm just trying to pull up my questions here. Okay. Uh, the expense budget. <clears throat> CUNY has a total proposed budget of 1.19 billion for fiscal 22. What is the estimated cost of the COVID-19 pandemic on the university system? And how did CUNY measure this cost? And does it account for the, uh, the learning and achievement losses as well? So, so thank you for the question, Chair Drum. Uh, let me take one part and allow our chief financial officer to, to talk about the, the financial cost. Uh, we have a page in the CUNY website called uh, In Memoriam, uh, in which we have listed all the loss of lives that we've had from uh, faculty, staff, uh, alumni, students, um, and always in consultation with their families for privacy, of course, uh, for them to be included. And uh, so there's a loss there of, of talent. There's a loss there of vitality, um, which is very difficult to quantify in, in, in any way. And we we hope to be able to as we can gather together in person, find a way to also celebrate those lives. So, I mean that that is one element of loss. Uh, we're also working with the students that did not adapt as well to uh, the online instruction to help them uh, stay in course for graduation. Um, and let me now turn to to uh, to Matt for the, the the financial calculation of of, of the loss. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you, Chair Drum. Um, so in terms of the financial loss, we have three main funding sources at the university, State of New York, City of New York, and tuition. So I'll, I'll talk about all three. Um, and also point out that since the beginning of the pandemic, since the onset in March 2020, our colleges and the central office have incurred about 75 million in unplanned expenses as a result of the pandemic. 75 million of things that weren't in our financial plan prior to the pandemic that we've now um, that we've now expended since March of 2020. In terms of the funding sources on the state side, um, in the current year, we had a $38 million reduction, 26 at the senior colleges and 12 at the community colleges. Um, we're very grateful that the state budget does not include those reductions for fiscal 22. It's just a one-time reduction. Mm -hmm. On the city side, as the chancellor mentioned in his testimony, we had a $20 million reduction in the last quarter of fiscal 20 that we absorbed and a $46 million reduction in the current year that is proposed in the, in the mayor's executive budget to grow to $67 million on the city side. And then lastly, tuition revenue, um, as the chancellor mentioned in his testimony, our community college enrollment was down 14% as a result of the pandemic which resulted in a tuition revenue loss of $42 million year to year from fiscal um, 20 to fiscal 21. So uh, certainly uh, a extremely negative impact on our community colleges. So, um, you know, all three of our funding sources were uh, significantly impacted by the result of the pandemic and as well as we had um, unplanned expenses of up to $75 million to, uh, to incur. Uh, just can you elaborate a little bit more on what the 75 million, I think you said it was, losses um, due to the pandemic? What, where were those, those um, where did that happen? Yeah, no, you know, it's interesting. Very early on in the pandemic, um, when we were um, finding out that students or faculty were infected with the virus before we went to distance learning, we were expending money on cleaning companies to come in and disinfect the buildings where these people had been. And then once we went to distance learning, um, the costs um, were um, various things like buying PPEs, buying hand sanitizer. One of the most significant um, expenditures that we had that we were really grateful about is we purchased, um, as the chancellor mentioned, 33,000 iPads and laptops that we gave out to students last spring semester to help them with the 
transition to distance learning. We bought about 4,000 personal hotspots for students as well um, to help those students who um, their Wi-Fi isn't uh, as strong as, as in other parts of the city. So we were uh, pleased about that. And then uh, one last thing I'll mention, just, you know, it's kind of a large category is um, we also um, incurred expenses for professional development for our faculty, a lot of which was, um, was uh, run through mm -hmm. our School of Professional Studies, again, to help uh, faculty be prepared um, for the transition to distance learning um, this past academic year. Let's just talk a little bit about the stimulus funding. Federal guidelines on the distribution of COVID-19 stimulus funds have been lifted, allowing for funding to be issued to undocumented students. What is the total amount in aid that will be dispersed to CUNY's undocumented students and how will the funds be distributed? So, so you are absolutely correct. In the first CARES Act, undocumented students were not included uh, in um, you know, in the previous administration's uh, very narrow um, definition. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we established the chancellor's uh, uh, fund because that allows to sort of support those students with private dollars. So uh, a lot of it, I mean, a, a significant amount of the funding uh, of that first 10 million that we raised went to undocumented and international students that were not included in, um, in the CARES Act. Um, they, they were included as part of this last allocation of 118 million that we got from CRISA. Uh, we, um, we have planned for that. We had hoped that the administration would change the policy and they did. Uh, so they're included in the funds that we um, just uh, began dispersing about two weeks ago. And uh, when in the fall, we dispersed the, the funds from the ARPA, the last stimulus funding signed by President Biden, um, they will be included too. Do you have the amounts on that, Chancellor? Matt, the by yeah, we've, un yeah. undocumented exclusively? Yeah. Yes. We, we don't have that yet, Chair Drum. We certainly were, you know, um, so pleased with the announcement last week from the U.S. Department of Ed that these students were now going to be eligible. And so we are now working towards getting them the awards as the chancellor said. So um, we'll have better data within the next couple of weeks. Undocumented is always very tricky because um, yes. it's not a question that we ask of students, are you undocumented? Mm -hmm. um, because we, you know, we are trying to be protective of, of that group, um, but we're doing outreach and through our campuses and we'll have some better data on that within the next several weeks. Do you have an estimate of how many undocumented students you might have uh, either in or and um, the uh, junior colleges and in the senior colleges? So the, the, when we did the reach out campaign with the Chancellor's Emergency Fund, when, you know, because they were excluded from the CARES Act, uh, the, 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 it was about 5,000 students uh, uh, roughly that, that, that responded. Okay, thank you, Chancellor. Uh, and what are you doing um, to reduce the learning loss experienced by uh, students? And what additional resources are being allocated to support uh, your students' needs? So um, let me, you know, we've been very, very focused on that. I think that our university provost has been sort of, um, has been the, the point person there in in, in collaborating with the DOE to get ready for the students that are coming our way and to monitor the transition when we move from, you know, to almost totally in person to mostly uh, online. So let me allow our university provost and his crews to comment on that. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, so as the Chancellor indicated, uh, CUNY has been working with the Department of Education on a series of um, summer bridge programs as we look towards the fall to ensure that uh, we address some of that learning loss. Um, as well, uh, we have our campuses uh, getting ready, preparing for the incoming class um, to make sure that the usual orientations um, and support services that are available uh, recognize uh, this reality. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, what is the university's plan for reopening the campuses to in-person learning this fall? So thank you for that question. We are, um, and clearly the, the, 
the the governor's announcement on the um, uh, mandatory vaccination uh, for students, and we're sort of uh, getting ready to uh, provide sort of the the, the 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 policy, right? Have the board vote on a policy uh, uh, around that. Um, you know, clearly uh, has. Uh, um, I mean, there's a lot of questions, right, before that as to whether we're going to be requiring or not uh, for uh, for students. What we're trying to do is to really uh, meet the students where they are. Uh, we have students who are hungry for uh, that in-person experience because they didn't have it at CUNY or at the DOE for the past year and a half, uh, or they want a more hybrid uh, kind of blended experience. Uh, so we want to be able to have uh, abundant courses for those students. Uh, now that it's becoming uh, like clear that uh, with the vaccine and other other precautions, we can safely gather in our campuses. But we also learned that a lot of students enjoy the flexibility that online provided. Many of our working students that have to balance uh, work schedules, many of our student parents that have to balance taking care of their children, uh, have enjoyed the flexibility of, uh, of online. So what we're trying to do is to have a very robust set of offerings that has all that menu. And then we meet you where you are. If you think you learn better and you're more comfortable with an online and a hybrid to have those courses for you. If you're hungry for that in person, we wanna have those courses there um, uh, for you and, and, and letting the, the, the demand from the students tell us where the courses need to be. The other thing that we have done, uh, Chairman Drum, is uh, a really historic investment in the professional development of our faculty. And I know that both you and Chair Barron uh, care about pedagogy and teaching. And we've, we have provided professional development for over 4,000 of our faculty members so they can teach better online, right? So they can be better adapted to uh, support our students in that modality. Uh, we needed to do that during this pandemic, but we also think that that's a great investment moving forward in terms of uh, the improvement in the pedagogy for the entire system moving forward. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, the university did not reappoint approximately 2,800 adjuncts and part-time workers at the start of fiscal 21. Will the university rehire these positions in the fall? And if so, how many teachers would be rehired? So again, it, that was you know one of the, the very difficult uh, decisions that, that we we faced uh, you know last year where we were dealing with uh, a number of decisions that we never thought that we would need need to do given the the fiscal uh, the fiscal crisis. Uh, the reappointment of the adjuncts will be based on the final budget, which we're going to take to our board for a vote in June, and enrollment trends. I mean, those are the two factors that. Um, uh, drive the, 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 the reappointment of adjuncts. I will say that I'm very proud that last year, even with, with some of those difficult things, working with the PSC, we protected about 80% of the adjuncts that had health insurance uh, during our joint efforts. And uh, I personally went out and sought uh, private dollars. Thanks to the Mellon Foundation, we were able to rehire uh, 653 of those adjuncts, mostly in the humanities. So we value the adjuncts. And um, the one thing that I'll say is that the best, I mean, I think that we all are looking forward for a university where we depend less on adjuncts and we have more full-time faculty. We all can embrace that. The best way to do that is to provide recurrent uh, tax levy dollars to our university. The way that we can hire people full-time is if we know that they're part of our baseline budget, not our money, which is one base and, and non-recurrent. So that would be uh, the best way to, to support that would be to help us with that 67 million uh, budget gap that we have that would allow us to hire more full-time faculty and therefore hopefully hire some of those adjuncts as full-timers. And just for my own clarification, who makes that determination um, about, um, uh, I'm, I'm losing my thought here now, about- um, The hiring? Yeah. So no, about, those, baseline, me, about baselining, about baselining. 
Well, I mean, I was making a reference to recurring funding coming from the city and the state, right? Okay. Uh, that will allow us to then, yep, to okay. um, um, to to bring more full time folks that then okay. uh, would require less uh, uh, part time adjuncts, and hopefully have some of those adjuncts with teaching experience yep. be in those positions. Okay, I, I got it. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about one of my favorite projects, and that's the LGBTQ public history project at LaGuardia Community College. Uh, Richard Lieberman and the folks there have done an incredible job with it and with a little bit of funding, a minimal amount of funding. In fiscal 21, the LGBTQ public history project at LaGuardia College was funded at $250,000, providing students from the CUNY Queens campuses with its third year of LGBTQ plus focused programs, activities, and events. Are there any plans to replicate this model on the other CUNY campuses? And if so, how much additional funding would be needed to expand this work in fiscal 2022? So thank you. From a fan to a fan, I was able to see how transformative that uh, those funds were uh, to the students in the entire borough, but particularly to the students when I was at Queens. Uh, we had an exhibit in our student uh, union that you attended the, the, the opening. We were able to do uh, uh, a CUNY Pride uh, event for the entire borough, thanks to that. Uh, we, what we would like to do is to be able to calculate and come back to you with a number. Um, and uh, since I have some first-time experience on how beneficial it was, I like to be able to guide the staff as they think about what would this look like if we did something QEY and what would the cost be? And we'll be happy to come back to you with that because it, it's, it, it's been really transformative uh, for the campuses and the students. And I commend you for being a driving force supporting that. Thank you, Chancellor. And uh, I think you're absolutely right in terms of how transformative it's been, not just for students, but for faculty members as well. The last exhibit that LaGuardia did focused a lot on faculty members who shared their own coming out stories, many of whom had not even been out to their colleagues prior to that at the LaGuardia campus. And um, it's been done on the other campuses as well. And it's really been a uniting thing, a unifying um, a thing across all the Queens campuses. And certainly I would love to see it expanded. So appreciate you getting back to me with some figures on that. And, see what we can't do together to uh, replicate that. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-chair, Council Member Barron. She needs to be unmuted, there we go. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chancellor and your team for coming to answer our questions. Um, I've got lots of questions. I'm gonna start with ASAP. So in your testimony, you referenced the fact that it's been announced that uh, ASAP will be returning. What kind of commitment do we have that that will in fact happen? And that question is based on the fact that we're very cautious about any outward agreement until we see it included in the budget. Because we know last year it was uh, restored at adoption and it was included but an additional $20 million cut for the count, uh, that the council was not privy to was implemented. So it was like a sleight of hand, you know, give on one hand, take even more on the other. Uh, that's, that's really uh, disingenuous. I think it's very dishonest. And what do we know we can expect in, in reality without snitching or taking it from another part? Well, so I, I couldn't agree more about the importance of ASAP and, and keeping it whole. As you mentioned, it has shown incredible results uh, in our community colleges uh, in terms of graduation rates and retention, which then also becomes a feeder to our four-year institutions, right? So I've always argued that ASAP is a, a wonderful recruitment tool, um, is a great way to have students succeed and graduate. Uh, so when we made the argument to, uh, to, to, to the mayor's team, we say that 10 million cut is a larger cut because you are cutting down our capacity to recruit. Uh, you are hurting our enrollment, which goes to the bottom line. And by hitting a program that has such dramatic um, graduation results, you're also hitting enrollment in the four-year schools 
in the future, right? So it's a it's a hit that multiplies. So um, we 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 are um, hopeful that 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 uh, money will be restored and that there be no uh, other sort of shifts of of funds that would affect affect, uh, affect ASAP. Right. So that's what we're looking to see. Also, we're going to be very uh, we're going to be looking at this budget very critically uh, because. It was disingenuous and it was, um, I'll just leave it at that nicer word, disingenuous to do that. Um, and now in terms of the remediation restoration, we wanted to baseline the program, but we know how important that remediation program is because of the deficiencies that students have when they are graduating. And we wanted to have it baseline. So what has your conversation been with OMB about the restoration for fiscal 2022 for the remediation program? So, Matt, do you want to sure, take, take sure. that on the on the on the OMB? And I'm happy also to have uh, Provost Cruz, if you want, talk and about the I academic ask, side. Thank you. And if I could ask if you could be succinct, because we're a little behind yeah. schedule, which is very important, but okay. we can get the yeah. crux of the uh, answer on. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Barron. And and yeah, we we were you know uh, disappointed that the uh, funding for the remediation was not included in the executive budget. Um, one thing I want to point out about the remediation that's really important is that um, it was funded in the current fiscal year, fiscal 21, at 1.7 million, right. but that was a reduction from prior years. Right. In prior years, it was funded at 2 million. Um, so we are certainly advocating for the restoration back at the original 2 million amount, okay. um, and that's, that's what we're here to ask for your help with today. Thank you. And in my opening statement, uh, I referenced Hunter College High School. Why did the president of Hunter College Campus School not employ the same policy as the CUNY system and suspend standardized testing, uh, the SAT and the ACT for CUNY requirements for admission? And how do you believe that the suspension is going to affect the level of remediation for incoming freshmen and also in terms of uh, our stated goal of trying to have quote diversity. How how does this decision, on the by, on behalf of the president, uh, made by the president, not on behalf of, but made by the president, match up with our claims for wanting to be a diverse institution? Well, I mean, I, I, I'll I'll say two things about that, and and um, I think that I concur with you that we wish that we had the result from uh, the task force that they put together uh, that has students, faculty, uh, and some of the community members uh, sort of thinking about, you know, what should be the, the admissions criteria and how to make it operational moving forward. And uh, I think everybody wished that we've had that, that blueprint uh, earlier so that we could put it in, in, in place uh, this year. And, uh, and one of the things that we say is that that really needs to be done quickly so that you know we don't waste time next year and we can have it uh analyze it you know embrace it and then get it ready for this year uh there's some things that are different in the way that um um it's been done in the past uh the exam is being given in in all the outer boroughs not just in manhattan sort of making it easier for many many more students to participate there's been a lot more recruitment uh directly in schools that have uh, large diverse populations, hoping that that pipeline uh, increases to an additional support in terms of uh, exam preparation for uh, for individuals outside of of of, of the borough of Manhattan. Uh, so we believe that those things will bring a, a more diverse class. Uh, clearly, that is not the long term answer, and I'm looking forward to um, the the solutions that come from this from this group, um, which is immersed in the, in the Hunter community um, to bring those changes next year. Thank you. With all due respect, Chancellor, this is not a new problem. It's been a long standing problem. There's been a steady decline. And to know at least 15 months ago that how was an opportunity to seize this time to resolve the issue and to not do that in a timely fashion I think is, is very revealing in terms of um, not taking advantage of the opportunity, the climate, the culture, 
to get a resolution. So I want that to be very strongly reflected. This is not a new problem. It's not a new problem. It's been a steady, 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 steady decline in black and brown. And now here at the same moment, we don't, we don't come up with a plan. We're doing more of the same. We're doing wider population. We're gonna do some test prep. We're gonna increase the pool, but you're using the same criteria, a standardized test, which historically we know to have been uh, racially uh, discriminatory. So moving on to my next question. Um, we did not, uh, when the, oh, wait. We looked at the, um, oh, in, in, in your testimony, you referred to the laptops the $33,000 that was spent on laptops, was that out of expense or was that out of capital? Uh, I will let Matt, sorry, Chancellor. Yes, uh, that was fully expended out of, out of the capital budget, Chair Barron. It was out of the capital budget, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, when we last left CUNY at the fiscal 2022 preliminary budget hearing, we had some outstanding questions, which also pertain to the executive budget for CUNY had no new federal stimulus aid added to its community college budget in that plan. We need CUNY to clearly walk us through the federal stimulus aid received in the community college budget in fiscal 2021. Our records reflect that just 39.3 million from the CARES Act grants has been allocated to the community college's budget. Is that correct? That's correct. 39.3 is the amount that has been allocated. Um, we will probably um, use a little bit more in the current fiscal year for the community colleges. We're projecting about 43.9. Um, so we will need about a four and a half million dollar um, adjustment made either in the adopted budget or when we close. Um, but we're working through those numbers now, but, um, but we expect a slight adjustment will be needed in the current year for uh, to, to recognize federal stimulus funds. Why do we not see this funding included in the executive budget for the community colleges? Yeah, we, uh, Chair Brown, we have been talking to the Office of Management and Budget about this and about the need to um, include an amount um, for federal stimulus funds in the fiscal 22 adopted budget. And, and so that's the, the plan right now is to include that. Um, which plan? I'm sorry, Chair Brown. So, like to see that in and for which yes in in the fiscal 22 adopted budget um we're we are uh, working with the administration um, and with omb to have the appropriate amount of federal stimulus funds that we're planning to use for community colleges in fiscal 22 in the 22 city adopted budget okay and what is the 12.6 million dollars year to date expenses accounting for exactly um, the 12.6 in expenses um, are, are for the, um, the things that I mentioned earlier, PPEs, hand sanitizer, um, IT equipment um, for the students that were bought outside of the capital appropriation, um, uh, faculty development, professional development of our faculty for distance learning. Um, and also one of the things that I, I didn't mention earlier, which, which I, I would like to, because it was a really uh, important initiative and our chancellor and our provost um, very strongly supported it, which is we allocated funds for mental health support for our students as well. And so all of that is uh, part of the year-to-date expenses. And we can provide a, um, a detailed breakdown of that 12.6 if, if you'd like. So, yes, I would. Thank you. And so now the table that you had shared with us, with this body, um, you had a, categor a CARES category, H-E-E-R-F-2, and you had mm -hmm. student awards, year-to-date expenses, revenue losses, and additional eligible expenses. Mm -hmm. Isn't that, in fact, to be uh, reflected in the CARES Act for 2021? Well, the, the HERF 2, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, Shiva. And the HERF 2 refers to the second stimulus allocation, which was the CRISA. Um, so those funds, we, we will likely use some of those funds in fiscal 21, um, but the bulk of those funds are gonna be used in fiscal 22. And then HERF 3 is the American Rescue Plan Act, which was announced by President Biden uh, back in March. Um, and again, those fun a, a good chunk of those funds will be used in fiscal 22 as well. 
And what is the $800,000 in additional revenue and tuition losses connected to exactly? We wanted to set aside a, um, a, a, an amount for the colleges because when we were putting those numbers together, we had a projection of what the um, tuition revenue losses were from enrollment. And we had a, a projection of what the eligible expenses were that our colleges were incurring. But we wanted to make sure that we provided some additional funds there in case there were additional enrollment losses between now and the end of the semester or there were, was an unanticipated expense. So that 800,000 was a really um, a projected amount of what may be needed. Um, and as we get closer to the fiscal year end, um, we will have an accounting of that. One thing about the uh, federal uh, stimulus I'm funds. Gonna, I'm gonna jump to the next question because my- sure. really, Thank you so much. I appreciate your understanding. I, I uh, understand. Also putting forth a proposal to its board of trustees on June 1st, 2021 for its plans to spend down an additional 176 $7 million from CRISA. All of this stimulus funding will support the community colleges, is that correct? And if so, how do you plan to distribute, allocate these funds? So all of our colleges, the four-year colleges, the community colleges are all receiving stimulus funds. Um, right, but and for CRISA. Yeah, for CRISA, CRISA um, there were allocations to both the senior colleges and the community colleges. Um, and as you said, Chair Barron, we have a um, our Board of Trustees Fiscal Committee meeting on June 7th, at which we'll be presenting our um, proposed budget allocations for next year. And included in that will be a proposal on the allocation of the, fe the federal stimulus funds. So that 176 million, is that dedicated for community colleges? 176.7 million. 176.7 million is the number for community colleges from CRISA. But one very important thing I just want to point out on that is 39.5 of that is, is going for student emergency grants. Um, that's part of the funding that we've been giving out to students over the last couple of weeks. So, that's just so for community college students or for just, all? That's, um, that's just for community college students. So, the remainder um, for institutional needs net of the student emergency grants is more like you know $137 million. And will that be in the adopted budget for fiscal 2022? Um, once, we, once we make our allocation, um, present our proposal to the Board of Trustees and, um, and they uh, hopefully will approve it, then we'll, we'll have a better sense of what the number is. But yes, it should be around that number. Um, and you know, again, one of the concerns there is with the $67 million cut we have from the city and the 42 we had in enrollment loss, that's 109 million right there. Um, so it's using up a good chunk of the CRISA funds and that's why we're, we're looking for restoration of that 67 million. In addition, CUNY will be receiving, will receive funding from the American Rescue Plan as well. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's correct. And what is CUNY's understanding or analysis of what this grant will total for the community colleges? And when do you expect to see the funding added to the budget? So um, this, is, this is pretty recent information um, because within the last couple of weeks, the, um, the federal US Department of Education has provided the numbers to colleges throughout the country. So. For our community colleges, um, they'll be receiving about 295 million from the American Rescue Plan. About 148 million of that 295 will go for student emergency grants. Uh, th that was a requirement of the US Department of Ed. They gave every single college a number that has to be the minimum number for student emergency grants. So that leaves about $147 million in for institutional needs from the American Rescue Plan for the CUNY Community Colleges. Okay. Uh, the committee and, Madam to... Chair, can I? Yes. Just, just one element of, of uh, the part of the money that is destined to the students, it goes directly to the students, right? Okay. So we don't have no uh, end, but I think it's an important thing, and I would hope that all the council members present help us let us know that that uh, funding, you know, for the students 
will be providing it in the fall, right? So if I'm a student thinking about my plans for the future, right? I think it's important to let people know that we'll be giving additional stimulus grants in the fall semester in which new and uh, continuing students who are eligible, who meet the criteria, will be able to receive those supports. So that we're hoping is also another reason to encourage enrollment. And we would love your the support of the council in letting people know about this. Great, thank you. Thank this you. committee wants to understand clearly how and where CUNY might be restoring any cuts that the university received in the November and preliminary plan from stimulus aid. Some of these cuts are true efficiencies and pandemic related savings. So while we wanna see CUNY fully funded, on balance, we want to ensure that the, the CTL is being uh, allocated and spent down as precisely as possible to avoid waste. So efficiencies are good. So of the cuts that were taken from both the November and preliminary plan, which are CUNY's priorities to restore? The, the biggest priority right now, Chair Barron, is the operating aid for the community yeah. colleges. We're very concerned about the community colleges. All of the programs that we've mentioned earlier, remediation, so important, our child care centers, funding, so important. They're all critical, but we're very concerned about the community college uh, operating budgets, not only because of the $67 million proposed reduction, but also, as, as, we, as we've mentioned, the enrollment losses. And uh, obviously, we're hoping to get students back in um, to our community colleges, but um, the combination of both of those things is uh, creating a situation at the community colleges that, um, again, we don't want all of the federal stimulus funds to go to plug a hole. We want those federal stimulus funds to be used so we can invest in our students at the community colleges and invest in our, in our campuses. Thank you. Um, additionally, what is CUNY's plan to invest the stimulus funds for, into, the, into the university system, specifically the community colleges. We know that CUNY applied 5 million from the CARES Act toward mental health resources. And we understand the application and the need for that. Is CUNY going to invest more funds for mental health services? And if so, how much will be invested across the community colleges? Yeah, that's, that's the plan we're working on now that we're putting together um, to present to our board of trustees in a couple of weeks. And um, we, it is our intention to have additional supports for mental health services for our students as part of that plan. We're also pleased this, in the state budget, we received an additional million dollars for, for mental health support. So yes, it's, it's our anticipation that that will be part of the plan. Um, we don't have the numbers worked out yet, but uh, mental health is an important initiative for us at all of our colleges, including the community colleges. Yes. Uh, at the mayor's briefing on the fiscal 2022 executive budget on April 26, the mayor stated that CUNY is receiving $800 million in federal stimulus funding. Is that the same total that you are accounting for? Yes. Um, and the numbers we were talking about earlier for the community colleges are a subset of that total. Okay. Um, and the rest of it goes to our four-year schools and our graduate and professional schools. And as the chancellor pointed out, about half of that is going towards for our student emergency grants. Thank you. So it's 500 in stimulus that's a part of a larger number, or is that the 500 million? Is that the total? Um, the total for the American Rescue Plan is a little under 800 million. It's, it's like 798 million, something like that. For the system. Um, for the whole system, for all of the colleges, including the community colleges. For all, including, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so to recap, how much federal stimulus funding has CUNY received in its budget for the community colleges in fiscal 2021? Fiscal 21 right now, the, the revenue that's been recognized is 39 million for the community wow. colleges. And like I said, we, we'll need a, a small uptick to that as, uh, when the adopted budget is done uh, for the current year, probably about four, four and a half million dollars increase. Um, and then we'll need an amount recognized for, for fiscal 22, as we mentioned just right. earlier. How much more federal aid does CUNY know now that it will receive in fiscal 2021 and also how much for fiscal 2022? 
Fiscal 21, um, you know, the, the, the first round of Stimulus CARES Act, um, we are going to, for the community colleges, we are going to fully utilize the CARES Act money by the end of the fiscal year. That money will be fully expended. Um, we will use some of the CRISA money in fiscal 21 for the community colleges, um, and then the balance in fiscal 22. And um, we're beginning to develop an, a plan for the American Rescue Plan Act funds as well. Um, so some of that will be expended in fiscal 22 as well. So that's all part of the, the budget proposal that we're putting together for our board of trustees. And I'm almost finished. I have a few more questions. Thank you for uh, your answers. The executive plan includes a large revenue adjustment totaling a reduction of $56.5 million in fiscal 2021. It would be good to hear more from CUNY. And I know we began touching on this subject during our preliminary budget hearing. And at that time we were discussing an approximate $40 million drop. So some of this total revenue adjustment is being rolled from the previous fiscal year. Is that correct? And if so, please explain this to us. Yes. Um, yeah, Chair Barron, the, the $56 million adjustment was an adjustment to the plan that uh, existed in the city's financial plan for CUNY tuition revenues. So we had to bring the plan down by 56 million. The 42 million um, refers to just the year to year change in the total amount we collected in tuition revenue in fiscal 20 versus what we're projecting to collect in fiscal 21. Um, so that's where the 42 million, that, that's what the 42 million number represents. 56 million was the adjustment to the plan. So the plan was a little higher um, than it should be. Even if our enrollment had remained flat, we would probably have to bring the plan down a little bit by 14 million or so. So is CUNY self-funding this shortfall this year? The, that, that 42 million, um, the federal stimulus funds are going to fill that shortfall for the current year, um, which we're grateful for to have the federal stimulus funds for that purpose. But um, we're certainly hoping that our, our enrollment bounces back um, so that we don't need to have used federal stimulus to fill that gap and instead can use it for our investment. And what is the exact total tuition shortfall to CUNY for fiscal 2021 only? For the community colleges, uh, fiscal 21 only, the year-to-year -year decline in tuition revenues was $42 million. And how many students were enrolled in the fall and then in the spring? I think uh, I might yeah, let's, refer to I, I, I think, you know, the, 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 there was a, a, we can send you some of the numbers uh, uh, okay. so you can have the correct uh, numbers, but there was uh, a decline and a decline in the community college sector, which is our biggest, our biggest concern. Okay, great. And so to confirm, the state's enacted budget is holding the community colleges harmless from under enrollment and has increased the base aid support by $50 per student generating an additional $4.2 million in fiscal 2022. Is that correct? That's correct. And we're very grateful for that base aid increase and yes. for the hold harmless as well. Very helpful to our community colleges. And were there any cuts imposed by the state to the community colleges budget for fiscal 2022? There were not for 22. For 21, yes, um, but no cuts for the community colleges for 22. Okay, and at least, uh, will CUNY propose to its board of trustees uh, any kind of increases? You know my position on increases about tuition. You know, it's my position that CUNY should be tuition free. It's my position that at least the first two years uh, post uh, secondary school should be a part of mandatory education provided by the state, either at an institution or a trade school. So uh, my position is that there should not be any increase. At, there should not be any tuition at all. But uh, are you proposing that? You, you'd be happy to hear there's no tuition increase uh, in the budget for next year. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and I have more questions, but I'm going to turn it back to the chair. Uh, I know we have, and if there are other questions that I may not be able to present to you at this time, uh, my, the staff will send them to you so that you can respond in writing. Delighted to, the door is always open, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Barron. We do have questions. We have one from Council Member uh, Lander. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Sorry, let me move to a location where I can ask my questions. Um, all right, thank you very much, uh, Chair Drum and uh, Chair Barron and Chancellor. It's good to be here with you. Thank you. Um, obviously, CUNY at this moment coming out of the pandemic is of just extraordinary importance to New York City, and we need to do everything we can to support and invest in it. So I'm going to be fighting very hard, excuse me, to make sure that we increase the funding for CUNY. I was not happy to see in the executive budget that while we're increasing funding for the NYPD, almost $190 million, that we're cutting some significant critical funds for CUNY. So I will be joining both chairs and everyone in fighting to make sure uh, that we increase the budget um, just this year. Last year, we had a really interesting conversation in this committee under Chair Barron talking about the possibility of moving to some kind of pilot program where institutions like Columbia and NYU would provide funding where they don't have to pay their tax, their real estate taxes, that could be a dedicated stream of revenue to CUNY. I'm not gonna ask you about that today, but I think as we come to the other side of the pandemic, uh, Chair Barron, I know this is something you've spoken about. I wanna work hard and make sure we fight together for some long-term resources. Obviously, American Rescue Plan funding is valuable, but we need new long-term resources for CUNY if we're gonna sustain it for the long-term. And I think, uh, I hope that that pilot idea could be a way uh, of getting that done. But I do wanna follow up on Chair Barron's questions about Hunter College High School, because I have to say, I just was extremely distressed about this. I asked your representatives about it during the preliminary budget hearing and was promised answers sooner than they came. And then when they did come, uh, you know, they were really unacceptable answers, both the way we found out and the idea that there wasn't enough time is just utterly false. All around the country, Boston Latin changed theirs in almost every other place. Selective high schools with a single test, one school were able to change their approach for this pandemic year. May not be the same thing they're going to do for the long term, but that doesn't mean this year was precisely the year to make those changes and to refuse to make them. I guess my first question is this, do you think the Hunter College High School test, the way it's constructed is consistent with the values of CUNY? Well, thank, first, thank you for your uh, support uh, regarding uh, our budget and our budget needs and sustained funding. So appreciate uh, appreciate uh, that and, and uh, having to write any information as you develop pilots and things, uh, things of that nature. Regarding your question about uh, the Hunter College, I think that we have uh, that group that involves students, faculty, you know, alumni, members of, of the of the Hunter community um, uh, that are going to provide sort of a, a new path forward. Uh, and I like to sort of wait to hear the recommendations as they think about the different options uh, for the uh, for the school. So I, I hear you. I guess I want to start by saying. The current approach to admissions at Hunter College High School is not consistent with the values of CUNY, and that is an important starting point. Like, setting up a long-term working group is fine, but then using it as cover to keep the test this year. And don't forget those other selective high schools around the country, they're not grounded in a public institution like CUNY that has values of equal inclusion and genuine social upward mobility. So it is important, and I believe that you should be saying to President Rabb, your working group is good, but your approach is inconsistent with CUNY's values, it must be changed. And I'm asking you to do that because I think you, I, you know, you've got to be political too, but I think you know it is inconsistent with CUNY values and it is appropriate for you as chancellor to tell President Rabb and the Hunter community they must make this change. So, but I want to ask two budget questions about the money we're giving Hunter College High School. So these are these two questions. First, how much does of the money that the city council is providing for Hunter College High School is going to administer, develop, uh, you know, provide outreach for the test? And second, I've been told that of the $18.9 million that Hunter College High School is getting in your allocation, that $900,000 of it is not even for Hunter College High School, that it goes to other Hunter College elements that should not really be funded, you know, through city funding. So can you tell me about those two things? So I'll have Matt take the second part of the question. I think the first one is one that I don't think that we have the information available because that plan is being developed, but I'll get to the information about the cost of the, uh, of the plan. And then for the second part, let me defer to, to Matt. Thanks, Chancellor. And yeah, Councilman Orlando, I'm not aware of any 
you know, amount of $900,000 that's being diverted to other Hunter needs, perhaps what it could be is that Hunter College does provide services to the high schools for security and, and IT part. and other things. And so it, it could be part of that, but we'll look further in, in that, uh, into that. And um, but as far as we're aware, the entire city allocation is going to the Hunter, Hunter Campus Schools. So, so I'd like you to get back to me about this because I'm told that $900,000 goes for some payroll administration and a range of things in Hunter College that are not connected to the high school. And I really do wanna know what that test is costing because I gotta be honest, and I'm gonna talk to the chair about this, I'm so angry about the way that President Rabb and Hunter College High School have approached this opportunity that I think the council should consider not, you know, moving that $900,000 and the cost of the test to other CUNY elements. I don't want to cut CUNY. All these things we're talking about in this hearing need funding. And if Hunter College High School is not going to move to an inclusive admission system when everyone else in their position is, then we should use those resources for the other critical CUNY needs that genuinely provide um, inclusive education, real social uplift. So I will appreciate your getting back to me and to the chair about those matters. Thank you, Councilman well Landler. Thank you. We now hear from Councilmember Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Always great to see you and your staff. Thank you so for being here and thank you uh, Chairs Drum and Barron for your terrific questions. There's not much left over, um, but I wanna raise two points. One is, uh, and I may have missed this, so my apologies, um, but um, where are you with opening up the Child Care Center? Uh, I understand the reduction in funding for this past year with the colleges closed, but how about how about for, for this year now that you're opening up? So let me ask uh, our university provost, uh, uh, Jose Ruiz Cruz, to answer that because I think he has more updated info on, on the whole child care scenario. Thank you. You're on mute. <laughs> thank you. I needed permission to unmute. <laughs> so thank you for the question. Um, all 16 uh, child care programs across the system are currently open for either remote service or uh, in-person service, depending on uh, each of the campuses. Um, at the end of March, we had about 625, 29 children, okay. um, about a 28% increase since January. So we're slowly coming back up. And um, the child care center in uh, City College in particular that I know has been of interest will be opening up in August. Oh, that's great, that's great. But didn't uh, the child centers take a $150,000 hit in the budget or am I mistaken we, about that? Uh, we have a, in, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Council Member. No, go ahead, man, in, in, restorations, yeah. yes. I'm sorry, yes, we are looking for 510,000 that oh, the that's council what I provided. It was in, a dyslexia thing. No, no, <laughs> it, there's a lot of numbers. 510,000 that was provided in fiscal 21 um, is not included in the mayor's executive budget for 22. And so we're looking for the council's I help again on restoring that. Thank you for that clarification. And I'm glad to hear that the child care centers are up and going. Um, my second question is more obvious and I'm sure council member Drum got to this, but of the, you know, OMB um, has a line right in, in the CUNY budget that says savings of whatever, 67 million, because they restored ASAP, some ASAP. Uh, how, what, what's your, did you already review the trail to your savings? I, be, I be, my sense was, and and I'll let Matt, who's the budget person, right, be safe that it was part of one of the questions that uh, Chair Barron uh, included in in her questions. But I I could be mixing apples and oranges. So Matt, I want to make sure that we're responsive yes, to Chair Councilwoman Barron. Rosetta. Thank you so much, Chancellor and Chair Barron. Feel free to jump in. I guess my question specifically would be. I get making the cuts. We're all gonna fight to get that money back, but were there any efficiencies that you could take and what are those? 
Yeah, no, there, there certainly was. Um, early on in the pandemic, the chancellor announced a university-wide hiring freeze. Um, and so we've had savings from, from that. Um, and by that, you day. mean accruals, but are they fully budgeted for the next year? Or did you take those positions out permanently? Wait, the, the positions will, will be, if, if the cuts remain, the positions will be coming out. Um, so in, in the city's plan, our intent is we're, we're hoping that funds will be restored and that we can backfill a lot of these positions. Some of them are just vacant positions that haven't been um, filled. So Wait, you know, we're if hopeful. If you could differentiate those two uh, when you send follow-up information and yes. like, you know, how many have been vacant for the last, I don't know, you tell me five years um, and how many are, uh, you know, you're eager to hire to backfill the positions. So sort of those two categories, number of people in dollars would be helpful. Sorry, and I interrupted you. No, no, we'll provide that that breakout. But I interrupted you. Other oh, things? no. Well, other savings that we've had, um, certainly on the OTPS side, um, you know, travel um, has been, was restricted as a result of the pandemic. Um, people, you know, going on conferences, professional development, other travel, um, and energy savings. We've had some significant yeah, energy savings so from did going you, to distance learning fired. as well. Thank you. Two more questions, Chair, if it's okay. Um, the, the actual savings from accruals and energy efficiencies and lack of travel is What's the dollar value of that? Um, we'll get you that. We'll get you that breakout. Um, you know, the, the the significant savings are coming from not uh, backfilling positions at this point, point. Um, and energy um, with us yeah, uh, moving away from it's distance learning that's going to go away. But um, but we'll get you the breakout of all of the of all of the. I, yeah. Again, I'm more interested in. Um, you know, just sort of the things that you can take that are no brainers. Yep. Right. Understood. Okay. Um, yep. Understood. Thank you. Last question is about period poverty. Um, just before the pandemic broke, we were in good conversations, I think, with your office, Chancellor, about providing tampons um, at all campuses. And uh, I know there's a wonderful company, uh, I'm forgetting the name, but it was very, it's very clever, but um, where, where they're, you know, you could, you could have free, you know, people could just get tampons. So where are you in that as you open back up? So again, uh, we had estimates for some of those costs, uh, which is also one of the things that was a high priority for our student leaders, right? It came up also from there. Uh, and obviously with a minimal presence of folks on the campuses, some of those things have been derailed. And uh, it's one of the things that we need to pick back up in terms of uh, cost and operationalizing it. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. So again, we it's not something that we have picked up recently. We've been candidly, um, you know, trying to get people vaccinated and 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 getting campuses sort of you know ready. But uh, we we you know we look into it and sort of react reactivate it. Okay, I'm not going to get graphic. I'm going to control myself, but uh, it's a priority for your female students. You should know that. There's a reason that the student leaders took that issue up. And um, I would really like that information, uh, rolling that out, your timetable, cost, where you're rolling it out, what you're doing. I, I think the Committee on Women and Gender Equity would be super interested in that. And, and just so the public knows, Dharma Diaz, the chair, is nodding her head, interested. Uh, so. Is that absolutely uh, absolutely no 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 need to be graphic it is something that we had on the on the pipeline i i think that we can all agree that that you know it's been uh, uh a complicated year and a half uh and we are now sort of getting back to uh some of the things that we had on the pipeline and we certainly prioritize taking a look at that absolutely
Last question, Chair Drum, I feel it. I, I This last, I promise, I promise. Um, then uh, have you been distributing tampons at pantries? I do not know the answer to that, but we'll find out no. because we have kept we have kept the pantries, and you know my 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 sense is that our student support teams in the campuses have been very creative in trying to meet the students where they are. So I mean I, I wouldn't be surprised that if it if it occurred to you and others that probably we have been doing in some, but we can check and clearly uh, is something easy to implement because that is up and running now. Exactly, and I think your controller was shaking his head. No, it's not done. But um, oh, no, I, 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 I was shaking my head. I don't know the answer. We'll have to find out. Okay, yeah. so fifty percent, fifty-two percent of your students need them. Thank you very much. Thank you, chairs, for the indulgence. We will now hear from Councilmember Powers. I'm starts now. Hi there, everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm a late addition here, but I'm going to keep it really quick. Um, first of all, I just want to add in, I, you know, I don't agree with the previous statement here to pull a million dollars from a high school in my district. So I want to be clear and on the record that any attempt to try to pull funding, I, I really I agree with the goals, but I agree to pull funding from uh, a Hunter High School in my district. I, I just don't agree with that. And I want to be on the record about that. Um, uh, I just had one quick question. I'm sorry if you guys touched upon this already, and I'm sure you did, but I just wanted to hear uh, the CUNY's plans for the fall when it comes to remote learning and for versus fully opened uh, 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 in-person learning. And I'm sorry if you were there to answer that, but just for behalf of some of the schools in my district, I wanted to hear what the latest was when it comes to um, uh, what CUNY will be doing for in-person learning and remote learning in the fall. So thank you for your question. So the, the plan is to have a robust menu of uh, online hybrid and in-person courses to meet the student demand where the demand might be. So we know that we're gonna have students that are hungry for the, uh, the in-person contact, right? So we wanna be able to have courses that address that. We also know that uh, many students uh, actually enjoy the flexibility of the online uh, courses and uh, and actually some students felt that they learned better there. So our plan moving forward is built. I mean, we actually had very little as a system online and hybrid before the pandemic. I think that this would allow us to sort of bring that up to maximize flexibility for those students who need it. Uh, for students who might still feel in the fall uh, funny about returning to, to campus or taking public transportation. So our plan is to have a very robust menu so that if you're a student and you feel that you want to take most of your courses in person, they're there for you. If you're a student and you think that you want to mix that it's more towards the online, that we have that. Um, so I don't like to use the expression going back to normal because I thought that normal had, had very few offerings on the online uh, and I want that to be something that is, um, if anything, something that is positive coming out of the pandemic, that, that we have more faculty who are comfortable there and we have a more balanced set of options for the students. And I just my only follow-up question, I think, is will there be, if, will there be classes that are remote and classes that are in-person? There won't be any hybrid. I, would that no, there are three. There are three. We, we're going to have online, hybrid and in-person. Oh, we okay. actually have an investment to um, what they call high flex classrooms, which allow you to have a class with some students physically there and some online. Um, and uh, to, again, to add flexibility to the menu of options. And, and my, my, I was joking about my last question. This might be my last question. Have you taken any polling or anything of students to figure out exactly where they might be in terms of preference? The, the, yes, we have. The, the challenging is that, um, and I think many of you are facing this in the council too, you know, things are changing every two weeks, right? So the last poll we took was open two days right before the governor said all schools, all universities in, in the state of New York need to uh, require students to be vaccinated, right? So that changes the, the whole set of questions uh, so we are working on getting another poll after that to capture 
Uh, but what we had basically is what I tell you. We had students that um, uh, really wanted to, to be in person or mostly in person. And we had students who wanted to, um, even if they were vaccinated, they wanted the flexibility of online. So I think our duty is to have that robust menu uh, for this fall and moving forward. Got it. All right. Thank you. Thanks for your answer. Thank you. Chair Drum, are you there? Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought council was going to call you, Chair Barron. Um, <clears throat> so Chair Barron wanted to add, I know you have some questions. Yes, thank you. I didn't want to just step in and uh, take over, I, but I didn't see you or hear you. So I just didn't- Oh, want you're, to... you're welcome to take over. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to be extremely brief and ask that you also be extremely brief in your answers. Uh, first, responding to this is not for you, but first responding to the comment by my colleague, Council Member Landers. Yes, I think we do need to look at taking some action uh, regarding the reluctance, the resistance and the recalcitrance of making any substantive change to increasing the black and brown student population at Hunter College High School. And I'm excited about exploring what can be done. But getting back to the budget, uh, question, the committee requests a comprehensive Excel breakout, including all of the federal funding by aid package per fiscal year, cross-walked by community college, and we would like to have that by the end of next week. And it needs to be crystal clear for me and the body moving into negotiations so that we can support what it is that we want to have restored and clarified in the budget and make sure there's no sleight of hand. So we expect that. Will you be able to do that for us by the end of next week? Yes. Great, thank you so much. And in your new needs, there was, uh, an in there was a new initiative, the Institute for State and Local Government, the National Network for Safe Communities to End Gun Violence, and the People's Police Academy. Can you very succinctly tell us about these uh, and which agency will be working with these uh, initiatives? And is there any relation to increasing any funding to the police department based in any of these initiatives? Our, if you have that information, I don't have it offhand, so we can provide that to you. Yeah, the, uh, these are, uh, you know, the, the funding for the Institute of State and Local Governments and, and both the People's Police Academy was added to CUNY's budget. Um, the People's Police Academy is part of Medgar Evers College and they are providing services to various precincts throughout the city. Um, and the, IS, the Institute for State and Local Governance, the ISLG, um, will be providing services and expertise on uh, the police reform initiatives um, that the, the mayor's office is, is putting forth. Well, I certainly want to uh, be a part of that and have some conversation about that because when we had the uh, police reform um, bill brought before us, there was a lot of discussion. People felt it was not grassroots based. They felt that there was not a respect for the ideas of how to really have a body that will be in fact held accountable for their misdeeds and misconduct. And this tinkers around the edge and does not really get to the heart of that, which is why I have introduced the uh, Police Accountability Act, which says that we should eliminate the CCRB, have an elected body to review police conduct and also have an independent prosecutor. But that's a whole nother hearing and uh, we will look for the answers that you give us for the questions in more detail, particularly if there's any kind of additional funding that would go to the police from this project that's moving forward. And lastly, um, for well, there's also a Mega Evers College healthcare pipeline and how many full-time staff will be hired in connection to this program and how many students will be involved and are they only students limit, uh, students enrolled at Medgar. So if you don't have that, you can send that to us. We would be happy to get that answer. And finally, 
Uh, there are 13 projects that are expected to be completed. And what will be the total value of all projects completed in fiscal 2021? So I, I think on those, yeah. we'll, we'll come back to it's, you, uh, okay. the yeah, is way. I, and on the on the Megger, uh, it will be anchor at Megger. So mostly for those students, but remember that our students can transfer anywhere in the system. So great. And, Thank and you. Chair, Thank ba Chair Barron, yeah. I, the the uh, value of the 13 projects completed was $124 million in the current fiscal year. Thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. Thank you to the panel for indulging us. And thank you to the chair for extending additional time. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we're gonna end it here. I really appreciate you coming and staying with us, uh, Chancellor Matos Rodriguez, and I uh, look forward to continuing to work with you. I wanna say what a pleasure it has been working with you, I guess almost for 12 years now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but uh, I really look forward to continuing our last seven months, my last seven months, anyway, in the council with you and with CUNY. So we appreciate that and we thank you again for coming in. The, the feeling is mutual to thank to the both chairs for your support and your commitment. Un abrazo. Thank, thank you. you, un abrazo igual. Okay, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, we're going to now move directly into our hearing with the Board of Election. Um, and so just give us a couple of minutes to get set up and then we'll start. But everybody should stay in this room. Sergeants, I'm ready whenever you're ready. And Chair Cabrera. Ready, sir. Okay. And the Board of Elections, we'd like to do a sound check before we get going. Good afternoon. We hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much. Okay, looks like uh, we're good to go. Okay, thank you very much, Sergeant uh, Polite. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Council's eighth day of hearings. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. <clears throat> On the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 22. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We just heard from CUNY and we will now hear from the Board of Elections. We are joined by the Committee on Governmental Operations, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. I understand that um, in the interest of time, he and I will both forego an opening statement. And I believe that the Board of Elections also is not going to be making a opening statement. So that will lead us right into uh, questions. But we do have to swear you in. So I'm going to ask um, Council to swear in Dawn Sandow, Deputy Director, Deputy Executive Director for the Board of Elections. Um, and Council, would you do that now? Absolutely. Just a few procedural items. Um, just as a reminder that everyone will be muted until recognized to speak, at which time they'll be unmuted by the Zoom hosts. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, we need to be muted unmute again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay with unmuting and unmuting, so please be patient. Now with the affirmation. 
Deputy Executive Director Sandow, do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Okay, I don't think they're gonna make an opening statement, so let me just um, jump right into, uh, so I'm gonna announce who's here first and then I'll jump into questions. Um, we have been joined by uh, council members, Dharma Diaz, Maisel, Yeager, Kalos, Powers, and Cornegie. And um, let me also apologize for being behind. Uh, it's that time of year for us with budget, um, and uh, there's just so much we can do in, in such a little time. But anyway, I thank you for being here. My first question is around absentee ballot reforms. The state's fiscal 2022 executive budget includes a proposal for absentee ballot reforms, which aims to extend the time voters have to request an absentee ballot and ensures a quick turnaround of a request. What if any operational impacts would this proposal have on the VOE if enacted? And do you anticipate this proposal having a financial impact on VOE? And if so, could you provide us with an estimate? Um, we don't see it having any impact on the board. Um, we already now uh, deal with special elections and the deadline is 10 days prior to the election. And uh, it all comes down to the data files and the data being transferred over to our poll pads. We don't see any impact. Okay, thank you. Let me compliment you. I think it was, it's your, your website, if I'm not mistaken. Um, about uh, requesting an absentee ballot, uh, which I did do. And po folks should know that um, it is available just by going to the website, or I think you have an app now. Can you give us a little advertisement on that? Um, uh, we have uh, updated our website continuously as uh, election changes have, have evolved. And uh, we have all information on RCV for this year's election in all required languages, two page ballot, all of our deadlines, um, voter guides, uh, PSAs, um, as far as the absentee portal, if you're registered in the city of New York, you can go right into absentee voting, put in your information, it gives you, once you are confirmed, it gives you a confirmation number, which then you can use to track your ballot. It then tells you each process of where the ballot is, vendor, mailed, and out to the voter. And uh, can you give us the, the deadlines uh, for the absentee ballot in particular? Deadline is this? To apply for an absentee ballot? To apply for an absentee ballot? Yes. For the election seven days before the election. So people have up until seven days before the election to apply, then yeah. they should get it in the mail. And then how long do they have to return? Obviously, how long would they have to return it? They have up until election day. It has, has to be, be post -marked. post marked. Uh huh. Okay. What uh, other preparations have you made for absentee ballots? Um, is there any other things that you could tell us about that? Yes. Um, well. Since the uh, since last year, actually, uh, during COVID with the executive orders, we basically in about a month and a half had our portal up and running. That's that's one. Number two is the absentee ballot voting equipment that we procured, which speeds up the process, especially since we had an enormous amount uh, of absentees to deal with for the presidential. Um, we also have a cure department now where uh, the absentee ballots, if there's something that comes in and it can be cured, a voter receives three communications from the board, an email, a telephone call, and a letter stating that what the issue is with their uh, absentee ballot and that they have a certain amount of time to be able to come in and cure that. Um, I think it was. That's about, yeah. It, it has increased the amount of space that we need in each borough office um, because the head count had to increase, of course, for early voting and then absentee equipment in order to process 
all of these absentees. Not only did we hire uh, permanent employees for the early voting, which was back in 2019, but now with the increase in responsibility with the absentees and the amount, we have more seasonal workers as well. And the equipment used also took up a tremendous about, amount of space. So we are short on space in all five boroughs and the executive office as well. What type of space would you need? How large? We would probably need, Jerry, I think it comes out to what? In terms of square footage? Square footage. Sure We're working with OMB on the square DCAS. footage, but we, and DCAS, and, but it's been a while. And uh, I think I have it right here. Just give me a minute. So the board is proposing 16,000 to 22,000 of square feet added to the current borough offices and 18,000 square feet in the executive mm -hmm. office at 32 Broadway. Um, also, because of COVID and all the plexiglass partitions that have been installed in all the borough offices to keep our staff safe, that also took up a tremendous amount of room. Okay. Um... Let me talk a little bit about ranked choice voting. Can you describe the work that the BOE has done uh, with the campaign finance board to ensure that voters are aware of the ranked choice of what it is and uh, what voters will expect to see on the ballot? Um, we've worked closely with the campaign finance board to make sure that the message is consistent. Although we were not mandated, uh, we did a PSAs on our videos and a very uh, diligent uh, public education campaign. Um, we did a mailing booklet to all registered voters uh, and it leveraged space in our legally required information notice um, to serve as educational and instructional on RCB, print and digital, the board has taken out print and digital advertisements in local newspapers, citywide publications, in all required newspapers in all five boroughs. The board has amplified all our messages on our social media channels. Uh, like I previously said, the board created PSAs in all five languages and placed them on our website and promoted said videos digitally. Phone bank availability, the board has trained staff uh, to be able to answer FAQs on RCB, voters can call 866-VOTE-NYC and a representative in all covered languages will be able to answer their questions. Out of home advertisements, we have used digital ads using link NYC kiosks across all five boroughs. Palm card distribution will be at all early voting early voting sites and election day sites. We use them during the special election and the feedback that we received, the Palm Card has all the information a voter needs and we received very good feedback on that. So we're continuing with that. We also use the design of the Palm Card and created a five foot pop-up poster that will be prominently displayed at all sites which serves as an instructional tool for not only RCB, but also uh, an educational text on the two sheet ballot where it's applicable. Uh, our privacy sleeve, so when the voter comes and gets their ballot, it gets put into a privacy sleeve. When they go over to the, um, hold on now. Oh, I just, the privacy booth yeah. and, and they open up their, their sleeve, the instructions for RCD is right on the inside for them to follow. We also put a message on our scanners so that when the voters go to vote, it's going to tell them to put in one ballot at a time so that they're not doing it too quickly to decrease any kind of uh, jams. And um, I think that's about it. That's our so public education. Just, just to be sure that it's, it's two pages, the ballot, right? In some places, yes. I think in all. I think in all. You know, okay. So uh, they, they don't separate the pages, am I right? The way we're packaging the pages for our poll workers, because we want to ensure that the poll workers are giving out two pages, right. they will be packaged 
they're not going to be connected because we don't want to have any issues. We see that when mm -hmm. we don't use the uh, preparation the ballot jams go down. So what we did is they're not connected, but there's page one, page two, and then there's a division, a blank page. So the, the poll workers know first two pages go to the voter into the privacy sleeve and the blank page gets put into a recycling envelope. And then you're on to your next ballot packet. So when you go to the scanner, you put in one, you put in one page at a time. Is that how it works? Yes. And there will be when you lift up the scanner, there's going to be a message and it's going to say, please put in sheet one. And then it'll say, please wait, and then please put in sheet two, and then it'll say thank you for voting. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just go to um, some questions now about early voting. How will the board ensure that voters are aware of the early voting hours for the June primaries? They're on our website and they're in all our advertisements. And do the hours differ at the different sites or how does that work? No, the hours are the same across the board and the commissioners have voted to increase the hours by 10. So voters will have more of an opportunity to vote uh, more hours. We also increased our early voting sites to 104 across the city. Okay, I hope you'll add one more in, sure. in Elmhurst. I think we're working on getting a letter for you for that because the only one in Elmhurst is at the uh, Elk Lodge and it's kind of hard to get there. But I'll talk with you more about that offline. I don't know if you've received anything on that yet. No, I haven't. Okay. Um, uh, so, so just to go back to the hours, would it be standard hours from nine to five or how does that work? No, the hours differ. Um, they're different on the weekend. Um, I don't have, could you pull up the hours so I could read them at some point before we're done? Yes. Um, we have two late nights during the week, uh, which is mandated. Okay, so, so how many so days- So I'm gonna read eight? them to you. Saturday and sure. Sunday, it's 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. <clears throat> Monday, 7 a.m. to 4. Tuesday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Wednesday is 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. <coughs> Thursday is 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Friday is 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Saturday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Sunday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. A 10 hour increase from 2020. Okay, great. Now, um, I know that in the 2020 election, the general election, many New Yorkers waited in line for hours. Um, are there any steps that you've taken to decrease the waiting time uh, and um, reduce it to less than 30 minutes to vote? Yes, so we added the extra hours of voting. We added more poll sites, 104 across the city. We're using- that's for the, um, I'm sorry, that's for the general, I mean, that's for the, um, the regular vote election day sites? Yes, well, election day sites, the hours are the same. The hours are 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. No, yeah. but I mean the- um, you We have added, over 12 for election day. You, know, you said you added more sites. For early voting. Are you talking for, okay. about just election day? Yes, yeah, so just for election day. I was wondering about that. There are, there are added sites for election day more than in the general election. We actually have line management workers, which we used in 2020, which uh, was a positive. Line management will be directing voters to that come in with an absentee ballot to go directly to an absentee ballot box that's located strategically in the poll site. We will also be helping uh, voters online if they are, we're hoping they're not, but if they are uh, helping them to go to their specific ED if they don't know it. Our information notice that is sent out to the voter is with a fast pass tag. And they are able to take that tag to the voting site. It's contactless voting, but it speeds up the process. Here's a picture of what one looks like. I don't it's know. It's hard to see. Yeah. 
okay, there's a code here. And when the voter goes to the ED table, this card gets placed into a square box on a mat right underneath the poll pad and the voter's information immediately comes up. So they don't have to touch anything. Uh, we will be okay. using the um, pens that also have, a, and it's a, a, st a stylus and a pen, and they will be able to keep those pens so they don't, you know, so there's no using uh, other people's pens. Um, so we've speeded up the process that way. Line management. <laughs> fast pass tag, um, having people work the lines with a pull pad. Uh, we have uh, people inside as well that will be directing people where to go. We've added quite uh, a, a, an enormous amount of line management uh, workers in each site. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to my co-chair, Chair for Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Drum. First, let me thank you, Chair Drum. I don't think people realize, or those who are just tuning in, how many hours. Uh, you're literally in every executive budget hearing, and not just for this year, you've done it every year you've been the chair. So I salute you and great job. Uh, you're such a gentleman and uh, I honor you today. Thank uh, you. My, my, my joy. Uh, Deputy Director, I have a few questions here and welcome and I want to thank your team. You guys did a, under the circumstances last year, a phenomenal job dealing uh, with uh, elections under the context of the pandemic. So I salute you and all the staff, uh, amazing job. I, I want to start uh, with ranked choice voting software. Uh, Four quick questions. I'm going to put them all together for the sake of time because I know we have to get you out of here before two o'clock, and we apologize again for the late start. But to your knowledge, has the state board identify any significant technical issues with the software? When do you anticipate the board to complete the certification process? Uh, how will how will the BOE proceed if the state board does not certify the software in time? the June primaries and what type of cyber security measures are in place to ensure the security of the RCB tabulation software? Uh, first, the New York City Board and the New York State Board have been working very closely. Um, we are not aware of any uh, technical difficulties or significant te technical issues with the software. Uh, it is our understanding and belief that the State Board expects to take action on approving, because it's not a certification, it's an approval. They will be approving the process of the RCV software at their next meeting on Tuesday, May 25th. Um, mm -hmm. As mandated by the City Charter, uh, if we don't have, which I am, I, I don't even want to say it because it looks like everything is moving smoothly. Uh, but if we don't have the software as mandated by the city charter, we will move forward as we have in the past by uh, doing a manual canvas as we did with all the specials. And cybersecurity measures? Cybersecurity, we, we work closely with Do It and also FireEye and Mandian. Um, we are looking to uh, increase a headcount here at the board. Uh, for not just RCV, but for all the changes to elections. It's important to note that as technology increases, also the threat of cybersecurity increases. So um, we are requesting um, staff because we would like to have a uh, cybersecurity unit here in the general office. Um, and also units in each borough. Um, I can send you, I don't know if I have it, I believe I do, but um, the actual amount, I think we requested 16 uh, new employees uh, for that specific unit. It's cybersecurity unit working with early voting. They're going to be, while well, they say there's a bill that's going to uh, have same day voter registration, which means our you, our um, firewall things have to be protected because that's going to be uh, in real time data files that will be uploaded. 
Um, so there needs to be uh, a cybersecurity unit here in order to protect the agency. Um, it would be six positions would be embedded within the EVS unit, which is our early voting system, our MIS department uh, for our general office operations, uh, senior security analysis and engineers and network implementation engineers. The remaining 10 positions we would deploy to the five boroughs as supervisors of the newly created borough canvassing units dedicated to conducting daily routine cybersecurity checks and implementing necessary upgrades as new technology evolves. Well, I appreciate that answer in light of what we just saw happen uh, down south with, uh, with the pipeline uh, and the last thing we need in this very important election uh, to have a nightmare uh, situation. Uh, I wanted to ask you, is there any way to use the software if the state board does not approve it? Uh, hand counting out this, <laughs> yeah, uh, that would take, I would imagine a month uh, at least. Uh, so is there any way to use it without their approval or, or is that something that you have to have the approval? We have to have the approval. Okay. Uh, so, some people have been saying that it may take up to 10 rounds to determine a winner in the RCV uh, elections. Can you clarify that's true or not? I, I, I think I know the answer to that, but just so we can have it on the record. And also, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, has ESS met, uh, met its contractual uh, obligations? ESNS has met its contractual obligations, yes, and it can take up to 10 rounds for RCV. It could. Yes, it could. And, and what, what's the implication of that? Well, th the implication is timing. You know, it, it takes time. I mean, everybody has to remember that it's going to be the same process on election night. You're going to get your unofficial results, which we always do. And then there's the seven day, which is normal. We get, you know, have to wait for our absentee ballots to come back. Um, and it proceeds from there. That's where the change takes place a little bit. Uh, absentees are due back. The election is the 22nd. So I think absentees are due back the 29th. Um, if there is any absentee that comes back that needs a cure letter, of course, they're gonna get the letter. They're gonna get a telephone call. They're going to get an email. We have to wait for that to come back. The voter, we have to wait seven days for the voter to respond, which then takes us to July 9th. And let's hope that there are no cure letters that have to go out, but it would take us to July 9th. And it's seven business days that we have to wait. It's not seven days. So considering we have a federal holiday, also the 4th of July that falls on the 5th, it would take us to start running the rounds the week of uh, July 12th. The week of July 12th, but if, Help me understand and just for clarification, since this once, is- Once all the rounds, all, once all the data is received, uh, the software will make the rounds go very quickly. It'll, that's what it'll I was going to ask. very quickly. I so mean, really that's it's not the beauty of the software. software. You know, the day, it's right. not a really about the software. Uh, the delay at all is all about, you know, waiting for the absentee ballots, so everything else that you have mentioned Correct. for the software, it's a it's, matter it's, of right. pushing a button and then you got it. Right, it's statutory requirements. That's what it got is. It. Got it, let me move uh, quickly here because I want to let my colleagues uh, be able to jump in. Um, can you share with us uh, how much has been spent on early voting in fiscal 2021 to date. How much you anticipate will be spent on early vo voting solely during the 2021 citywide primary election? Does BOE believe that the funding allocated in fiscal 2022 is enough to cover 
the costs associated with the 2021 and 2022 election cycle. Do you and do you estimate you will require additional funding in fiscal 2022? Um, so for early voting in fiscal year 2021 to date, an estimated 18.5 million has been spent on early voting. Uh, the November general election was roughly 16 million for early voting. The board also conducted five special elections in fiscal year 2021. The Bronx City Council districts 11, 12, and 15, Queen City Council 24 and 30, 31. The cost for each of these events for early voting is an estimate of 500,000 for a total of 2.5 million. Um, we anticipate to spend early voting solely during the June 2021 citywide primary. Uh, between 9 and 11 million, that's an estimate. Uh, that's on poll worker, public education, training, ballots, equipment, election supplies, PPE, and RCB. Um, as far as the funding that's been allocated to us, um, do we have enough to cover? We most certainly do. And we would definitely, uh, as we're sitting here today, uh, I would be remiss not to mention uh, and to state that the board is very thankful for the uh, budget that, uh, that we received. Thank you, Deputy Director, for uh, your straight to the point answers. I have two more categories, but I want to let my colleagues uh, be able to ask their questions. And if uh, hopefully I have time for this last little question. If not, uh, we'll definitely submit it. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to Chair Drums uh, for questions. Actually, I'm just gonna ask council to uh, call the council members who have questions. Sure. If any council member has questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including the answer. Please wait for the sergeant arms to let you know when your time begins. The sergeant will let you know when your time is up. We will now hear from council member Powers. Time starts now. Hello, sorry about that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Board of Elections. Um, I want to just talk about ranked choice voting for a second as we are on the uh, verge of a very, very big election. and. Not the first time, but obviously one of the, the biggest time we're going to be using ranked choice voting and it's going to be a big learning experience, I think, for a lot of folks in the future about how it works and how uh, voting behavior sort of works. So what I'm kind of curious about is how we are going to kind of see the results after um, Election Day. And maybe you can start by just walking me through, I, I, A, I want to get the status of the software um, uh, being approved for to make this work rapidly. And second is to get us, I think you guys have done timing a little bit, but I'm really kind of most interested in knowing is exactly how we're gonna see the different iterations of voting uh, rounds happening and what will be released to the public. So can you give me just a, a I'll have a follow-up question, but A, just a status on the software being used here, and second is, um, you know, how New Yorkers will see the different rounds take place, and whether we'll get round by round information, or we'll see just the final results. Um, well, there have been alternative uh, plans put together, and I think that once we receive approval on Tuesday, discussions, uh, of course, will be made in public. Uh, as to how we're going to proceed uh, as far as what the public is going to see. Um, like I said to uh, Chair Cabrera, on election night, you will see unofficial results. And that is for early voting and election day results as we normally have seen. Um, as far as the alternatives, uh, that's something the commissioners will have to approve. I believe that in the, the next coming week or so, they will be discussing that in public. Discussing what, what in public? The, soft, the, the alternatives of what, of what is going to be released, the timing of the release, okay. that will be discussed as soon as the approval on Tuesday, May 25th. 
will be done. And, and, and one of the questions I had um, about this election and others have asked me is whether you'll release the capital record here of, um, uh, which shows how, you know, how each ballot ranked each uh, choice, whether you'll be releasing that. That hasn't been determined yet, but I think that will be part of the discussion. Okay, so you when and when does that decision get made? Uh, in the next few weeks. Okay, the next few weeks is the election. So what well, do we I, have? I believe that the commissioners are waiting for Tuesday for the approval, and then the discussions will start regarding the alternatives to releasing information and what information will be released. And what is the deadline to make a decision on that? I would think in the next coming week, we will probably have a, a decision. I believe this will be discussed on Tuesday. However, I don't want to set an exact date to it. I know that their, their meeting is before ours. Uh, their meeting, the state board is meeting at 12 noon. And we should have our answers before we go into our public session at 1.30. So I'm hoping for a uh, discussion uh, regarding the alternatives on Tuesday. Okay, and then the this this was not released for the the, the primaries. I mean, sorry, the special election elect to date. Right? Is that correct? I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? I said that that data was not released for the special elections that have taken place to date. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so but there is a potential possibility it would be available for this June's election, depending on what happens next week. Correct. Is that correct. Okay, um, and. Um, what do you see other constraints or concerns ahead? I mean, I'm concerned about the timing here because we're uh, ex exactly a month away from primary day. Do you see other constraints or concerns right now in terms of timing or resources to uh, uh, implement successfully ranked choice voting? No, no, I'm confident. I'm confident in the board. Um, we did wait and we had reasons for waiting to start our public education campaign uh, and it started in January. The reason why we waited was because we had a special election that was not ranked choice voting in December. We did not want to confuse voters, but since January, we hit the ground running um, and we've worked closely with the administration. We've worked closely with CFB. We've worked closely with good government groups. Um, to time ensure, expired. excuse me. My time's expired. You can keep going. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> um, to ensure that the RCV information gets out there, and we worked very hard on keeping the message consistent and making sure that the voters for early voting and election day are going to walk into the poll site. They will see a five foot poster which gives direction for RCV. They will be handed a ballot and a palm card with the same information. And they will also receive the privacy sleeve with their ballot so that when they do go to the privacy booth, they have all the information right there. We are going to have people, line management, people at the sites that are going to be able to go and, and direct them to our PSA. Some people do better with watching visually, which is why we did the PSAs and all the required languages, then they do reading something. So we will have people at the sites with tablets for that if anyone comes over and has any questions. And can I just ask one, one more question? I'm sorry to take more time, but why, is, why does it take 20 days after the primary to start counting the votes from ranked choice voting? Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. I as, as, as I understand it, it would take 20 days after rank after election day to start counting the rank choice voting. Is that correct? Well, that all depends. Uh, because of the statutory requirement with the absentees, um, it depends if we receive a, uh, a, a, an absentee ballot that needs to be cured. We have to wait for that to be returned. Um, like I, I previously said, the election is the 22nd and voters and the public will receive unofficial results, but we have to wait the seven days for absentee ballots to be returned. Also, we may receive the following day uh, an absentee ballot postmarked on election day. Every vote has to count. We must keep the privacy of the voter uh, intact as well. 
Um, and that's when we start uh, going over our absentees. Uh, that whole week, that process, affidavits are done. All these are done preliminarily uh, before the actual canvas starts. So if we receive on the 29th or the 30th an absentee ballot that needs a cure, it's going to have to, the voter will receive a phone call. The voter will, re will receive an email. The voter will receive a letter as well, stating that they can cure and fix their ballot. We then have seven days for that voter to respond to us. So that could be immediately, or that can be seven days later, and it's seven business days. It does not include weekends, which can take us to the 9th of July. So now it's July 12th. You have everything you need. Uh, Council and member, we're going to have to move forward. I just, it's my last question. I just want to figure out timing. How quick will it take? They have to leave by, they have to leave by 3 o'clock, and I still have another council member. Uh, okay. that okay. wanted, I'm so sorry. Right. It's, it's out of my control. No worries. Thank you, Jeff. I can answer your questions offline if you have any. Just we're always available. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. We will now hear from Councilmember Adams. Time starts now. Thank you very much, uh, Chairs Drum uh, Marathon, my marathon hero here, my finance chair Drum, uh, and uh, Chair Cabrera, Co Chair Cabrera. So great to see you as well. Thank you so much to the representatives from the BOE for being here today and providing us your insight um, and your testimony today. My questions are, are um, very brief. Um, we, uh, first of all, I'd like to compliment all of the, um, all of the folks uh, that have given training. I think the training has been exceptional uh, regarding ranked choice voting. Uh, I think the training, um, the presenters have all been fantastic. And um, we're still continuing to ramp up the training um, in Southeast Queens and my district as well. I've been on several of them, um, even though I probably still can't give one by myself. But um, I would like to come the trainers um, for doing a great job. My concern still is, however, um, the, uh, the timeliness of the training, um, the feedback when it comes to uh, people um, still feeling comfortable uh, with ranked choice voting. And because Queens, we had several, what, at least two, three elections already. And looking at the feedback and the results from the recent elections in Queens, um, I, I'm still not getting a great feeling as far as the voters' feelings um, around um, utilizing rank. Um, so uh, I guess I just want to know how you feel. How confident are you um, in the comfort of the voters uh, in using ranked choice voting, um, particularly since we've had um, a few trials with it? Um, I've seen the feedback in the press. Um, and spoken to you know some of the candidates as well. Um, it's been interesting. Um, I haven't seen anybody jumping up and down saying this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, which is what I really wanted to hear. You know, given my my uh, my very vocal apprehension around it. But um, we're looking right now at a tremendous uh, election coming up on the 22nd, and um, I'm worried for you. I'm worried for us. I'm worried for New Yorkers. So how, how confident are you in uh, voters' uh, comfort with ranked choice voting? And I think that'll be my only question. Thank you. Well, I, I'd like to go back to the special elections that took place in Queens. And um, I mean, I feel that the canvas process, uh, the transparency um, was, uh, we got nothing but complimented for it. Um, we didn't have any issues in Queens. Um, and nor did we have any in the Bronx with their ranked choice voting. I, I know it was a very small area. We're not talking citywide. Um, I think that between CFB, <coughs> the Board of Elections, the Mayor's Office, um, and other good government groups, um, the message is out there. And um, listen, I think with change, change is very hard for people. And it's scary. Um, you know, our young generation will take to it with no problem. We know that. We've seen that with the rollout in 2010 of the scanners. You've seen, you know, the generational differences. Um, the young people were able to come in, didn't have any issues. Our issues were more seniors. 
We are trying to hit as many senior centers. I mean, there, there's a lot of virtual um, webinars that are going on that we're partaking in. We're also partaking in um, webinars with the disability groups to reach out to those voters. Um, I'm confident, however, um, the reason why we have the five foot posters in every poll site, the reason why we're handing out palm cards, the reason why we're putting instructions inside the privacy sleeve is because we never hit 5.5 million people with our message and we know that. So we're preparing and that's our preparation. Whoever we didn't hit is going to get hit when they come into the poll site with that information, whether they're going to read it on the five foot poster, whether they're gonna get it from the palm card, it's gonna be inside the privacy sleeve, or they're gonna go over to our information clerk who does and will, you know, not only the information clerk, line management, they will have tablets. Like I said, not everybody can pick up by reading something. So we will have the PSA where we'll be able to play a video for someone and actually they will be able to watch it and go through the whole process. So I think we're trying our best at all different angles to ensure we hit all voters with our message for ranked choice voting and two page ballot. I appreciate your response and I will just um, reiterate um, the fact that I think the training is really good and also I'm gonna reiterate- Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, but I'm also going to reiterate my concern with the magnitude of what we're looking at right now on the 22nd. And um, my hope is that um, we all get through this as painlessly as possible. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Cabrera. Do you want to wrap it up? And yes, I, I just want to thank you, uh, uh, Deputy Director, uh, for your information. <laughs> we're going to be submitting uh, the questions. I know you have to go to another meeting and uh, time has eluded us here, uh, but thank you again uh, for uh, uh, giving us an update and looking forward to Tuesday's response from, uh, from the state to finally, hopefully we get this software uh, approved. And so with that, thank you. And, I, and I'll turn it back to the chair as we move now to CFB. Thank you, okay. Jake Blair. Thank you very much, Chair Cabrera. Uh, this is going to end our session with the uh, BLE. Let me just read this statement. Um, bear with me a moment. Um, this will conclude this portion of today's hearing. Thank you, BLE, for being here. We will now move on to the Campaign Finance, Finance Board. I ask my colleagues who will be joining us for the CFB portion of the hearing to remain in this, in this Zoom. Um, and I just wanna take a five minute break if I can, uh, and then we'll come back, okay? And give everybody time to get set up, but in five minutes, we will be back.
Sergeants, I'm back. Ready. You ready? Chair? All systems say go with feel always. Come on. All right. Just want to get a sergeant to test their mics. Yes, uh, folks from uh, CFB, if we can test your audio. Okay. Amy Lepreust. Is that working? Amy, we hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Frederick Schaefer. Yes, Frederick, we hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much. Is that all the two of you? Okay, chairs, it looks like we're ready to go. Chair, all right. Chair Drama, I'll, I'll uh, for the sake of time, because I know we're way behind here, I'll, I'll, I'll forfeit my uh, intro. Okay, very good. And so will I. But let me just do this introduction here. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Council's eighth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 22. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We previously heard from the Board of Elections and now we will hear from the Campaign Finance Board. We are joined by the Committee on Governmental Operations, chaired by my esteemed colleague, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. Cabrera. Uh, let me just see. I have the names of those who have joined us. Yes, uh, we have Councilmember Adams, Amphrey Samuel, Ayala, Barron, Dharma Diaz, Gibson, Koslowitz, and I'm sorry, uh, Koslowitz was with us also for the Board of Elections. Lewis, Riley, Rosenthal, Jaeger, and Minority Leader Maddio are with us. And um, uh, now we're going to hear testimony from the Campaign Finance Board. We're joined by Frederick Schaefer, Chair of the CFB, and Amy Lopress, um, CFB Executive Director. Uh, but before we begin, I'm going to turn it over to Committee Council to go over some procedural items and to swear in the witness. Thank you, Chair. I want to remind everyone that you will be mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting. I will now administer the affirmation. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Executive Director Amy Lopress? Yes. And Chair Rick Schaefer? Yes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lopress, you may begin when ready. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera, Chair Drum, and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations and Finance. I'm Amy Lopress. Executive Director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. With me today is Board Chair Frederick Schaefer. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on our budget for fiscal year 2022 and answer any questions you may have. The CFB's fiscal year budget request is $72,422,974. It reflects a slight decrease in other than personnel services and a slight increase in personal services. Please note that the budget includes approximately $10.275 million for printing and mailing a citywide voter guide for the 2021 general election. The budget also includes $40.8 million for public funds payments for the general election. Like other parts of the government, we were forced to rethink how to, we conduct our work during the COVID pandemic. Most of our staff were forced to adopt to remote work to conduct voter outreach for a crucial presidential election and administer the biggest election in the history of the matching funds program. Despite these challenges, CFB staff continue to admirably perform their jobs at a high level and should be commended. In addition to the difficulties brought on by the COVID pandemic, 2021 was the first election cycle to fully incorporate changes from the mayor's 2018 Charter Revision Commission, Local Law 128 of 2019, and the council's 2019 Charter Revision Commission. Some of the most significant changes include early disbursements of public funds, an increase in the matching rate from six to one to eight to one, while also allowing candidates to run under the six to one system, an increased public funds cap with larger payments, 
and the mandate to implement a robust public education campaign for ranked choice voting. The 2021 election has been the largest in the history of the matching funds program. At one point, as many as 575, 579 active candidates were registered with the CFB, which is an all time high. For reference, the previous high was 390 candidates in 2001. With so many candidates running for office this year, work has increased substantially across the agency, particularly for our audit and candidate guidance and policy teams. To date, the CFB has paid out almost $76 million to 250 candidates participating in the elections. That's another all-time high. To date, 104 candidates running for office in 2021 have received the maximum payment available under the law, and 194 first-time candidates have received a public funds payment. There are two additional payment dates left before the June 22nd primary. We have allocated a total of $96.5 million for public fund matching funds payments in the current fiscal year. This year, we have also rolled out technology improvements to enhance the candidate experience. As many of you know, we recently launched the CFB portal to make it simpler for candidates, treasurers, and campaign staff to keep track of campaign tasks and communications with the agency. The portal will make it easier for campaigns to update their registration information and to respond to compliance or audit requests. For future elections, it will allow all candidates and political committees to register online, eliminating any paper forms. This is part of the first phase of a larger project to overhaul our legacy database and update its technical infrastructure. Further, we have made improvements to our NYC Votes Contribute fundraising platform, including a new feature that allows campaigns to organize and report fundraising events using the system. At a time when in-person fundraising was nearly impossible, we aim to make online fundraising as seamless as possible. Between January 12th, 2018 and April 30th, 2021, 417 campaigns used NYC Votes Contribute. Over that same period, a total of $14.5 million was raised from almost 224,000 contributions. We will continue to make enhancements to the platform throughout the fiscal year, 2022. An increase in the number of candidates running also calls for a more expansive voter guide and debates program. As you know, the voter guide is mailed to every household with a registered voter in New York City. We have invested significant time and resources in redesigning the voter guide to engage as many New Yorkers as possible and to prominently feature information on ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting is featured on the cover of the primary election voter guide and includes to tools that prompt voters to consider their rankings. We have also successfully completed work on our video voter guide which includes American Sign Language interpretations and was filmed, produced, and scheduled entirely remotely for the first time. Our debate program kicked off this month with the de first Democratic mayoral debate on Thursday, May 13th. The first Republican mayoral debate is scheduled for Wednesday, May 26th. With a diverse and expansive field of mayoral candidates, we added a third debate to the official schedule. Our debate partners have done a phenomenal job balancing the safety of candidates and their production staff, while also making sure New Yorkers are presented with a meaningful discussion of the issues at stake in this year's election. In addition to incorporating RCV into our voter guide and debate program, the CFB has also conducted a carefully planned voter education campaign to inform voters about ranked choice voting. To date, staff has conducted well over 100 training sessions with community groups, religious organizations, senior centers, and elected officials, training over 7,000 New Yorkers so far. Earlier turns suggest that our outreach is effective. According to EDSIC surveys conducted by Common Cause New York and ranked the vote in NYC, after special elections in council districts 24, 31, 11, and 15, the first to use ranked choice voting, 95% of respondents found the ballot simple and easy to use, remaining true across gender and education levels. Further, over 75% of respondents were very or somewhat familiar with ranked choice voting prior to casting a ballot. An additional 61% of respondents also ranked more than one candidate. As mentioned earlier, ranked choice voting will be featured prominently in our primary election voter guide. Much of the $2 million we're spending on ranked choice voting will be dedicated to our advertising campaign, which recently went into full effect. Our ad campaign prominently displays ranked choice voting in public spaces like bus shelters, television and streaming services, radio, social media, 
and community and ethnic print media. Before early voting begins, we will also kick off our volunteer-led text banks, which will directly inform New Yorkers about ranked choice voting. To complement this work, we have recently unveiled branding and website updates to voting.nyc website. The new design elements and digital tools are grounded in the needs, questions, and issues that matter to New York City voters, which were identified and validated in research in early 2021. We are thrilled that the mayor's office has dedicated an additional $15 million in ranked choice voting education funding. It will help, will take, help take from all levels of government to ensure New Yorkers know how to cast a ranked choice ballot. And we look forward to continuing our partnerships with Democracy NYC, the Civic Engagement Commission and the Board of Elections in the City of New York to get this important work done. The 2021 elections re represent the first instance in our experience where the primary and general elections are split across two fiscal years. As we move ahead into fiscal year 2021, our work administering the public funds matching public matching funds program, overseeing the debate program, general election, and producing a general election voter guide which will include matter on at least two constitutional amendments. Our budget contains a slight increase in personal services and an increase in the cost of the voter guide. Overall, the fiscal year 2022's budget request is over $34 million lower than fiscal year 2021, primarily due to the anticipated decrease in the anticipated public funds disbursements. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Executive Director Lowpressed. Uh, let me start off by saying this is the uh, final uh, budget hearings that I will conduct as chair of the Finance Committee, and I'm term limited out at the end of the year. Uh, but I do want to thank the CFB for providing the funding uh, was in 2009 when I first ran um, as a participating member. I don't believe that I ever would have been able to have run if it were not for the uh, New York City campaign finance funding um, that has been provided. So I do wanna thank you, even though sometimes I was annoyed by your rules, but uh, <laughs> I don't think I'd be where I'm at uh, if it wasn't for uh, this fantastic program. So thank you, thank you for your leadership and your direction as well. Well, thank you so uh, much for your service over the past years. It's been really admirable. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, I wish, um, I wish it could be longer, but uh, <laughs> I'm in favor of, um, of um, you know, uh, term limits, so uh, got to move on. In CFD's executive budget, uh, $39.8 million more was allocated to the public funds matching program for fiscal 22, bringing the total budget for next year to $40.8 million. According to Checkbook New York City, the board's current year co commitments for the program total $96.5 million and yet its fiscal 2021 budget still only includes 65.5 million for the program. How much funding will be added to CFB's fiscal 21 budget for the public matching funds program and when will it be added? So the, um, to, uh, there, that's the additional, I'm not gonna do math in my head, but it's, I think it's about $20 million is, uh, has already been added to the CFB's budget for the public fund, the final two public funds payments that will occur in fiscal year 2021. It reflects our anticipated uh, total of uh, $96.5 million in payments for the for fiscal 2021, basically for the primary election, but also that included the payments for all of the special elections that occurred earlier this year. Okay, great. And how does this relate to the board's vote to raise the spending limit for participating mayoral candidates in April 21? Um, the increase in the spending limit does not, uh, does not come with an increase in public funds payments because uh, the Supreme Court's decisions uh, prevented you giving any additional uh, public funds for uh, increased spending. So we can increase spending, but we can't give any additional public funds. So, so there's no change in the maximum. There's no change, okay. That's a short answer. Okay, thank you. 
How does the funding for this program compare to the amount of independent spending in the election cycle so far? Well, you know, again, the independent spending, you know, we'll see today as a filing day. So we will see, um, you know, the, the spending reported, but um, I defer, you know, if our chair has anything else to add to, you know, to that answer. But again, we'll, we're expecting the disclosure today. I'm hearing it's going to be a lot of money. So I'm looking forward to see what that looks like uh, later on. Once you can compile those figures. Yeah, Chair, did you want to say anything? Chair Schaefer? No, just to point out the obvious, which is that uh, this is the first uh, citywide campaign, particularly for mayor, where we've seen very large amounts of independent yes. expenditures. And it's also the first in which we've seen a prevalence of single candidate PACs, uh, yes. which raises some interesting questions that we'll have to look at after the election cycle is over in terms of uh, how we may want to modify either the law or our rules. Yes, I agree. Yeah. And then some of the news stories I'm reading on that topic as well seem to indicate the same thing. So thank you. Of, of course, you know, to uh, point out that so far uh, to date, the board has paid out $23.5 million to seven mayoral candidates. Um, so that certainly will help combat the influence of that, those large independent spenders. <clears throat> and yeah, absolutely. Um, does the board have an opinion on whether the spending limit should be raised in, incidents, in instances where there is a significant amount of independent spending in a race? Um, I, again, I think that this, that's an interesting question. Uh, I th uh, question. I think it was looked at in you know in previous years. I think that, um, as Chair Schaefer said, this is this is the first year where we have seen you know really in this increase and certainly the increase in single candidate um, super PACs. So uh, I think it is def definitely one of the interesting factors that we will look at af at the end of the election. Okay, but no definite opinion at this point. Um, not. I mean, again, I would like to see, you know, we'd like to, we'd like to make a database decisions and recommendations. And I think that, you know, the city council wisely when they passed the law added a provision that we review the program after every election. And so I think that that comprehensive review will be a place to really look at this spending and see if that kind of change is warranted. Thank you, okay. Can you provide us with a breakdown of the current fiscal year public matching fund program budget? for the individual local races. Okay, so um, I can, we um, have paid out so far, as I, as I said, we have paid out about 20 23.5 million dollars to in the mayoral race. Uh, we have paid out 12.5, almost 12.6 million dollars in the controller race, 12 million dollars in the, 12.2 million dollars in the borough president races, and about $27.6 million in the city council races. So a total of about $76 million. Okay, thank you. And what is the board's estimate of anticipated expenses for the matching funds program in fiscal 22? And is it different than the 40.8 million that's already in the budget? Um, when, and when do you expect that to be reconciled? So we, the $40.8 million is what we anticipate paying out for the general election. So, oh. um, uh, so, that, so that does reflect our, our budget, yes, our right. estimate for the general election. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, let's just see, uh, on April 28th, Mayor de Blasio in Democracy New York City announced a $15 million voter education campaign to inform New Yorkers of ranked choice voting ahead of the June primaries. The funding will go to a citywide media campaign, language access and accessibility, accessibility resources and direct outreach. Is Democracy in New York City coordinating this campaign with the work that CFB is already doing? So yes, we have been working directly with Democracy NYC and we'll continue doing so. Um, during, you know, we've been working with them throughout the election year and we um, 
we'll continue to work with them to coordinate our messaging about ranked choice voting as that $15 million is spent. Uh, and do you expect to see any of that $15 million? Um, so they have already spent about $400,000 to amplify our advertising campaign. Um, you know, while we have not, uh, we haven't received any of that money directly, we, they will be amplifying our, our messages. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, Chair Cabrera, for other questions. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Chair Drum, and I share your sentiments, uh, especially someone that was not familiar much with politics in 2009, the matching program. Uh, really was a, a big reason why I'm here, especially in a district like mine, uh, where uh, it's very hard to raise funds. And so I, I'm a believer uh, in the matching, and I'm even more a believer with the eight to one. Um, and Chair Cabrera, if I may say also, we came in yeah. together and we've had a great tenure together. We were, we, we were uh, you know, newbies together, so. <laughs> it was fun. It's been a really good ride, uh, Chair. Yes. It's been a really good ride. It's an honor uh, to be one of the only 51 New York City Council members. I, I sometimes, I'm still standing off of that privilege in the greatest nation in the planet Earth. And, uh, and a pleasure working with you. Uh, and thank you for your leadership and, and my colleagues as well. I, I want to say, uh, Executive Director, um, first, let me just uh, commend you on the RCV commercial. So the other day, uh, it was very good. I, I tell you, a teenager, a young person can really understand it. And that was my biggest concern. And when we had a hearing before, I talked a lot about the marketing piece and television. And uh, I had to salute you and your team. Uh, not only that you had the commercial, but how you put forth the commercial. And so it, it leaves no doubt that anybody could really understand how it works. And using television is, is a great way. And, and let me ask you a question uh, related to the funding that we have received. Are we now, and I'm basing this in the last hearing, now we, ha we are putting more funds towards RCV education than any other municipality in the United States? Um, I imagine with the $15 million that we are, but I, I would not want to say definitively, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I, I think probably, you know, with that additional $15 million, it's likely. I, I think that we are. Around we're at <laughs> 2.7 before, and uh, some of my colleagues uh, were concerned about that. And I did the math when we were comparing to Oakland and in San Francisco, that we needed at least two, uh, 6.7 to be able to match what they were doing. And now we are 15, uh, at least no doubt, uh, at least in my mind, that at least we have the resources, how it's utilized, uh, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing more of it. I have received literature, uh, I hope. I was gonna ask you, how much has the CFB spent to, to date? I don't know if you mentioned that before. If you did, I how apologize. Much we, I, don't, I don't think we, I did mention how much we spent to date. I mean, I think that it's, you know, we're, we're starting our advertising and um, uh, voter guide campaign is just, you know, we're, it's just starting, so. Uh, uh, we will be spending, you know, aside from the amount that's spending for the voter guide, which, you know, includes a lot of information about ranked choice voting, uh, we will be spending about $2 million in outreach, which uh, includes, you know, paid media campaign, um, again, as I mentioned, on bus shelters, on social media, and television, radio, and print, um, including the community and ethnic media, uh, print media, and also it, that $2 million includes the amount that we are spending for our postcard mailing and our get out the vote text bank. So I, I know that I received my uh, uh, RCV postcard in the mail yesterday. I, I met, so I imagine some of you have received yours. Uh, again, that postcard, uh, uh, thanks to legislation passed by the city council has gone to every um, 
every voter in the city of New York to inform them about and language voting. We, I, I certainly received mine and, and I loved it. Uh, when uh, do you anticipate, uh, when do I, we, we should anticipate receiving the voter's guide? Um, it should be going into the mail um, towards the end of May and, and uh, going into the mail stream and then we're arriving in people's mailboxes you know, around the beginning of June. The online voter guide will uh, be appearing you know, beginning uh, the beginning of June. So you'll be able to see the online voter guide, uh, which will, in addition to voting.nyc, which has some additional technical uh, enhancements to show you how ranked choice voting works, you can now look at that. It's live now. You can look at it and do in you know, a mock election uh, and practice ranked choice voting. When the online voter guide is, appears, you'll be able to look at your candidates and, and, and kind of keep track of ranking them the same way there'll be uh, tools for ranking your choices in the print voter guide. I, I know this is short notice, but I was thinking about, and we literally ran out of time and, and the, uh, talking with uh, DOE and no fault of, of, of their own at all, but uh, I was thinking about, is there, is there going to be a video that shows you what to do when you get to the voting site? So, for example, the questions that we've been asking here today, we're elected officials, some of us are running. Uh, I can imagine the public at large, right? Is it going to be perforated? Is it, it's, uh, you know, uh, if, if I bring that, that ID that was given to me, how do I use it? Do I use it at all? Uh, can, can, is it possible to do a quick video that shows this is what, you know, each stage uh, once they go to the voting site? Well, um, I do know, I mean, in addition to the television commercial that we have that you referenced, we also have a video that tells people exactly how to uh, do, make, mark their ballot. So it has, you know, step by step. Um, I understood, and again, I'm not going to speak for the Board of Elections, but I understood from what uh, Deputy <laughs> Secretary Sandow said is that they they are going to they have a video also that is uh, tells you how to use it and that they're going to be have the facility to play that for people who that is more helpful than the printed materials that they're going to have available. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and I, the the last special elections I know we had here in, in the Bronx uh, was the Queens Brooklyn. Uh, what percentage of people rank choice? You did mention it, but oh, I, have to look, I have to look that up again. I think that um, I think that it is that sixty-one percent of the voters ranked more than one candidate. What would you see as to win in this coming election primary? What percentage? Um, you know, I think that, you know, I, I mean, I think what one, one thing is that to make sure that one to have people have the familiarity. And again, it's hard to know. I mean, it depends on the race. Um, you know, obviously people should vote for the candidates that they want. So, I mean, they should, if they only, if they only, you know, are like one candidate, then they can vote for one single candidate in a race. But I think, you know, having people you know, having utilization, you know, that that 61% was very heartening to see that 61% of, of voters actually ranked more than one candidate. So, I mean, I think that's a great uh, statistic. Uh, one, two quick question. You mentioned there's two more payment days. What are those days? Um, one is next Thursday, uh, which if I look at my calendar, if you indulge me, I can tell you the date. Uh, it is next Thursday, May 27th, and the final payment is on Thursday, June 17th. And uh, my last question is, uh, you received $15 million if, uh, are you anticipating you're going to use it all? Or are you just gonna just strategically move and see as the need arises? What do you anticipate? Well, I mean, again, the fifteen million dollars is the mayor's, the Democracy NYC's budget, and I, I, from what I've understand, and I mean, certainly, I think what will the plans are is to use the vast majority of that fifteen million dollars to do a robust advertising campaign about ranked choice voting. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I think I'm done with my questions. Let me turn it back 
uh, to the chair. I know we have colleagues that have questions. Thank you so much, our Secretary Director. We're going to go to Councilmember Rosenthal. Time starts now. Chair Cabrera, you asked my question. <laughs> so I'm I'm looking to see if I I, I you always have, have one there. Come on, you always have an extra no. No. by higher level question. Yeah, it's the last budget hearing. Uh, I'm out. <laughs> but um, no, I just really want to thank you for all your work. I mean, this is critical. I think you know. I I sh I think what Chair Cabrera was getting at is. You know, and I share his frustration. The 15 million came a little late, and I hope we're we're going to get 15 million dollars worth of of good media, um, and really get into additional communities. Um, and I think that that is the plan. And again, to use a lot, you know, money for translation and for you know, reach outreach to you know, ethnic and uh, community newspapers and. Uh, and make sure that everyone in the, across the whole city really understands that this is happening. Yeah, I mean, my um, my two cents is that I, I don't quite understand why uh, you're doing education and then there's the mayor's office that's doing education. And I'm just hoping that there's some sort of coordination <clears throat> and that you know, if each of you have limitations that the other is picking up, it's just so important. And I think recent polls have shown, you know, how few people really understand what rank choice voting is. Um, I definitely get questions in my office. Uh, so, so I know the big push is on and, and good luck. <laughs> I wish you had more money. So, you know, just so, uh, you know, just so you know that, I mean, over the past year, we have developed, you know, at the staff level, developed a really strong uh, collaboration with Democracy NYC, uh, with the Board of Elections, with uh, the uh, other people working in the civic community on election issues, and it was absolutely necessary. I mean, you know, after, you know, in last spring when the things were changing about the election every every week you know information it was incredibly vital to make sure that we had a strong collaboration and that partnership and work that we've done you know that foundation that we've built will definitely be brought forward to the ranked choice voting education do you today. happen to know if anyone is going to use the space in the samuzas the um bus shelters that where you can put in huge posters. We actually did that for student voter registration day. And it would be amazing to have a huge poster showing the ballot and, you know, one, two, three and demonstrating, you know, some sort of infographic. Yeah, our, our advertising campaign includes bus shelters, uh, the, the bus shelters. Also, I think there's some plans to work with the, um, the name just went out of my head. The Mm. digital platform link, link nyc link, <laughs> link nyc uh, uh uh kiosks across the city too and so ha have those already rolled out i mean the fact that i'm not seeing it in my district means my district's not targeted or that it hasn't been rolled out yet i think it's beginning to be rolled out so i think you know probably in the next weeks or so you i mean i again they're targeted they are targeted campaigns so uh you know again it can't be in every bus shelter in every district, but I mean, there will be targeted campaigns, so, uh, but they should be rolling out soon. Yeah, I just wanna make sure we're putting enough money to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, chairs. Thank you very much, uh, Chair uh, Cabrera. Anything else? No, I'll, I'll, I'll make a, is this the time for a closing remark? Yes, and I wanna make a closing remark, but go right ahead, sir. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, first, uh, Chair Drum, uh, this is my last uh, executive budget uh, with you. I get emotional because uh, this has been a good ride. This is, we've we done, we done well. And um, so proud of the work that you have done. You've done an amazing job and you've done it with integrity. You've done it with honor. You've done it with respect to all the members uh, and, and consideration. 
Um, I, so I, I thank you. I thank you uh, for all the work. You, you made us all better uh, through the budget and, and through the coalition that is required uh, to do this level of work. So I, again, I salute you. I can't, I can't say enough. Uh, I also, in closing, uh, I want to say, uh, and, and, and share drum, help me with this, right now, and I didn't mention at the beginning because we were trying to save time, community boards, right now, they have been cut between the initiative that we lost last year, $42,500, between the 5,000 plus that was cut already this year and another 8,000 in this budget. We're talking about a 20% cut. And, the, and, and they're a government institution. And we're talking about less than $700,000 to restore this 8,000 uh, and so funding. We really need help. And I'm calling the administration to restore every single penny, not just the 8,000 and so for this year, but uh, the, the last fiscal year, the 5,000, they need to be restored. Uh, right now, where else are they gonna cut? And some of them service an area larger than council members do with limited resources and dealing with 50 uh, community board members. It's, it's, it's just, they, they deserve better. They, they have little resources as they stand. Uh, and, and, and then also let me just say, serving in, in this committee and my last executive uh, budget hearing, I want to thank uh, the staff. They've been nothing but amazing. Uh, they're truly have been uh, the dream team uh, that any uh, council member uh, could have asked for. And I salute every single one of them uh, for making uh, my job uh, an enjoyable uh, one. And I'm not done with done yet uh, with uh, other things, but in terms of, of, of this executive uh, budget, I wanna thank them. So, uh, Senor Chair, uh, de los regreso para atrás. Igual, <laughs> gracias. And I wanna say thank you, uh, Chair Cabrera. He's done an amazing job and uh, it's been such a pleasure and an honor to be able to work with you these last 12 years. And I, I'm very, very proud of what uh, you've done, what we've done together. And I look forward to continuing that as a, we still have seven months left, so we can still do a lot of good left. And mm -hmm. thank you, Chair Cabrera, for everything you said about me as well. And to well, CFB, I just wanna say thank you also for coming in. I wanna brag. Uh, I mentioned the, you know, the, the pesky rules that you have, but I actually never got a fine, no fine, three elections. So I'm a happy camper. <laughs> and I thank you for all the work that you've done as well. Thank you to uh, Chair Schaefer. And thank you, of course, to Executive Director Amy Lowprest. Uh, we appreciate you coming in and giving us information today. So this will conclude today's hearing. Thank you, CFB, for being here. Before we close, I'd like to remind the Finance Committee members that we will be meeting remotely again on Monday, May 24th at 10 a.m and we will hear from the Office of Management and Budget, the Controller, and the Independent Budget Office. And as a reminder to the public, the committee will be holding a remote hearing for public testimony on the executive budget on Tuesday, May 25th at 10 a.m. If you would like to testify at that hearing, please register at www.council.nyc.gov testify, and information about how to access the Zoom meeting will be emailed to you. You may also submit written testimony through that registration website or by emailing testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you again to everyone. Thank you to our sergeants again. Thank you to all of the finance team members, to my council, <clears throat> to Stephanie Ruiz, to Regina Pareda Ryan, to Latanya McKinney. Thank you, CFB. We're done. This meeting is just let me see the time. This meeting is adjourned at 3:43 in the afternoon.